What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to, What If I Was In Marvel As Spider-Man? Conqueror of Multiverse. Part 10. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Danny Rand stepped onto the crowded streets of New York City, his bare feet making light contact with the concrete pavement. Clad in the same monk clothes he had worn during his journey from Kuenluen, he stood out amidst the rush of the city. Passersby glanced at him curiously, some ignoring his presence entirely while others whispered to each other, their curiosity piqued. Children, with their unstoppable curiosity, pointed at Danny, their tiny fingers tugging at their parents' sleeves. Mom, why doesn't he have shoes? A young boy asked, his eyes wide with wonder. Hush now, sweetheart. The mother replied, tugging her child along. He's just, different. We shouldn't stare. Danny smiled warmly at the children, a twinkle in his eyes as he acknowledged their curiosity. He continued his journey through the bustling streets, making a mental note to find a change of clothes later. But for now, his priority lay elsewhere. Finally, Danny arrived at his destination, a towering building that scraped the clouds. Rand Enterprises, a Rand Enterprises, a name that held immense significance for him. Looking up at the giant letters spelling out his family name. He felt a mix of nostalgia and anticipation. With calm strides, he entered the building, aware of the gazes fixed upon him. The employees exchanged glances, their curiosity piqued by the sight of a barefooted, unkempt man dressed in monk's robes. Undeterred, Danny approached the receptionist, his voice carrying an air of purpose. I would like to meet with Harold Meacham, Danny stated, his tone resolute and respectful. The receptionist, her eyes flickering with sympathy, shook her head gently. I'm sorry, but Mr. Meacham passed away in 2004. He battled cancer. A wave of sadness washed over Danny's face, his heart heavy with the weight of lost time and missed connections. After all, Harold was like an uncle to him. Still, he pressed on. Is Joy Meacham here? Or could you provide me with her contact information? The receptionist hesitated, eyeing Danny's unconventional appearance. May I ask who you are? It's not easy for someone as high up in the company as Ms. Meacham to meet with just anyone. A flicker of determination sparked in Danny's eyes as he spoke. Tell her it's Danny. She'll know. We used to play together as children. He dropped a bombshell, his voice carrying a hint of nostalgia. Uncertain, the receptionist nodded and picked up the phone beside her. She glanced at Danny inside, pointing to the spacious waiting area. Please have a seat and wait, she said, her voice tinged with hesitation. After all, it's very likely that this was a waste of time. For all she knows, Danny is one of the many homeless population in New York, who is either looking to scam someone or has some sort of mental problem. Either way, she would simply do her job and hope for the best. Taking a seat in the lobby, Danny couldn't help but notice the guards stationed nearby, their watchful eyes fixated on him. They were ready to spring into action at the slightest sign of trouble, their gaze filled with suspicion and skepticism. Danny exhaled slowly, preparing himself for the uncertain reunion that awaited him. He sat with his back straight and his head held high, his gaze unwavering despite the guards' scrutiny. Danny sat in the waiting room, his eyes closed and his legs crossed on the chair. He remained perfectly still, his breathing steady and rhythmic as he meditated in silence. The guards, initially wary of his presence, had become more intrigued by the peculiar man who had patiently waited for hours without complaint or movement. As the sun began to set outside, the doors of a nearby elevator opened, revealing a woman of similar age to Danny. She had short brown hair, and piercing blue eyes, and was dressed in an expensive business suit that accentuated her fit figure. Unaware of Danny's presence, she walked toward the exit, her mind occupied with the matters of the day. Danny's eyes opened as soon as he sensed her. A reminiscent smile tugged at his lips as memories flooded his mind recalling the moments he had spent playing with her and her bully of a brother, Ward. Excuse me, Joy. Danny rose to his feet, his voice calm and gentle. Can we talk for a moment? Joy turned to face him, her eyebrows furrowing in confusion. I'm sorry, do I know you? She didn't recognize him. Danny took a step closer, his gaze filled with warmth and sincerity. It's me, Joy. It's Danny. Danny ran. Joy's face contorted with skepticism and frustration. That's impossible. Danny died in a plane crash years ago. Whoever you are, this is a sick joke. Danny's smile faltered, but he remained steadfast. I understand it's hard to believe, but it's the truth. I survived the crash. I'm Danny Rand. Joy's expression hardened, and she glanced at the guards nearby. Guards, this man is harassing me. Please remove him from the premises. Danny's heart sank as the guards began to close in. He held up a hand, desperately trying to prevent their approach. Please, Joy. 
Just give me a chance. I can prove it to you. I'll take a blood test if I have to. Joy hesitated, uncertainty flickering in her eyes. The guard stood poised, ready to forcibly remove Danny from the building. Just talk to me, Joy, Danny pleaded, his voice tinged with desperation. Please, there's so much that I want to tell you. But before Joy could respond, one of the guards grabbed Danny, trying to forcefully restrain him. However, Danny's reflexes were honed from years of rigorous training. He swiftly dodged the attack, sidestepping with remarkable agility. He retaliated by delivering a swift strike to the guard's solar plexus, using a powerful punch infused with a tiny bit of chi energy. The guard crumpled to the ground, incapacitated but unharmed. The receptionist, who had been watching in awe, quickly picked up the phone. She dialed 911 and swiftly explained what was happening, her face reflecting a mix of confusion and fear. The remaining guards watched in awe and apprehension, realizing they were up against a formidable opponent. Danny held his hand ups. Look, just calm down, alright? I don't mean any harm. Two more guards rushed forward simultaneously, ignoring his words as they attempted to overpower Danny with sheer numbers. But once again, he effortlessly blocked their attacks, gracefully weaving between their strikes with a dancer's precision. His movements flowed like water, each strike landing with calculated accuracy. Danny's hands became a blur as he unleashed a series of kicks, sweeps, and punches, targeting pressure points with precise accuracy. The guards stumbled and fell, their bodies temporarily paralyzed by the incapacitating blows. It was clear they were no match for the martial arts mastery Danny had acquired in Kuanluan. As the last guard staggered to his feet, struggling to regain his composure, Danny stood tall before him. A calm yet fierce determination emanated from his eyes. He raised his hands in a defensive stance, silently urging the guard to give up. The guard, realizing the futility of his resistance, slowly raised his hands in surrender. Danny extended a hand to help the defeated guards up, his expression compassionate. I mean no harm, he assured them as he turned to Joy, who stood rooted to the ground, shocked and frightened by the events she just witnessed. I own this company. The guards, bewildered but grateful, accepted Danny's help and stood up. The main lobby fell into an uneasy silence as the guards and the receptionist processed what had just occurred. Joy, Danny called out, snapping his childhood friend from her frozen stupor. It's me, I swear. T this isn't funny. Joy lashed out, unwilling to believe this whole situation. Danny is dead. He's been dead since I was 10 years old. You. You can't just come here and do this. It's cruel. She shouted, tears welling up in the corner of her eyes. Danny frowned as he tried to think of a way for her to believe him and it didn't take long to do exactly that. A week before the accident my parents held a family barbecue. Of course, your family was invited dash that's all you have. Joy interrupted him with a scoff as she crossed her arms. Danny smiled warmly as he recalled one of his fonder memories. While we played in the backyard, Ward was being a little shit as always, so we snuck out and ran to the park around the corner. We would always go to the park, though this was the first time we were alone. The more that Danny talked, the quicker Joy's breath became, clutching her leather handbag between tight fists. Danny continued, his cheeks blushing ever so slightly. We played on the swings together and I dash stop. Joy yelled, knowing where this story was going. Just stop. She pleaded. Danny heard her, but he didn't listen. I pulled my swing over to yours and kissed you on the lips. He revealed as tears rushed down Joy's face. We promised to marry each other when we were older. You even wanted another kiss, but my mom came rushing over, yelling and screaming at us for running off alone. That was the last time I saw you. As he stopped speaking, deafening silence filled the lobby. And if Joy still wasn't convinced, then the guards and receptionists certainly were. Just Joy's reaction was enough to prove it for them do you believe me now? Danny asks calmly. I dash she hesitantly spoke as the sound of police sirens echoed from down the street, heading in their direction. But before the police could arrive, a black and red figure dropped down onto the sidewalk outside, shocking everyone, especially Danny, who knew nothing of the many heroes who protected the city and the world at large. Silk. The receptionist muttered, not expecting an Avenger to respond to her 911 call. Silk. Danny wondered as he felt that this person held a large amount of chi not nearly as much as him, but certainly more than a high-level monk back in Kuanluan. Though that wasn't all, beside Silk appeared a smaller childlike figure in a red and blue themed spider suit. Are you sure dad won't be mad? The smaller figure spoke, which was easily picked up by Danny's chi enhanced hearing. Silk turned to the smaller figure. Your dad can take you out, but I can't? She asked pointedly. What the hell is happening? Danny thought as the two came walking in, eyeing the bruised guards questioningly. What's the emergency? MJ glanced around the lobby, her eyes searching for any signs of trouble. And what she found only confused her. A barefoot man in monk's robes and a group of beaten guards alongside a woman with tear-stained makeup. Yet none of these people answered her question. She approached the front desk, with Lily following closely behind her, where a few employees whispered to each other, including the receptionist who called the police in the first place. What's the emergency? We heard there was a fight. MJ inquired, wondering what was going on. Just as the question escaped her lips, the elevator door slid open, revealing a man slightly older than Joy and Danny. 
Ward Meacham, the CEO of Rand Enterprises, his face etched with a mix of urgency and determination. In a swift motion, MJ turned her attention toward Ward, her gaze narrowing. She instinctively positioned herself between him and the monk-looking man, feeling the bloodthirsty anger Ward was sending the oddly dressed man's way. Are you in charge here? MJ asked, her voice laced with suspicion. Instantly, Ward's anger disappeared as he smiled charmingly at the two female heroes. Yes, I'm the CEO of Rand Enterprises. Ward Meacham. Thank you for coming, he says as if he were the one who called. Okay, what's going on? MJ asks as Lily glances back at the monk behind them. Ward's eyes darted around the lobby, the remnants of adrenaline coursing through his veins. He knew the truth about Danny Rand, having witnessed the events from his office through the surveillance cameras. Luckily, his guards alerted him to a disturbance in the lobby so he decided to take a look out of curiosity and thankfully he did. Or else he wouldn't know about the major shitstorm that appeared on his doorstep. Although he wasn't there when Danny kissed his sister, nor was he told about it, he certainly remembered them sneaking off to the park all those years ago. The speech convinced him that Danny was, in fact, the long-lost heir to Rand Enterprises, a threat to the empire he and his family had carefully built. But Ward was not one to shy away from a challenge. Determined to protect his family's legacy, he had no intention of letting Danny regain control. With a deep breath, Ward locked eyes with MJ, his voice dripping with a mixture of concern and deceit. There's been an altercation, a misunderstanding. But don't worry, everything's under control. As he spoke, Ward sent a knowing look toward his sister, telling her to keep her mouth shut with a single glance. MJ's brow furrowed, skeptical of everything coming out of his mouth. She took a step closer to Ward, her instincts not allowing her to let the situation slide. Misunderstanding or not, we're here to help. You need to tell us what happened? Ward's mind raced as he tried to think of a plausible explanation. He couldn't let the Avengers interfere. Or else Danny's chances of taking back the company could skyrocket. I appreciate your concern, but trust me when I say it's best if you just leave. Ward responded, gesturing behind her. The police have arrived, and they'll handle it from here. Just as Ward's words hung in the air, the sound of approaching sirens filled the lobby, growing louder with each passing second. The police were closing in, ready to restore order. And they would certainly take his side in the situation. After all, his family owns the building, so they would have to throw any trespassers out. And if said trespasser were to disappear soon after, then wouldn't that just be tragic? Lily exchanged a knowing glance with her mother, a silent agreement passing between them. They were feeling nothing but bad vibes from this guy since the beginning they arrived. With a determined nod, MJ looked back at Ward. We won't leave until we know everything is resolved. We're here to help, whether you like it or not. Before Ward could respond, the lobby door swung open, and a few police officers rushed in, hands placed on their holstered pistols. What seems to be the dash the leading officer spoke, though he froze as soon as he laid eyes on Silk and her short unknown partner. Silk. He and the other officers stared in shock. Ahem. The officer cleared his throat. Ma'am, we can handle the situation from here. He spoke respectfully. He, like almost every police officer in New York, held a great amount of respect for the heroes that patrolled the city alongside them. But this was a normal disturbance slash assault call. Nothing that they couldn't handle themselves. MJ hummed as she turned to I Danny, who stood near her, both confused and quiet. All right, we'll go. But, Lily spoke up, as she didn't expect her mother to fold so easily. It's all right. MJ reassured her daughter as she turned to Danny. Come on, you're being detained for questioning? Question mark. Danny looked at her in shock before turning to the police, wondering if they'd allow some masked woman to kidnap him. Sorry, Mr. Monk. An officer answered his silent questioning. But Avengers business is above our pay grade. I advise that you go along quietly and cooperate as much as you can. Wait. Ward exclaimed. That man assaulted my security staff. We'll be pressing charges, he said, hoping to give the police a reason to interfere. Eh. The officers glanced at one another, shrugging at what little power they held in situations involving the Avengers. I'm sorry, sir. But you'll have to wait until the Avengers are done with him, one said with a shake of his head. Exclamation point. Ward stood there fuming, unable to get what he wanted. You know, Ward. Danny spoke up for the first time since the mother-daughter duo arrived. I hated you as a kid, but I might hate you even more now. Ward glared. I don't know who you think you are, or who you think I am, but we certainly don't know each other. He said, hoping to plant a seed of doubt. Joy remained silent, unsure of which side to take, her brothers or the boy she once loved as a child. Come on. Lily turned to Danny, smiling under her mask. We'll find you some shoes and a change of clothes, she offered, thinking he was probably homeless and in need. Which technically he was. Danny stood in contemplation for a moment before nodding his head. Sure. He agreed and followed them out. He did what he came to do. Reveal that he was alive to the people that mattered. Of course, Ward wasn't on that list, especially after the stunt he just pulled. But before he stepped out of the door, Danny turned to Joy and smiled. I'll visit again soon, okay? He said as he was pulled out of the door by an overexcited spider girl. Let's go. She yelled. You can flirt later? 
The dimly lit interior of Sister Margaret's school for wayward children was buzzing with activity as mercenaries and misfits from all walks of life gathered to drown their sorrows or celebrate their latest victories. After their little conversation with Kingpin, Wade roped Peter into having a drink together. Peter sat at the bar, nursing a glass of whiskey, which he drank through his mask, while Wade downed shot after shot of tequila. In front of them, Weasel leaned against the counter, wiping down a glass with a grim expression on his face. You know, Wade, I've seen you mess with some sketchy dudes like that time you killed that Irish guy's mother dash hey. She was shooting at me with an AK-47. Wade defends himself. Well, he was the leader of the IRA, Weasel revealed. But pissing off the kingpin? That might be worse. Wade chuckled, raising his shot glass in a mock salute. Hey, I like to keep things interesting. Besides, old kingpin's been begging to get his shit kicked in for years now. I'm just giving the people what they want. Weasel's eyes widened, and he leaned in closer. You do realize who you're dealing with, right? Kingpin may not have superpowers, but he's got money, resources, and an army of loyal goons. And most of all, you don't even know who or where he is. Wade smirked excitedly. That's what makes it fun. I live for the danger, the thrill of the kill, that high-pitched sound every guy makes when you shoot his meat and balls off. You know, the finer things in life. And besides, I've got Spidey here to watch my back, don't I? Peter raised an eyebrow, glancing up from his whiskey. Sure, but I won't always be available. I'm probably the busiest Avenger you'll meet, but you can ask other members for help as well. I can assign you and whoever you want into a team. As long as they agree, of course. Daredevil might be interested in taking on Kingpin. Weasel looked at Wade in shock. Wait, are you an Avenger? He asked scanlessly. But before Wade could answer, Peter's ghost phone buzzed on the bar counter. He picked it up and glanced at the screen. It's Silk, he muttered. Wade leaned in, his curiosity peaked. What's that hot woman of yours want? Wait, Spider-Man and Silk are dating. Weasel asks incredulously. Ignoring him, Peter read over the message. Nothing that you two have to worry about? He said as he stashed his phone away, finished off his drink, and stood to his feet. Wade whined like a child as soon as he saw this. Come on, you're leaving already. Yeah, bye. Peter called out as he paced out of the bar. The pussy calls, and you just go running, don't you? Wade yelled as he left. And seconds after those words left Wade's mouth, a portal opened up under his stool. Huh? He grunted in surprise as he fell through and landed in the dumpster out back. F you too. He yelled, hoping Peter could still hear him. MJ and Lily, dressed in their silk and spider girl suits, led Danny through the bustling streets of the city. The people around them couldn't help but glance curiously at the trio, their attention drawn to Danny's disheveled appearance in dirty monk robes and bare feet. But mostly, everyone was shocked to see Silk casually walking around alongside a miniature gender-bent Spider-Man Lily looked up at her mother. We need to get him some clothes and shoes. He can't walk around like this. MJ nodded, her eyes scanning the area for a nearby clothing store. Spotting one just a few blocks away, they made their way toward it. As they entered the store, the workers recognized Silk immediately, their faces lighting up with excitement. They rushed to assist them, providing a wide array of clothes and shoes for Danny to choose from. Lily, eager to help, picked out a simple outfit and shoes for Danny. Here, try these on, she said, handing him the clothes. You'll feel much better. Danny, hesitant and bewildered, stared at the items in his hands. I? I don't understand. Why are you doing this for me? Lily beamed up at him, her voice filled with compassion. Because it's what we do. Now, go change. With Lily's gentle encouragement, Danny reluctantly agreed to change into new clothes. As he did, he couldn't help but feel a sense of gratitude towards these two strange people who had shown him kindness when he needed it the most. He may be a billionaire, but right now he was dead broke without access to any of his family's accounts. And that's if his family's accounts haven't been drained and shut down by now. After the clothes shopping was done, MJ stepped outside the store and made a quick call to S.H.I.E.L.D., explaining the situation and requesting a pickup. Moments later, a blacked-out SUV pulled up beside them. Danny eyed the vehicle warily. I don't know about this. I appreciate your help, but I'm not sure I have. Lily interjected, her voice filled with sincerity. We're here to help. We won't let anything happen to you. Please, trust us just a little bit. Reluctantly, Danny nodded and climbed into the SUV, with MJ and Lily following suit. MJ couldn't help but smirk under her mask, admiring how easily her daughter was able to wrap this guy around her finger. As the car began to move, Danny couldn't contain his curiosity any longer. Can someone please explain what's happening? I feel completely lost. He didn't know anything about the last 15 years, so he knew nothing about the current state of the world. The world was rather normal when he was last a part of it. Lily, sitting beside him, took a deep breath. Okay. So, we're with the Avengers. As they drove through the crowded streets of New York City, Danny's eyes widened in astonishment, his mind struggling to comprehend the new information given to him. Superheroes? The world has superheroes now? He asked in shock. Lily nodded enthusiastically. Yeah, and my dad was the first superhero. She held her head high and stuck out her chest in pride. As the car continued towards the Avengers Tower, Lily's voice filled the silence. 
By the way, what's your name? Danny turned to her, a faint smile on his lips. My name is Danny, Danny Rand, question mark. MJ's eyes widened as she heard that name, recalling the name of the company they just left. After a moment's thought, she took out her phone and sent a text to Peter as she knew this would get complicated. Sister Margaret's school for wayward children was filled with the chatter of mercenaries, their stories of daring exploits and narrow escapes bouncing off the worn walls. Tonight, the air was thick with anticipation as the patrons awaited the return of Wade, the man who pissed off Spider-Man and was thrown through a golden portal soon after. It was truly an eye-opening experience for them. The creaking door swung open, and Wade stormed in, his disheveled appearance and the pungent smell of garbage announcing his unfortunate encounter with the dumpster out back. Ignoring the stares and disgusted looks, he plopped himself back onto the barstool, his stained red and black suit clinging to his body. Weasel, held back his laughter as he set a glass in front of him and poured a generous amount of liquid courage. Wade took a deep swig of the drink and let out a dramatic sigh. Damn it. Leaving me like that for a girl. What's a guy gotta do to get some quality time with his best buddy? Am I not your best buddy anymore? Weasel asked jokingly, his eyes flickered from Wade to the group of mercenaries who had just entered. Hey, you guys have to return your winnings from Wade's dead pool. He's alive and as ugly as ever. Suck my balls? Wade countered casually as he sipped his drink, his eyes narrowing with interest. Deadpool? Huh? One of them grunted in annoyance as he turned to I Wade. Are you sure that's him? Because last I saw, that shithead wasn't the son of Voldemort and Smeagol. Instantly, the bar erupted as mercenaries who had wagered on Wade's demise turned to him and Weasel, refusing to pay back their winnings. Wade ignored the clamor, his mind fixated on the newfound name. The word Deadpool resonated with him, capturing the essence of his uncanny ability to cheat death. He grinned, his scarred face contorting into a mischievous expression. Fine, fine. Deadpool it is. If I gotta be some hero for the Avengers, might as well have a badass name. The mercenaries continued to holler over him, their voices blending into a chaotic chorus. Wade drunkenly raised his glass, taking another swig before standing on the barstool, his voice booming above the uproar. Attention, my fellow scoundrels and scalawags. From this day forth, I am Deadpool, the regenerating degenerate, the merc with a mouth, and your friendly neighborhood pain in the butt. So, if any of you sorry bastards want to take a shot at the king, then bring it on. The bar fell silent, all eyes fixed on the crimson-clad figure standing defiantly on his seat. Though it didn't last long. Only seconds after the words left his mouth, every person in the bar grabbed what they could, beer bottles, mugs, trays, etc., and furiously threw them his way. As the rain of glass and liquor descended, knocking Wade's drunk but off the stool, fights broke out as the entire bar turned into a royal rumble. Weasel. Wade yelled as he maneuvered around the chaos. Get me a refill. He held his empty glass above his head. Damn you, Wade. Weaseling replied, hiding behind the bar. That's Deadpool to you, meat sucker. Peter entered a meeting room in the Avengers Tower, his spider suit still on, Lily and MJ waiting outside. He scanned the room and locked eyes with Danny Rand, the man who had caused quite a stir at Rand Enterprises. Peter took a seat across from Danny and offered a friendly smile. Hello, Mr. Rand. Peter greeted, extending a hand. Welcome to the Avengers Tower. I'm Spider-Man. Danny regarded Peter cautiously, his eyes flickering with a mix of confusion and wariness. He took Peter's hand hesitantly, feeling a surge of energy pass between them. Or should I address you by your title? Peter continued, confusing Danny for a moment. You're the Iron Fist, yes? Danny's eyes widened, his grip on Peter's hand tightening instinctively. The room seemed to darken around him, and a faint yellow glow emanated from his clenched fist, his gaze darting around the room, searching for a possible threat. Why you? How do you know about that? Danny stammered, his voice filled with equal parts astonishment and disbelief. He had never revealed his true identity as the Iron Fist to anyone outside of Kuanluan, and the fact that Peter knew sent shivers down his spine. Not even the hand should know of his identity. Peter raised his hands in a placating gesture, his demeanor relaxed. Relax, Danny. I don't mean any harm. I just wanted to address you correctly, that's all. I'm sure you've been through a lot, so I understand if you're on edge. Danny's hand slowly stopped glowing, and he relaxed his tense muscles. He cautiously moved closer to the door, his mind grappling with the situation at hand. Why did you leave Kuenluan, Danny? Peter asked, his voice gentle yet piercing. You're supposed to be guarding the gate, protecting the city. Although Peter made it clear that he meant no harm, every word he spoke seemed to put Danny further on edge. Is the gate open? I've always wanted to visit, you know? He asked. Danny froze, his breath hitching in his throat. The question hung in the air, leaving him vulnerable and exposed. How did this person know so much? How? How do you know all of this? Danny managed to utter, his voice barely above a whisper. Peter leaned back in his chair, his eyes locked with Danny's. Let's just say I've had my fair share of adventures. And now that you're here, it makes me wonder, who is protecting Kuenluan right now? The air grew heavy as Danny's fist began to glow once again, ready to do his duty to protect Kuenluan. Even if he wasn't there. But suddenly, that heaviness disappeared as Peter burst into laughter. Ha ha ha. He couldn't hold it back anymore. 
You should see the look on your face? It's priceless. Ha! Danny grunted in confusion. Lily stood outside the meeting room, her small hand gripping the doorknob tightly. She could hear her father's voice, a mix of amusement and mischief, as he interacted with Danny, the man who she and her mother went out of their way to help. Her father had a special way of making people uncomfortable and confused. To put it simply, he likes messing with people, but she knew he meant no harm. She took a deep breath, stealing herself, and pushed open the door. Her eyes narrowed as she saw her father, still dressed in his Spider-Man suit, leaning back in his chair, laughing like a madman. Danny looked perplexed, his brows furrowed and a mixture of shock and concern etched on his face. Hey! Lily's voice rang out, her tone stern and assertive for someone her age. Stop being mean to my new friend. MJ followed closely behind, a small smile playing on her lips. She knew Lily had a knack for handling her father's antics. Peter's eyes widened in surprise as he turned to face his daughter. He tried to hide his amusement, but his grin couldn't be contained. I was just, having a little fun. Lily crossed her arms and narrowed her eyes even further. You're Spider-Man, you're supposed to help people, not pretend to be a villain. Peter's smirk remained, though he nodded. Sure, but playing the villain can be fun sometimes. Danny glanced between Peter and Lily, the tension in his body slowly dissipating. He could hear the genuine concern in Lily's voice, and it helped him realize that Peter was just messing with him. Still, one question remained at the forefront of his mind. How do you know so much about me and Kuenluan? Danny asked, his voice filled with a mix of curiosity and wariness. Peter hesitated for a moment, his mind racing with possibilities. I guess it's finally time to reveal it. Taking a deep breath, he decided it was time to reveal one of his secrets. Well, Peter began, his voice calm yet tinged with gravity, I have something to tell you. Something that very few people know, not even the Avengers. He paused for a moment, collecting his thoughts. I am the leader of the hand. Danny's eyes widened in surprise, his mind struggling to process the revelation. He had known the hand as a group of ruthless killers, sworn enemies of Kuenluan. But Peter's words suggested something entirely different. You, you're the leader of the hand? Danny's voice wavered, a mixture of disbelief and curiosity. Peter nodded solemnly. Yes, but things have changed. A few years ago, I had a confrontation with the Hand and eliminated their leadership. Since then, I've taken over and redirected the organization's purpose. The Hand now operates as an organization of small-time heroes, helping people in need. We've established bases all over the world. Danny's mind swirled with conflicting emotions, but most of all, he found himself still feeling a bit wary and fearful of Peter. The only thing keeping him from running off or fighting was Lily, who has shown him a lot of kindness and sincerity up until now. I want to make peace with Kuenluan, Danny. Peter continued, his voice earnest. With the gate open, I believe it's time for us to have a meeting. The chaste already knows of the change in leadership and direction, but Kuenluan has been sealed off until now. Danny's wariness began to slowly subside as he processed Peter's words. And with that, he recalled the hawk that flew from Kuenluan, signaling his departure. At the time, he felt that the hawk was a sign, telling him that it was finally time to journey outward, even though doing so would put the home that adopted him in danger. Is this why I had to leave? He wondered. Although he wanted to meet with Joy and the other Meachams again, visit his family home, take back his family's company, and eat all of his favorite foods again, the main reason that Danny left his post was that he felt that it was necessary. Not only for himself but also for the safety of Kuenluan. Wait, what's the chaste? Danny asks as he was never told about them before. And what exactly do you want from me? The chaste is another enemy of the hand, or at least they used to be. They follow the elders of Kuenluan. Peter explains as MJ and Lily took a seat beside him. We haven't had any issues with one another for years now, but I doubt they fully believe that the hand has changed. And you want me to help you show that it's different now? Danny asks curiously. Yes, I would like it if you can send a message back for me. Peter says as a sealed letter appeared in his hand. This will explain everything that's happened and also contains a request for a meeting, which the elders are free to choose the location and time of. He hands over the letter. Danny takes the letter with a dumb look on his face. Ah, uh, okay. My only request is that you and a member of the chaste attend the meeting as well, Peter adds as Danny stashes the letter away. I'd like this to be a meeting that ends the centuries of conflict and bloodshed that the old hand started. I'll be there. Danny nodded. But I'll need some time to get this letter back to Dash. He stopped as a golden portal opened up beside him, showing the mountainous landscape near the entrance of Kuenluan. I can take you there in a matter of seconds, Peter says as the portal snaps shut. But before that, let's talk about your problems as Danny ran. What do you mean? He asked as he tried to stay calm after witnessing a portal open up out of nowhere. Well, Peter gestures to the floor-to-ceiling windows, where the Rand Enterprises building could be seen in the distance. First, let's talk about Harold Meacham. Danny raised an eyebrow. What about him? He's dead. No, he's not. Peter shook his head. What? But. Harold faked his death. Peter interrupts. He used to work with the old hand, so from what I can put together, the guy is bad news. He currently runs Rand Enterprises from the shadows. Why? Danny muttered in shock. Why what? Peter asks. 
Why would he work with the hand? The old hand, I mean. He clarifies. Well, Peter stared Danny straight in the eyes. I don't know how to say this. Then just say it, Danny says impatiently. I don't know this for sure since a lot of the old high-level members of the hand are dead, and they don't exactly keep detailed records, but, Peter frowned, knowing this would infuriate his new acquaintance. I believe that Harold Meacham betrayed your father and sabotaged your plane. Danny stood in silence, processing what he just heard. And as time passed, his fist began to tighten and glow once again, his brows furrowed as a frown marred his face. How do you know this? Danny growled out, finding it hard to keep himself calm. Well, I'm the leader of the hand and old members talk. I've heard that Harold started working with Madame Gao only a week before your plane crashed. I'd say that's a bit more than a coincidence, wouldn't you? Peter explains. Where is Madame Gao? He asks, wondering who this person was, as he knew very little of the hand. She's dead. Peter answers. I killed her myself, but if you'd like some answers, then the best person for that would be Dash Harold Meacham. Danny nods as his fist loosens and the light dies down. Yeah, but before we make any moves, why don't we get you brought back to life? Peter smirks as he pulls out his phone and makes a call. We, Danny asks. Lily smirked as she gave him a nod. Of course. Did you think we would stop helping you? My dad is the strongest in the world. He can help you with anything? Smirking at Lily's bragging, Peter starts talking on the phone. Hey there, Mr. Mayor. Yes, we got your gifts. Tony especially liked the rare medals you sent over? Yeah, I need you to help me with something. After a quick conversation with the mayor of New York City, a blood test was scheduled. And luckily, the Rand family has a long medical history alongside a few blood samples taken over the years from private physicians, so the mayor was able to get a warrant for the samples to be handed over for testing. Hanging up the phone, Peter turned back to Danny, who stood shocked at how easily his biggest problem was just handled. Now, we just wait and hope that your family's doctors kept good records, T thank you. Danny didn't know what else to say. No problem. Peter shrugged. See, Lily says in an I told you so sort of manner. My dad can do anything. She held her head high. Yes, I'm the greatest. Peter nodded in mock agreement. Smack, MJ couldn't take it anymore and slapped him on the back of the head. Sweetie, stop fueling your father's ego. It's big enough already. Danny couldn't help but smile as he saw images of his old family and the masked heroes before him. And as soon as that smile came, it swiftly disappeared as he was forced to remember that his parents were long dead. Danny stepped out of a golden portal, his heart pounding in his chest as he returned to the familiar mountainous landscape near the entrance of Kuanluan. The air was crisp and carried a sense of tranquility, but Danny couldn't fully enjoy it. The weight of his recent actions weighed heavily on his conscience. Truthfully, if he didn't have a very important letter to deliver, Danny definitely wouldn't be returning to Kuanluan right now. Especially not after abandoning his post. As he made his way towards the towering gates of the ancient city, Danny's footsteps echoing through the silence, he braced himself for the inevitable confrontation with the Order of the Crane Mother. The elders and leaders of Kuanluan, the ancient warrior monk society that took him in and trained him as their own, would undoubtedly be disappointed in him for leaving his post without a word. Passing the gate, which was now being guarded by members of the Order, Danny quickened his pace as his former comrades stared at him in shock. Though that shock swiftly turned into harsh, piercing glares. And after a short trip through the city, where every citizen of Kuanluan parted, making way for the Iron Fist as they eyed him in confusion. After all, word of his disappearance spread all across the city only a day after he left. Murmurs throughout the crowd containing words like traitor and deserter caused Danny to hang his head lower as he passed by. Finally, Danny arrived at a huge Chinese-style temple, which sat at the center of the city. The temple stood tall and majestic, its vibrant colors and intricate architecture was a testament to its rich history and spiritual significance. The entrance, adorned with ornate red pillars and golden embellishments. A carving of a tranquil crane stood proudly on the towering double doors. Dragon motifs coiled around the pillars at each side, their scales shimmering in the sunlight, symbolizing strength and wisdom. Stepping forward, the gates creaked open, and Danny entered the courtyard where a few elders have already gathered, waiting for his arrival after hearing of the Iron Fist's return. Their expressions were a mix of concern, disappointment, and sternness. He could feel their piercing gazes on him as he approached. One elder, with a long white beard and wise eyes, stepped forward. Danny. Iron Fist, you have returned to us, he said in a solemn voice, his tone laced with a hint of relief and concern. You left your duty without explanation. Explain yourself. Danny bowed respectfully before the elders, his head lower than usual. I apologize for my sudden departure, he began, his voice filled with guilt. But I had to leave to seek answers and confront the truth about my family's past. Another elder, a woman with a stern expression, spoke up. And what answers did you find? Danny took a deep breath, gathering his thoughts. I discovered that the Hand, our sworn enemies, have undergone a transformation, he revealed. Question mark. Questioning looks flashed on each elder's face. Danny continued. Although I wasn't able to investigate, I've been told they're no longer the organization they once were. 
They now operate as a force of small-time heroes, helping people in need. If you weren't able to investigate, how do you know this? The bearded elder asks doubtfully. I? I met their new leader. Danny says, his words sending waves of confusion and suspicion amongst the elders. The elders exchanged glances between one another, unsure how to handle this odd bit of information. The female elder spoke again, her voice tinged with skepticism. You expect us to believe that the Hand, the ancient enemy of Kuanluan, has suddenly changed its ways? This is nothing but another deception. How could you fall for this, Danny? Danny's eyes met the elder's gaze, his determination evident. I understand your doubts, but the leader of the Hand, Spider-Man, has requested a meeting. He wants peace. He takes out a sealed letter and Avengers it stamped proudly on the front. He sent me to deliver this letter. This is obviously a trap. An elder scoffed. I thought that as well. Danny nods his head. But apparently, we get to choose the location and time of the meeting. The elders exchanged glances once more, their expression softening slightly. The bearded elder took the letter from Danny's outstretched hand and began to read it, his eyes scanning the words carefully. Silence hung in the air as the elders absorbed the contents of the letter. Danny could feel the weight of their decision looming over them all. Would they accept the invitation for peace? Would they trust the words of a former enemy? Finally, the bearded elder folded the letter and looked at Danny with a mix of contemplation and worry. Iron Fist, you have returned to us with a proposition that holds great significance. The decision lies with the Order of the Crane Mother, and we shall convene to discuss this matter further. But until then. The elder sighed as he eyed Danny regretfully. Question mark. Danny frowned in confusion as he saw this. He had taken a risk by returning after leaving his duty behind. As Danny frowned, the courtyard of the temple was suddenly surrounded by countless members of the Order of the Crane Mother. The stern expressions on their faces made it clear that they were prepared to enforce the consequences of Danny's actions. The weight of his choice to abandon his duties as the iron fist hung heavily in the air. The bearded elder, who had been the first to confront Danny, looked at him with a mixture of disappointment and concern. He had been like a father figure to Danny since his arrival in Kuanluan, but even he couldn't protect him from the consequences of his actions. Danny, the bearded elder said with a heavy sigh, stepping forward to stand beside him. I understand your frustration, and your desire to seek the truth, but you know that abandoning your post is a grave crime in Kuanluan. Especially for the Iron Fist. Danny's fist tightened and began to glow involuntarily as his anger and frustration surged. He contemplated fighting his way out, but the bearded elder's calming presence and pleading voice urged him to reconsider. Please, Danny, the elder pleaded, his voice filled with genuine concern. Resorting to violence will only strengthen the belief that you are a traitor. Many already questioned the decision to grant the Iron Fist to an outsider. We need to handle this situation with wisdom and diplomacy. Danny's fist slowly dimmed as he realized the truth in the elder's words. He had always believed in the principles of peace and harmony that the Order of the Crane Mother upheld. His actions now could either restore or shatter that belief, as well as his reputation. Reluctantly, Danny nodded, his expression showing his acceptance of the consequences. He turned himself in, raising his hands in surrender as members of the Order approached to restrain him. Chains with odd carvings were placed around his wrists, binding him tightly, but also suppressing his chi at the same time. As he was led away, the bearded elder's voice echoed in his ears. I will do everything in my power to fix this, Danny. The decision lies with the Order of the Crane Mother, but I will advocate for you. We will convene and discuss this matter further. Have faith. Danny's heart felt heavy as he was taken through the winding corridors beneath the temple. The chains clinked with each step, a stark reminder of his actions. He couldn't help but wonder if he had betrayed the trust of those who had raised him, trained him, and believed in him. The cell door creaked open, revealing a small, dimly lit room with cold stone walls. Danny was pushed inside, the heavy door slamming shut behind him. Alone in the darkness, he knew he had to gather his strength and hope that the letter he had delivered would sway the order of the Crane Mother in his favor. As he sat on the cold stone floor, Danny couldn't help but feel a sense of isolation. His fate now rested in the hands of the order, and he could only wait, hoping that his actions would be understood and forgiven. Outside Kuanluan, on the lush mount top, the portal that Danny arrived in floated ominously. Inside the portal, the meeting room back in the Avengers Tower could be seen, where Peter, Lily, and MJ sat, waiting patiently for Danny's return. In the spacious meeting room of the temple, the elders of Kuanluan gathered around a large round table. The atmosphere was tense, and the elders sat in silence, their expressions revealing the weight of the decision they were about to make. At the head of the table sat a formidable figure with a long white beard, Lei Kung, the champion of Kuanluan and the most respected elder in the city. He promised to help Danny get out of this precarious situation, and he would do his meat to uphold it. His wise eyes scanned the room, taking in the faces of his fellow elders. We have gathered here today to discuss the matter of the Iron Fist's return and his actions. Lei Kung began, his voice firm and commanding. It is undeniable that he has committed a grave offense by abandoning his post. However, we must consider the circumstances that led him to make such a choice. One of the elders, a stern-looking man with a bald head and a scar across his cheek, raised his hand to speak. 
Lei Kung, I understand your compassion for the boy, but we cannot overlook the fact that he broke our laws. He is an outsider, and his allegiance has always been questionable. Murmurs of agreement echoed through the room, and several elders nodded in support of the bald elder's words. Doubt and suspicion hung in the air, threatening to sway the decision. Lei Kung's gaze hardened as he met the eyes of each doubting elder. I acknowledge your concerns, but let us not forget that Danny has served Kuanluan with honor and bravery. His devotion to our cause has been unquestionable up until now, and we cannot discount that. A female elder, her voice filled with skepticism, interjected. But what about this letter he claims to have delivered on behalf of the Hand? How can we trust the words of our sworn enemies? Is it, not a trap, a ploy to deceive us? The boy must be in on it. Danny would never. Lei Kung shook his head, his gaze shifting to the sealed letter that lay on the table before them. Though I have considered the possibility of this being a deception, but we cannot dismiss the potential for peace. If the Hand truly desires a new path, it is our responsibility to explore that possibility. A burly elder with a grizzled beard leaned forward, his voice laced with anger. And what if this is all a ruse? What if the five fingers of the hand aren't dead, as the letter says? What if the iron fist has been compromised, and his allegiance lies with the hand? Should we risk the safety of Kuanluan for his sake? Lei Kung's eyes blazed with determination as he stood, his voice resonating with authority. We shall not rush to judgment. Instead, we shall investigate the truth. I propose that we set an advantageous meeting point and assess the situation firsthand. We must determine the sincerity of the hand's offer. The room fell into a tense silence as the elders contemplated Lei Kung's proposal. The weight of the decision hung heavily in the air, and the fate of the iron fist rested on their judgment. Finally, a few of the elders nodded in agreement, their doubts slowly dissipating. It was clear that Lei Kung's words carried great influence, and they respected his wisdom. Lei Kung turned to the doubting elders, his voice filled with conviction. Let us not forget our core values of honor, forgiveness, and the pursuit of peace. We should give the iron fist a chance to prove his intentions. If he has indeed betrayed us, we shall deal with him accordingly. But if there is a possibility for reconciliation and peace, it is our duty to explore it. The room erupted in a heated discussion as the elders debated the course of action. Some still held on to their doubts, while others were willing to grant Iron Fist a chance. Voices clashed, each elder argued with no end in sight. Peter, MJ, and Lily had been waiting patiently in the meeting room of the Avengers Tower for hours, hoping to see Danny return through the portal. They ordered some food and watched TV to pass the time, but no matter how long they waited, Danny didn't seem to be coming back. The room was filled with tension as they exchanged concerned glances, their worry mounting with each passing minute. Peter sighed, his fingers tapping anxiously on the table. He should have been back by now. It shouldn't take this long to deliver a letter. MJ nodded in agreement. Something must have gone wrong. Maybe the monks didn't take too kindly to Danny leaving his post. Lily, who had been sitting quietly for some time, fidgeted in her chair. Her mind couldn't help but imagine the worst-case scenarios. Do you think he's in trouble, Dad? We should go check on him. Peter hesitated for a moment, knowing the dangers that awaited them in the hidden city of Kuanluan. Of course, he wasn't worried about the monks. It's the dragon that made him cautious. Not a lot is known about Sholao, the mystical dragon of Kuanluan, so he wasn't sure how a fight would go between them. But seeing the genuine concern in Lily's eyes, he couldn't bring himself to refuse her. All right, but you both have to promise to follow my orders. Kuanluan is more dangerous than you realize. Lily nodded, her eyes filled with determination as she hopped out of her seat. Yes. Now let's go. She couldn't help but feel excited. After all, Kuanluan is a mystical hidden city, so she felt like an explorer, heading out to discover the Chinese version of Atlantis. With a nod of agreement, Peter led his family toward the portal that had brought Danny back earlier. Stepping through, they found themselves transported to the lush mountaintop outside Kuanluan. The portal snapped shut behind them. As they approached the towering gates of Kuanluan, the gate guard stepped forward, blocking their path. Their expressions were stern and unwelcoming. Peter held up his hands, trying to reason with the guards. We're here to see the Iron Fist. He came here to deliver a letter for me. We just want to make sure he's okay. The guards remained unyielding, their weapons at the ready. Ignoring Peter's words, they lunged forward, attacking without warning. Instantly, MJ and Lily's reflexes kicked in, their spider sense tingling as they rushed forward, dodging the guards, and launched a few attacks of their own. Meanwhile, Peter stood back, his demeanor calm and collected, as he watched his girls effortlessly take down the monks. They seemed to work in perfect synchronization, knocking the guards unconscious before binding them in web. How was that, dad? Lily asked as she held her head high beside her MJ. We were practicing our teamwork at a bank robbery earlier. Cool, right? Very cool. Peter nodded as Lily bounced on her feet, happy with her father's praise. But their victory was short-lived as more guards emerged from the city gate, ready to avenge their fallen brothers and sisters. It became apparent that talking their way through wasn't an option. Peter sighed, knowing that this wouldn't be as easy as he originally hoped. All right, now it's time to let daddy show you how it's done dash he stepped forward, hoping to show off a bit for his daughter but. Lily was already gone. Haha. 
She laughed melodiously as she dove headfirst into the second group of warrior monks, her mother following closely behind her. As the battle raged on, Peter couldn't help but feel dejected as MJ and Lily took all of the fun for themselves. I want to fight too, you know? The girls' enhanced strength and agility proved invaluable as they swiftly incapacitated their attackers. Peter wanted to make peace with Kuanluan, so they both knew that killing would be extremely detrimental to his plans. Finally, they passed through the massive city gate, guarded by the few remaining guardsmen. They looked on in shock as MJ and Lily stood before them, with Peter following along, making sure not to step on the countess unconscious monks that littered the ground. We're not here to cause trouble, Peter said as he stepped over the bodies of their fellow brothers and sisters. We just want to see Danny Rand. Please, let us through. The guards exchanged glances, uncertainty flickering in their eyes. It was clear that their presence had caused a bit of a stir, and their intentions were being questioned. One of the guards, a burly man with a spear in hand, stepped forward. If you'll wait a moment, I can send someone to inform the elders of your arrival. He offered, hoping to use that time to gather more forces and come back with a few elders, who would undoubtedly be able to handle these intruders. Or at least, he thought they would. Peter nodded his head as he and his family stepped back outside of the gate. Sure, we'll just wait here. He says amiably as he conjured a comfy couch, which they all sat on, shocking the monks. And as they settled in, the burly monk sent a messenger off, who would no doubt inform the elders. The messenger from the gate hurried through the corridors of the temple, his footsteps echoing against the stone floor. His heart raced with urgency as he sought out the elders, knowing that time was of the essence. Finally, he arrived at the spacious meeting room where the elders had convened earlier. Breathless, he burst into the room, bowing deeply. Elders, I bring grave news, he exclaimed, his voice filled with urgency. There are intruders at the gate. Lei Kung, the champion of Kuanluan, raised an eyebrow, his wise eyes narrowing in concern. Intruders? Are they hostile? The messenger nodded fervently. They claim to be here to see the Iron Fist. They say he delivered their letter. Whispers of alarm and suspicion filled the room as the elders exchanged worried glances. That letter was from the hand, and their supposed arrival raised immediate red flags. One elder, a woman with sharp features and a steely gaze, spoke up. This must be an attack orchestrated by the hand. They seek to infiltrate our city. We must keep them at the gate. They can't be allowed inside. Lei Kung's expression grew grave as he considered the implications. If the hand is involved, we cannot afford to underestimate the threat they pose. We must mobilize our forces and prepare for an imminent attack. The other elders nodded in agreement, their faces etched with determination. The safety of Kuanluan and its dragon was their utmost priority, and they would not allow either to fall into the hands of their most hated enemy. The scene inside the temple had transformed from a room filled with doubt and debate to one of united action and preparedness. Summon every able-bodied warrior monk under our command, declared an elder with a deep voice and a stern demeanor. Prepare the defenses and station guards at key points throughout the city. We must be ready. As the elders hurriedly organized their forces, Lei Kung stood from his seat at the head of the table, his voice resonating with authority. I will lead our main force to assess the situation outside the city gates. The room buzzed with a sense of urgency as the elders rose from their seats, each taking on a specific role in the preparations. They knew the importance of swift action and unity in the face of such a grave threat. Lei Kung turned to the messenger, his eyes filled with a steely resolve. Take us to the gates. The messenger nodded, leading the way as the elders followed closely behind. They moved with purpose and determination, their thoughts consumed by the impending battle and the protection of their sacred city. Outside the temple, the warriors of the city gathered, their expressions grim and their weapons at the ready. The air crackled with tension as they awaited the arrival of their leaders and the imminent clash with the intruders. In the dimly lit cell beneath the temple, Danny Rand, the Iron Fist, sat with his back against the cold stone wall. His hands were bound tightly by chains, each link etched with ancient Chinese symbols that suppressed his qi, rendering him as powerless as any other normal man. He had been left alone in his confinement, the only sounds echoing through the silence were his own steady breaths and the faint drip of water in the distance. Though that suddenly changed as guards, who were supposed to be stationed around the prison, were ordered away, rushing past his cell with weapons in hand. Danny's mind raced with worry and frustration. He had trusted in Lei Kung's words, believing that the elder would handle his situation diplomatically. But the sudden absence of guards outside his cell made him uneasy. What's happening, he muttered to himself, tugging at the chains that held him captive. He strained against their unyielding grip, feeling the weight of his situation pressing down on him. Danny couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. The urgency in the air, the guards rushing off to join the defense. It all felt too coincidental. Was Spider-Man lying to me? Doubts clouded his mind. As his thoughts raced, Danny's determination grew. He couldn't sit idly by while his fate hung in the balance. He had to find a way to break free and discover what was truly happening. Summoning his focus, he channeled his chi, attempting to draw upon Sholao's power. But the chain sapped his energy, leaving him weakened and unable to access the full extent of his abilities. Gritting his teeth, Danny continued his struggle, twisting and turning, hoping to find a weakness in the chains that bound him. 
He had trained since he was 10 years old, honing his martial arts skills to such an extent that he was able to become the Iron Fist. He couldn't let himself be defeated by mere chains. A glimmer of hope flickered in Danny's eyes as he noticed a hairline fracture forming in one of the links. Encouraged by this small victory, he redoubled his efforts, pouring every ounce of his remaining strength into breaking free. Meanwhile, in the city, the army of Kuanluan gathered, their footsteps resounding with purpose and determination as they marched to the gate. The warriors lined up in disciplined formation, their weapons gleaming in the sunlight. At the forefront stood the elders, their expression stoic and unwavering. Soon enough, they arrived meters from the gate and Lei Kung, the champion of Kuanluan, raised his hand, signaling a halt to the marching army. He glanced at the gate, eyeing the three oddly dressed intruders, wondering where the hand could have found such weird individuals. Peter, MJ, and Lily still sat comfortably on the couch, watching the army across from them. Peter had hoped to avoid a confrontation, to find a peaceful resolution to this tense situation. But that didn't seem to be possible. Just as Lei Kung was about to give the order to proceed, Peter stood up, his red and blue suit standing out among the sea of warrior monks. Beside him stood MJ and Lily, both ready to fight at any moment. Hello. Peter called out, his voice echoing across the open space between them. We're not here to fight. We just want to talk and find out what's going on with Danny. Lei Kung nodded, grateful for Peter's intervention. Stand down, he ordered the army, hoping to defuse the tension. Let them approach. As Peter, MJ, and Lily cautiously made their way past the gate for a second time, the other elders exchanged wary glances. They were not as willing to listen and negotiate. Suspicion clouded their judgment, and they saw only intruders threatening their sacred city. One of the elders, a stern-faced man with a staff gripped in his right hand, stepped forward. You dare speak such flagrant lies after the Iron Fist's betrayal? He sneered, his voice dripping with disdain. You, who are allies of the Hand? Peter shook his head, a smirk hidden under his mask. I'm not an ally of the Hand. I am the new leader of the Hand. Peter revealed, shocking the army of monks before him. Then your death would be a great blow to our enemies, wouldn't it? That same elder scoffed as he rushed forward, raising his staff dangerously. Without hesitation, MJ sprang into action, launching forward as she swiftly evaded the elder's attack. Her movements were fluid and graceful as she countered with her own strikes, her punches and kicks delivered with precision. And seconds after a member from both sides clashed, the rest wouldn't sit still either. The army of monks yelled a deafening war cry as they charged forward without receiving any orders from the elders. Stop! Halt this instant! Lei Kung ordered, though no one could hear him. Not even the other elders, who have already joined their army, charging forward at the enemy. Lily, not one to be left behind, joined the fray, her small frame darting in and out, striking with lightning-fast kicks and punches. Her agility was matched only by her determination, and she fought with the ferocity of a seasoned warrior. Peter, too, joined in on the action, his enhanced strength and acrobatics on full display. He gracefully dodged attacks while delivering his own, taking out a handful of monks every few seconds without a single scratch on his pristine suit. Even the elders that came his way were thwarted with relative ease. The battle raged on, the clash of metal against metal and grunts of effort filling the air. The warriors of Kuanluan fought with discipline and skill, their numbers seemingly endless. But the spider trio weren't deterred one bit. In fact, they seemed to be enjoying themselves. Mom. Lily called out excitedly as she jumped into the air. Watch this. She said as her legs extended, kicking two monks square in the face. Good job, sweetie. MJ encouraged her like the loving mother she was, whilst roundhouse kicking a group of monks into the ground. Lily. Peter called out as he pulled out his phone, dismantling any monks that came his way while focusing his full attention on his daughter. Hold still. I want to take a picture of your first large-scale battle. Lei Kung stared at the spider family, bewildered. What the hell is happening? He felt as though he was dreaming. Back in Danny's cell, time seemed to stretch on, the sound of his labored breathing filling the confined space. Sweat trickled down his brow as he fought against the constraints that held him captive. He tried everything to break the chains, from using his body as leverage to simply bashing it against the hard stone floor. And then, with a resounding crack, the weakened link finally gave way, setting a single hand free. Danny exhaled a breath he hadn't realized he had been holding, a mixture of relief and determination coursing through him. His task was far from complete. He still had to free himself from the remaining chains and find out what was happening outside his cell. With renewed purpose, Danny focused his attention on the remaining restraints, determined to break free and reclaim his power as the Iron Fist. As he worked, the distant sounds of battle reached his ears, and he couldn't help but feel a surge of adrenaline. His instincts told him that time was running out, and he needed to act swiftly. With each chain that snapped apart, Danny's resolve grew stronger, as did his access to his chi, making every following chain easier and easier to break. He had a responsibility not only to himself but to Kuan Luan. He would face whatever challenges lay ahead and protect his home at all costs. Finally, the last chain fell to the ground, leaving Danny standing tall, his body pulsing with renewed energy. He took a moment to steady himself, the weight of his decision settling upon his shoulders. His fist glowed a bright yellow, illuminating the dark cell. 
Boom, and with one smooth punch, the heavy door that held him captive was blown off its hinges, impacting the wall on the other side of the hall before clattering you the floor. With Danny finally breaking free from his cell, the battle between the army of monks and Peter's group continued to rage on. The clash of weapons and the grunts of effort filled the air as both sides fought with unyielding determination. Peter danced along the battlefield, his agility and reflexes allowing him to effortlessly dodge attacks and return them in an instant, decimating countless monks along the way. He used his webs to swing around, finding no reason to use any of his more overpowered abilities on such weak opponents. His fists alone packed a powerful punch, sending opponents flying and crashing into the ground. MJ moved with calculated precision, her spider abilities enhancing her already impressive combat skills. As a member of the Avengers, she was forced into basic training like everyone else, and luckily, she was taken in by Natasha, who she learned from like a sponge. She weaved through the chaos, her movements fluid and graceful. Her silk threads lashed out, immobilizing the monks and rendering them helpless before she delivered precise strikes that swiftly incapacitated them. Lily, in her Spider-Girl persona, showcased remarkable acrobatics and speed. She somersaulted through the air, landing devastating kicks on her opponents. Her small size allowed her to dart in and out of the fray, striking with lightning-fast precision. Unlike her mother, who spent months upon months training under the Black Widow herself, Lily cheated her way to martial arts mastery. As an AI, she was able to analyze countless videos, specifically the surveillance footage from the tower's many training rooms, and incorporated everything she saw into one fighting style. It's practically instant mastery? Peter thought jealously. Lucky little cheater. The army of monks fought valiantly, displaying their years of training and discipline. Though it wasn't enough. Their strikes were powerful and precise, their coordination almost seamless. But they were simply met with a stronger enemy. Peter, MJ, and Lily didn't go very easy on them. They only held back just enough to leave the monks alive and without any serious injuries. As the battle intensified, Lei Kung, still bewildered by the turn of events, decided it was time to intervene. With his fists clenched, he launched himself into the fray, his every move a testament to his legendary martial arts prowess. Decided to finally join the fun, old man? Peter quipped, a playful smirk hidden beneath his mask. Lei Kung's lips curled into a knowing smile as he stroked his long beard. I can't let you young people run wild, can I? He replied, his voice laced with a hint of amusement. His presence boosted the morale of every monk, who redoubled their efforts to overpower Peter's group. They fought with renewed vigor, their determination to defend their sacred city evident in every strike they threw. But MJ and Lily were not easily defeated. They fought back with unwavering resolve, their individual skills combining to create an unstoppable force. I'll let you have the first move, Gramps, Peter offered as he took a calm stance, waiting patiently for his opponent. With that, the two combatants squared off, their eyes locked in a silent exchange. Silently, Lei Kung harnessed the chi in his body and launched himself forward, his strikes swift and precise, aiming to exploit any weakness in Peter's defenses. Peter simply stood there as hit after hit pummeled his body, not making any moves to dodge or parry whatsoever. Lei Kung's strikes landed with calculated precision, connecting with Peter's body. The impacts reverberated through his frame, causing the onlooking monks to cheer in elation. They were witnessing their esteemed elder, the champion of Kuanluan, fighting against a seemingly invincible opponent. The monks' morale soared as they watched Lei Kung exchange blows with the powerful intruder. They were inspired by their leader's unwavering resolve and saw a glimmer of hope that victory was within their grasp. However, Lei Kung himself knew the truth. Despite his best efforts, he could sense that Peter was not exerting his full strength. In fact, he wasn't even trying. He could feel the power that the young masked man was holding back, almost as if he were toying with him. Fight! You insult me with this behavior. Lei Kung called out between strikes, his voice filled with urgency. He instinctively knew that Peter and his group meant no harm to Kuanluan, especially after seeing how they didn't kill a single monk. So, Lei Kung wanted to test Peter's true capabilities and gauge the extent of his power. And in doing so, gauge his own as well. Peter nodded, acknowledging Lei Kung's request. Just remember that you asked for it. With a sudden burst of speed, he disappeared from the elder's sight, his figure reappearing behind him in an instant. Lei Kung, caught off guard, turned just in time to see Peter's fist hurtling toward him. He barely had time to react as the blow connected, sending him flying through the air, crashing into a group of monks, who quickly scrambled to help him to his feet. The battle momentarily paused as Lei Kung regained his composure, his eyes locked with Peter's. There was a newfound respect in the elder's gaze, an acknowledgement of the true extent of Peter's abilities. Or at least, what he thought was Peter's true extent. Well, this was fun, old man. Peter comments as he cracks his knuckles. But I think it's time to end this. With a newfound determination, Peter's eyes blazed with an intense focus as he prepared to bring an end to the battle. The remaining army of monks stood before him, their faces etched with a mix of fear and determination. Lei Kung stood in front of them, his emotions hidden under a calm facade, seemingly ready for whatever was about to come. In a blur of motion, Peter darted forward, his speed leaving a trail of afterimages behind him. His strikes were swift and lethal, each blow finding its mark with surgical precision. 
The monks attempted to defend themselves, but their efforts were futile against the overwhelming force that Peter unleashed upon them. The battlefield transformed into a whirlwind of action as Peter weaved through the ranks of the monks. His fists moved like lightning, shattering their defenses and rendering them unconscious with each strike. The clash of his blows echoed through the streets of Kuenluan, drowning out the cries of the defeated. Within a matter of moments, the once formidable army lay defeated and motionless at Peter's feet. The ground was littered with bodies, both young and old, as every monk and elder bore witness to the might of Spider-Man. As the last monk fell, Peter's attention turned to Lei Kung, who lay on the ground, his body motionless but his breathing steady. Standing over him, Peter's presence was both imposing and triumphant. Now let's find Danny and Dash speak of the devil. Suddenly, a disheveled Danny ran burst onto the scene, sprinting down the road with worry etched on his face. He had followed the sounds of battle, fearing for his friend's safety. But what he witnessed upon his arrival shattered his expectations. With a mix of shock and anger, Danny took in the sight before him. The bodies of countless monks and elders strewn across the city street, and Peter standing over the seemingly lifeless body of Lei Kung, a man who raised him like his own son. The assumption that formed in Danny's mind was one of betrayal and bloodshed. Filled with righteous anger, Danny's voice cracked with fury as he confronted Peter. What have you done? The words dripped with accusation, his fist shining in a dangerous yellow light. Peter's mask hid the genuine surprise that washed over his face. He didn't expect Danny to arrive at such a bad time, nor did he think a misunderstanding would form. He opened his mouth to speak, but before he could form the words, Danny's attack began. Driven by a sense of justice and his misinterpretation of the scene before him, Danny unleashed a barrage of punches and kicks upon Peter. His movements were fueled by a combination of anger, betrayal, and sorrow, his strikes carrying the weight of his accusations. Peter's reflexes kicked into overdrive as he expertly evaded Danny's attacks, each blow landing just inches away from its intended target. Despite his skill, Peter refused to retaliate, instead attempting to explain the truth. Danny, it's not what you think, Peter said, his voice calm and collected. If you just calm down, I can explain. But his words fell on deaf ears as Danny continued his assault, his anger blinding him to any reasoning or explanation. The clash between the two allied acquaintances echoed through the streets of Kuenluan in a battle born out of misunderstanding. Meanwhile, in a nearby cave, hidden behind the ancient city, two large red eyes opened, shining ominously in the darkness. Peter's reflexes continued to shine as he effortlessly evaded Danny's relentless barrage of kung fu-style attacks. He bobbed and weaved, his body moving with fluid grace as he narrowly avoided each strike. Danny's frustration grew evident with each missed blow, fueling his anger and determination to bring down the man he believed had betrayed him. As the fight carried on, Lily and MJ stood at a safe distance, watching the clash between the two heroes. Lily's young eyes widened with concern, her heart pounding in her chest as she observed her father's struggle to explain himself. Shouldn't we do something? Lily asked, her voice filled with worry. MJ placed a hand on Lily's shoulder, offering her a reassuring smile. Your dad knows what he's doing, Lily. He'll handle this. Sometimes people need to work things out on their own. Lily nodded, still anxious but trusting in her father's abilities. Her eyes remained fixed on the battle, witnessing Peter's skillful dodges and Danny's growing frustration. With a deep breath, Peter finally decided that enough was enough. His patience wore thin, and he chose to end the fight, and in found so, bring an end to the misunderstanding. Peter's eyes narrowed, a spark of determination igniting within them. In a split second, Peter shifted his stance, his movements transitioning from defensive to offensive. With a sudden burst of speed, he closed the gap between himself and Danny, closing the distance in an instant. Danny barely had time to react as Peter's fist connected with his midsection. The impact sent him hurtling through the air, crashing onto the hard ground with a loud thud. The wind was knocked out of him, leaving him momentarily breathless. The onlookers gasped in disbelief as Peter's blow landed with such force. MJ's hand flew to her mouth, her eyes widening in shock. Lily's worry escalated as she rushed forward, concerned for her friend's well-being. Dad. Lily cried out, her voice filled with a mix of fear and concern. Peter turned to face his daughter. He'll be alright, Lily. Sometimes you have to knock some sense into people. Just stay back for now, he said, reassuring her. Danny struggled to his feet, his vision blurred and his body aching from the impact. He glared at Peter, still clinging to his belief that he had been betrayed. You, you won't get away with this, Danny spat, his voice filled with defiance and bitterness. Peter's expression softened, his mask hiding his genuine concern. Danny, please listen to me. This isn't what it looks like. We were defending ourselves, but Danny's anger continued to cloud his judgment. Ignoring Peter's words, he lunged forward once again, launching himself at his former ally with renewed determination. Peter sighed, realizing that talking would be pointless in this moment. His reflexes kicked into high gear once more, evading Danny's strikes with ease. Each attack seemed to slow down in Peter's perception, giving him ample opportunity to respond. With each dodge, Peter saw the openings and weaknesses in Danny's technique. His strikes became more precise and targeted, aiming to disable rather than harm. It was a delicate dance, one that showcased Peter's skill and control. 
Danny's frustration grew with each failed attempt to land a blow. He was no match for Peter's speed and strength, and it only fueled his rage further. But he was blinded by his misconceptions, unable to see the truth before him. Peter seized the opportunity, his movements becoming a blur as he closed in on Danny. In a swift and calculated series of strikes, Peter aimed for pressure points, temporarily incapacitating his opponent. As Danny crumpled to the ground, unconscious, Peter turned to Lily and waved her over. See? He's fine. We'll explain everything when he wakes up, okay? Lily nodded her little head up and down as she rushed over to Danny's side, checking to make sure he wasn't hurt too badly. The aftermath of the intense battle left the streets of Kuanluan littered with fallen monks and elders. Peter stood over the unconscious body of Lei Kung, a man who had tried his best to resolve the situation peacefully. I should probably heal him. The elderly take longer to heal, after all and he would no doubt be helpful in explaining everything later on. Waving his hand, Peter healed the sect leader-looking grandpa, slowly erasing all of the damage along his body. And as he turned to check on Lily, suddenly, a shadow began to creep over them and everyone else, who lay unconscious on the ground. A deep, rumbling growl resonated through the air, causing Peter to look up in awe. The sun's rays were slowly blocked out, casting an eerie darkness over the entire city. The source of this ominous phenomenon became clear as Peter's gaze locked onto a gigantic, mythical dragon hovering above him. Sholao, the ancient dragon of Kuanluan, revealed itself in all its majestic and fearsome glory. Its long, serpentine body snaked through the sky, its scales shimmering with a fiery crimson hue. The dragon's immense size was beyond comprehension, its head alone towering over buildings and casting a terrifying shadow across the whole city. The creature's eyes glowed with an intense red light, emanating an otherworldly power. Insert picture of Sholao slash Slifer the Sky Dragon slash or just about any Eastern style red dragon here, its gaze shifted between Danny's fallen form and Peter, as if assessing the situation and determining the appropriate course of action. Peter's heart skipped a beat as he realized the implications of Sholao's appearance. The dragon was the source of the Iron Fist power, granting the chosen warrior a crazy amount of dragon chi and yet, Peter had defeated Danny with relative ease, shattering the assumptions and expectations tied to the Iron Fist. Is he mad that I beat the guy that he chose? Peter pondered the dragon's intentions. Sholao had always been a guardian of Kuanluan, helping to protect its sacred grounds. Though this is the first time he's had to come out of his cave, and surprisingly, there was a battle-hungry look in its bright red eyes. Peter quickly understood the look in Sholao's eyes. This old lizard is looking for a fight. With the city's defenses decimated and the Iron Fist defeated, the dragon was left with no choice but to intervene and safeguard its home from the perceived threat. But most of all, it's been such a long time since Sholao has had a good fight. And he was practically vibrating with excitement. The air crackled with otherworldly energy as Sholao prepared to make his move. The many wings along its long body unfurled, the sound of their movement resembling the thunderous roar of a hurricane. The dragon's body glowed with an intense aura as if priming itself for a devastating attack. Peter's mind raced, searching for a way to defuse the situation, but none appeared. Letting out an exasperated sigh, Peter turned to Lily and MJ, who were gawking at Sholao's appearance. Daddy, Lily called, shakily. Is, is that a real dragon? She asked, recalling the bones that the hand excavated recently. Yeah, which means your time here is up. Peter informs them as he waves his hand, opening a portal below the mother and daughter duo. Huh? The two grunted in surprise as they disappeared, falling onto the couch in their living room. And as the portal snapped shut, Peter could hear Lily yelling at him, disgruntled. Wait, I want to fight the dragon too. Maybe next time? Peter muttered with a small smile as he turned back to Sholao. Summoning his courage, Peter stepped forward, smirking under his mask. His voice carried a mixture of friendliness and taunting as he addressed the ancient dragon. Hey there, Mr. Lizard. Do you need something? I don't have any bugs or whatever it is you eat, so. The dragon's piercing gaze bore into Peter, its immense power palpable in the air. Silence hung heavy between them as Sholao seemed to contemplate Peter's words, unused to anyone talking to him like that. After what felt like an eternity, Sholao's fiery eyes narrowed, a glimmer of understanding flickering within them. Slowly, the dragon's massive head tilted, its immense presence casting a shadow over Peter. A deep, rumbling voice echoed through Peter's mind, resonating with ancient wisdom and authority. It's been a long time since anyone has insulted me. Prove yourself, young warrior. Show me a good fight and I promise to spare your life, as you did with the warriors of Kuanluan. Peter nodded, acknowledging the dragon's challenge. And what do I get if I win? A surprised look flashed across the dragon's eyes, not expecting such a reply. You will not? He replied simply. But what if I do? Peter asks again. Sholao remained silent for a moment, contemplating his answer. Then I will grant you three requests? He offered, knowing that he could never lose to a human. Instantly, the smirk on Peter's face grew wider and wider. And luckily, the mask covered it up. Deal. Peter swiftly agreed. I hope you're a lizard of your word. The streets of Kuanluan were in disarray, with fallen monks and terrified citizens seeking safety in their homes, peeking out of their windows in fear and worry. 
Peter stood before Shou Lao, the ancient dragon, his mask hiding a smirk that betrayed his eagerness for the upcoming battle. Peter took a step forward. All right, Mr. Lizard. If you're looking for a fight, let's do it. But before we get started and end up tearing the city apart, how about we take it somewhere else? He offered, gesturing around him. After all, he spent a lot of effort keeping the monks alive, so killing them in the upcoming battle would be a huge waste. Shou Lao's fiery eyes glimmered with amusement as he regarded Peter. The dragon's massive head nodded in understanding, sharing Peter's exact concerns. You wish to take our battle elsewhere? Very well. Follow along, young warrior. Shou Lao's immense form seemed to quiver with anticipation before gracefully gliding through the air, heading towards a mountain in the distance. Leaving the monks and civilians behind, Peter kicked off the ground and soared through the air, following after the slithering dragon. As the commotion settled in Kuanluan, the frightened citizens cautiously emerged from their homes, their hearts filled with concern for the fallen monks. With a collective sense of purpose, they formed a makeshift assembly line, helping each other tend to the wounded and unconscious warriors. The streets filled with determined whispers as the civilians worked diligently to mend their injured protectors. In the midst of this tender display of unity, a group of curious onlookers couldn't help but turn their gaze toward the retreating figures in the distance. Peter, soaring through the sky, trailed behind the magnificent form of Sholau, the ancient dragon. The spectators were torn between awe and apprehension, captivated by the unfolding spectacle. As the dragon and Spider-Man approached the mountain peak, the crowd of civilians had grown in size. They watched in anticipation, unable to tear their eyes away. Excitement and nervous energy permeated the air as the onlookers held their breath, caught between the desire to witness the epic battle and the concern for their beloved city. From their vantage point, the civilians observed as Peter and Sholau reached the mountain summit. The wind whispered through the trees, their leaves rustling softly, as if nature itself recognized the importance of the imminent confrontation. The dragon scales shimmered in the sunlight, and Peter stood ready, his agile form brimming with determination. The spectators exchanged glances, their faces a mix of anticipation and trepidation. Some leaned closer to each other, sharing whispered speculations, while others clung to each other's hands for support. They were grateful for the distance that allowed them to be mere observers, yet their hearts yearned to protect the dragon who safeguards their city. The scene was set, and the stage was ready for the battle that would unfold before their eyes. The onlookers prepared themselves for what was to come, their minds racing with a mixture of fear, awe, and unyielding hope. They knew that whatever transpired atop that mountain would leave an indelible mark on their memories and the future of Kuanluan. But for now, in this suspended moment, the spectators remained transfixed, waiting to bear witness to the clash between their sacred dragon and the powerful intruder, the outcome of which would ripple through their lives and the fate of their city. As Peter landed on the peak of the mountaintop, and Sholau quickly took his place in the sky, the two locked eyes, a clear signal that the time for talk had passed. Peter extended his arms to his sides, assuming a defensive stance, taking this fight a bit more seriously than the rest. His voice reverberated with a mix of respect and challenge as he addressed the ancient dragon. All right, lizard. Show me what you've got. The dragon's response was a deafening roar that echoed through the mountains, shaking the very ground beneath their feet. Even the inhabitants of Kuanluan felt the city shake with their guardian's war cry. It was a call to battle, an invitation to let their respective powers loose and engage in a fight for the ages. You know what? Peter thought as he felt the urge to test out an ability of his. I might as well. The air crackled with tension as his muscles began to ripple, veins pulsating beneath his skin. A sudden transformation overcame Peter, his body growing in size and bulk. The clothes he wore strained against his expanding frame, threatening to tear it apart. But amazingly, his spider suit responded to his changing form, stretching and expanding seamlessly as his limbs thickened and muscles bulged. The red and blue fabric adapted to his new proportions, accommodating the incredible power that now coursed through him. The metamorphosis wasn't the most enjoyable experience though. Peter clenched his jaw, gritting his teeth as the changes brought brief waves of intense discomfort. Every cell in his body seemed to shift and rearrange itself. He felt a growing pressure building up, a power surging within him. And then, with a mighty roar of his own, it erupted. His body, once microscopic compared to the dragon above, could now only be said to be tiny or small. Peter transformed into the Red Hulk, a towering figure which he planned to hide as a sort of trump card. But thanks to the secluded dimension of Kuanluan, he decided to give it a test run. His now massive fists clenched, the ground quaking beneath his feet as he prepared to confront Sholau. Speak of the devil, Sholau's eyes widened in surprise at the sudden transformation. He had not anticipated his human opponent to possess such a formidable ability, but his excitement for a worthy fight only grew. The dragon bared its fangs and let out a thunderous roar, shaking the very foundation of the mountain once again. Peter's confidence surged as he launched himself into the air, creating a crater under his feet as he propelled himself with the incredible force of his enhanced muscles. With a mighty swing of his massive fist, he aimed a powerful blow at Sho Lao's jaw, hoping to catch the dragon off guard. The impact reverberated through the mountain, sending shockwaves in all directions. Sho Lao staggered backward, his massive head recoiling from the force of Peter's punch. 
The dragon scales shimmered, and even a few cracked under the blow, but most remained intact, protecting him from a devastating attack. The ferocity in Sholao's eyes intensified as he regained his balance, his fiery gaze fixated on the goliath of a man before him. Without hesitation, the dragon launched himself into the air, his wings beating with incredible power. He unleashed a barrage of countless fireballs, each one hurtling toward Peter with blistering speed. Peter's agility and reflexes kicked into high gear as he evaded the fiery onslaught. He somersaulted through the air, twisting and turning with remarkable grace, narrowly avoiding the searing flames that threatened to consume him. And as he dodged the attacks, he noticed an opening in Sholao's defenses. Seizing the opportunity, he propelled himself toward the dragon with a powerful leap, his massive fists primed for another strike. The clash of titans shook the mountain once more as Spider-Man's fists collided with Sholao's scaled hide. The impact reverberated through the air, causing cracks to form in the surrounding rocks and trees. Peter's blows carried immense force, and Sholao roared in pain and fury. Unfazed by the dragon's thrashing counterattacks, Peter pressed on, his movements fluid and calculated. He ducked and weaved, avoiding the swipes of Sholao's powerful claws, and retaliated with bone-crushing punches of his own. The battle raged on, their clash echoing on for miles and miles. Peter utilized his strength and speed to his advantage, landing devastating blows on Sholao's vulnerable spots, while the dragon responded with bursts of fire and powerful tail swipes. Minutes turned into hours as the two warriors pushed each other to their limits. The mountain trembled beneath their relentless assault, and the air crackled with raw energy. Peter could feel the exhilaration coursing through his veins, the thrill of testing his powers against a legendary opponent. Sholao's determination was unwavering, and Peter admired the dragon's indomitable spirit. But as the battle raged on, it became clear that Peter's agility and raw strength were proving to be an equal match for the ancient creature. And his small size, compared to Sholao's, gave him the added benefit of being a small target. With each blow, Peter could sense the dragon's shock mounting. Sholao never expected to fight equally with a human, but somehow this impossibility was unfolding right before his eyes. Peering down at his opponent as the battle came to a brief standstill, Sholao couldn't keep the smile from forming on his scaly face. Haha. I seem to have underestimated you. He laughed happily. Well, I don't know about you. Peter replied as he stomped one foot, denting a large portion of the mountain in seconds. But I still have a lot more strength to show. Sholao didn't reply and simply laughed once more his body seeming to radiate with a red-hot energy, which just kept building and building. The ground beneath Peter's feet cracked and splintered as the mountain itself seemed to tremble in response to the mounting power radiating from Sholao. The dragon's laughter filled the air, reverberating through the valley as if challenging Peter to push himself even further. Try not to die, little warrior. His booming voice echoed in Peter's mind. Peter's eyes widened as he felt a surge of energy course through his veins, his body responding to the dragon's escalating power. He couldn't let Sholao overshadow him in this battle. Gritting his teeth, Peter tapped into the wellspring of his inner strength, allowing it to surge forth, his body radiating with red sizzling energy. Gamma radiation. With a primal roar, Peter leaped into the air, his body propelled with newfound might. The mountain quaked beneath him as he flew with a thunderous impact, creating a shockwave that rippled through the surroundings. Sholao, sensing the shift in Peter's aura, met his adversary head-on. The dragon's wings beat forcefully, creating a gale that swept through the mountaintop, tearing trees from their roots and sending debris flying in all directions. Peter unleashed a series of radiation-infused strikes, his colossal fists colliding with Sholao's armored hide, causing the dragon to stagger backward. Each blow sent shockwaves rippling across the landscape, leaving deep fissures in their wake. Sholao retaliated with a ferocious onslaught of fire, his breath igniting the sky in a fiery inferno. Flames danced and engulfed the already burning mountaintop, casting an eerie glow on the fierce combatants. Peter's muscles rippled as he summoned his inner strength, his veins pulsating with power. He absorbed the brunt of the dragon's flames, allowing the fire to wash over him without harm. His eyes burned with determination as he charged toward Sholao, shrugging off the heat that threatened to consume him. With a mighty swing of his colossal fist, Peter sent a shockwave of force toward Sholao, creating a devastating shockwave that tore through the air. The impact shattered the ground beneath them, sending debris and rocks hurtling into the sky. Sholao's scales shimmered, resilient against the onslaught, but more and more cracks began to appear, a testament to the relentless force of Peter's attacks. The dragon roared in defiance, his eyes glowing with an intensity that matched the raging inferno around them. The battle escalated, and the combatants tore through the landscape, leaving nothing but destruction in their wake. Trees were burned and uprooted, boulders were pulverized, and the very fabric of the mountain seemed to crumble under the sheer force of their clash. The toll that their battle took on the environment was evident. The once serene mountaintop was now a battleground, scarred, charred, and ravaged by the cataclysmic forces at play. Their movements became a blur of raw power and primal fury. Peter's blows landed with the force of an avalanche, while Sholao's tail swipes created shockwaves that reverberated through the air. The clash of their strength echoed across the valley, drowning out the sounds of nature itself. The onlookers in Kuanluan now finished with treating the wounded monks, watched in awe and trepidation. 
Their hearts raced with a mixture of fear and anticipation as they witnessed the clash between these titanic beings. The destructive spectacle both thrilled and filled them with a sense of unease, thinking that their beloved city hung in the balance. The mountain peak became a battleground wreathed in fire and smoke, the clash of their powers threatening to consume everything in their wake. Peter's unyielding determination fueled him as he pressed on, unleashing a barrage of devastating attacks, while Sholau continued to counter. Peter's muscles burned with exertion, but his resolve remained unyielding. Every blow he landed on Sholau sent tremors through the mountain, the force threatening to bring the ancient dragon to his knees. Sholau retaliated with torrents of fire, engulfing Peter in a blazing inferno. Flames licked at his body, but he pushed through the pain, his enhanced durability protecting him from the worst of the assault. With a burst of strength, he pushed through the flames, his fists connecting with Sholau's armored scales. The impact reverberated through the air, shaking the very foundation of the mountaintop. Sholau let out a thunderous roar, spitting hot bubbling blood from his mouth as his wings flapped wildly, fighting to regain his balance. Peter seized the opportunity, propelling himself forward with a surge of power. Launching himself into the air, he aimed a powerful uppercut at Sholau's jaw. The force of the blow sent the dragon hurtling backward, his wings momentarily faltering. The spectators in Kunluan held their breath, their eyes locked on the airborne clash. Sholau's body collided with the mountainside, causing a tremendous explosion of rocks and debris. Dust and smoke filled the air, obscuring the battlefield from view. And for a moment, silence enveloped the mountaintop. Peter descended from the sky, landing gracefully amidst the chaos. He scanned the dust-filled haze, his senses on high alert. As the smoke cleared, he caught sight of Sholau lying motionless on the ground, his massive form sprawled across the mountain slope. A mix of relief and exhaustion washed over Peter as he approached his fallen foe. It's been a while since I've fought like that? The dragon's fiery eyes were closed, and his breaths came in shallow, rhythmic patterns. Sholau had been knocked unconscious, unable to continue the battle. Kneeling beside his huge head, Peter's adrenaline began to subside, replaced by a deep sense of accomplishment. He had bested the legendary dragon, Sholau the Undying, an impossible task for the majority of people. But he couldn't help but feel a sense of respect for his vanquished opponent. It's over, Peter whispered, his voice carrying a tinge of admiration. You fought well, Sholau. The onlookers in Kuanluan emerged from their shocked silence, erupting into upset shouts and fearful weeps. They had witnessed the defeat of their beloved dragon, and their hearts just couldn't take it. After all, to them, Sholau is practically a god. And their patron god was just beaten down by the man who demolished their city's protectors. A clear enemy in their eyes. Peter stood, returning back to his normal size, his muscles aching and his body covered in dirt and sweat. He looked out toward the city, hearing their complaints and cries from a distance, a small smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. They still think I'm here to kill them or something? Though why would they think otherwise? As the citizens of Kuanluan freaked out, their voices echoing through the valley, Peter cast one last glance at Sholau. The dragon's presence, once a majestic symbol of fear and awe, now lay dormant and defeated. At that moment, Peter felt a sense of accomplishment that he hasn't felt in a long time. Due to his crazy level of power, it's hard to find someone who can match him in a fight. Sometimes, he felt like Saatama from One Punch Man, always looking for that one person who can give him a thrilling battle. But now, for the first time in a while, Peter found that person. Maybe I should use one of my requests to schedule monthly spars? Back in the bustling city, a palpable sense of fear permeated the air as a crowd began to gather at the southern gate. Their eyes were fixed on the approaching figure, clad in spider-themed attire, as he effortlessly dragged a majestic dragon beast behind him by a horn on its head. At the forefront of the anxious crowd, a handful of elders had managed to overcome their injuries and join the spectacle. Among them was Lei Kung, whose injuries had miraculously subsided, courtesy of Peter's intervention. The elders huddled together in their tattered robes, trembling with trepidation in the face of this formidable man who had triumphed over the indomitable Sholau. The sight was enough to make even the most stoic among them quiver. With each step the unbeatable intruder took, the crowd's apprehension grew, reaching its climax as he halted before them, leaving Sholau just outside the imposing gate. The weight of the moment bore down on the onlookers, causing some to drop to their knees, their resolve shattered. In fact, a few unfortunate souls even succumbed to an involuntary loss of bladder control. Yet, amidst the sea of terror-stricken faces, Peter calmly raised his hand, offering a casual wave that defied all expectations. Yo! He greeted, his nonchalant tone sending shockwaves through the crowd, dispersing their fear like morning mist under the sun's gentle rays. Lei Kung, the first to regain his composure, felt a flicker of validation. His earlier intuition had been spot on, and now he finally recognized the truth of the matter. They messed up. They started a fight they never should have picked, with someone far beyond their league. But fortunately, the other party seemed surprisingly forgiving, holding no grudges whatsoever. Lei Kung, the Thunderer, stood at the entrance of the main gate, his weathered face etched with a mixture of awe and gratitude. The other elders of Kuanluan stood beside him, their expressions a blend of respect and caution. They had gathered to bid farewell to the formidable warrior who had bested Sholau and brought about an unexpected truce between their ancient city and the Hand. 
Peter approached the elders, his demeanor friendly and casual. The power that had once instilled fear in their hearts now seemed to disappear, replaced by a sense of camaraderie and understanding. I appreciate all of you gathering here, Peter began, his voice carrying a sense of sincerity. I believe this agreement will be a step towards peace. And perhaps, cooperation sometime in the future. Lei Kung, his eyes filled with a mix of reverence and caution, nodded solemnly. Indeed, you have proven your strength and your intentions. We shall honor this agreement and meet again in 15 years when the gate of Kuanluan reopens, Peter smiled under his mask, a spark of hope igniting within him. I look forward to that day. Until then, I'll ensure the hand respects this truce. The elders exchanged glances, their weathered faces showing a flicker of doubt mixed with a newfound sense of trust. They had come to understand that Peter was not their enemy, but a force that could bring about change and balance. Before leaving, Peter turned to Lei Kung. Oh, yeah. When Xiao Lao wakes up, tell him that I'll visit whenever I have some free time. He owes me a few favors and my daughter will no doubt want to meet a real live dragon. He said, receiving a stunned nod in return. As Peter walked off, a familiar voice called out from behind him. Wait. He turned to find Danny Rand, the Iron Fist, standing a few feet away. With Lei Kung and Peter backing him, Danny had been officially pardoned for his crimes against Kuanluan and released from prison. Hey! Peter greeted him with a nod. Danny stepped up, a noticeable frown on his face. I just... I wanted to say I'm sorry for attacking you and Dash he began to apologize, but Peter raised his hand to stop him. It's alright, don't worry about it. We're cool. Peter shrugged it off with ease. Are you ready to leave? I can take you back with me. He offered. Danny hesitated, his gaze drifting back to the city he had once sworn to protect. I? I don't know if I can let them down again. Peter nodded understandingly. It's a tough decision, Danny. But remember, you're not alone. I'm here for you. Just remember to come visit if you end up leaving, okay? Danny smiled faintly, his eyes filled with gratitude. Thank you. I think I need some time to figure things out. But I'll catch up with you soon. With a nod, Peter bid Danny farewell and waved his hand, opening a golden portal before stepping inside, leaving a conflicted iron fist behind. The wind whispered through the rocky peaks of Kuanluan as Danny ran stood alone near the entrance of the main gate. His gaze was fixed on the path down the mountain, a mix of uncertainty and longing etched on his face. Suddenly, a single set of footsteps could be heard, marching his way from the city. Turning around, Danny let out a small smile before turning back to watch the path. Lei Kung approached him, his steps filled with the weight of wisdom and understanding. Danny, Lei Kung called out gently, his voice carrying the depth of a thousand years. I sense the turmoil in your heart, my son. You wish to leave, do you not? Danny turned to face the elder, his eyes filled with a mixture of guilt and yearning. I? I thought about it. This place has been my home for so long, my purpose. But after everything that's happened, I don't know where I fit in anymore. Lei Kung placed a hand on Danny's shoulder, his touch firm yet comforting. It's understandable, Danny. Change is a force that shapes us all, and sometimes it demands that we find a new path. You need to do what feels right for you. Danny's brows furrowed as he struggled to find his words. But what about my responsibilities? The people of Kuanluan, the legacy of the Iron Fist. I feel like I'm abandoning them, again. Lei Kung's eyes softened with a profound understanding. Danny, your heart is filled with compassion and a desire to protect. But remember, true strength lies in honoring your own journey and finding your own purpose. You have the right to forge your own destiny. Danny's gaze met Lei Kung's, tears glistening in his eyes. But I don't want to disappoint you or let anyone down. Although the hand wasn't a threat anymore and the gate would close in about a month, there are still many elders and citizens who would rather keep the Iron Fist in Kuanluan, forever guarding its gate. Lei Kung smiled, a paternal warmth emanating from him. You could never disappoint me, my son. I have watched you grow from a lost child into a formidable warrior. Your heart is pure, and I trust that you will make the right choices? Danny's voice trembled with emotion. Thank you. Lei Kung squeezed Danny's shoulder gently, his voice filled with unwavering belief. Go, Danny. Explore the world beyond Kuanluan, seek your own truth, and discover where your path leads. I will always be here for you, no matter where life takes you. Danny nodded, a mixture of gratitude and determination shining in his eyes. I'll make you proud, I promise. Lei Kung's smile deepened, pride radiating from his weathered face. You already have, my son. When Danny turned to leave, Lei Kung watched him with a blend of affection and admiration. And as the echoes of Danny's footsteps faded into the distance, Lei Kung stood alone in the shadow of the gate, his heart filled with hope and a sense of peace. Marching down the mountain on foot, Danny let out a tired sigh. I should have left with Spider-Man. Peter returned home after a long and eventful day, his body still tingling with the remnants of the Red Hulk's power. The city's skyline twinkled in the distance as he silently made his way through the darkened household, careful not to disturb the peaceful slumber that enveloped his home. He peeked into Lily's bedroom, a soft smile playing on his lips as he saw his daughter sleeping soundly. With a sense of relief and contentment, Peter headed towards the bathroom, intending to wash off the grime and sweat of his battles. He stepped inside the tiled space, swiftly removing his clothes, the warm glow of the lights creating a serene atmosphere. 
As he turned on the faucet, the water cascaded down, providing a soothing rhythm. Lost in his thoughts, Peter stepped into the shower and absent-mindedly grabbed a bar of soap, lathering it all over his body. But just as he lifted his gaze, preparing to rinse off, his eyes widened in astonishment. Above him, on the ceiling, a glitching gooey portal appeared, shimmering with hues of pink, purple, white, and black. The bathroom was suddenly bathed in an otherworldly light as the portal expanded, captivating Peter's attention. Drops of water splashed onto the tiled floor, forgotten, as he stood there, frozen in place. His mind raced with questions and uncertainties, his heart pounding in his chest. What? What is this? Peter muttered, his voice shocked, his senses on high alert. Before he could react, the portal seemed to reach out, its ethereal fingers stretching toward him. In a swift, unexpected motion, the portal engulfed Peter, swallowing him whole. The bar of soap slipped from his fingers, clattering against the bathroom tiles as the portal closed behind him, leaving no trace of its existence. On the other side of the mysterious portal, Peter found himself standing at the edge of a rooftop. His eyes widened in shock as he realized where he was. The vibrant lights of Times Square danced around him, illuminating the night sky. And there he stood, completely naked, the cool breeze touching his bare skin. Peter's gaze darted around, his mind scrambling to comprehend what had just happened. He instinctively covered himself, feeling the chilly wind of New York City on his nether region. What? How did I? Where am I? Passersbys on the streets below looked up, their gazes filled with surprise and amusement at his nudist display. Peter's cheeks flushed crimson as he stepped away from the edge, hiding from the world below. With a deep sigh, he called forth his spider suit, which immediately covered his body completely. Quickly scanning the area, Peter's eyes widened in disbelief as he spotted a large electronic billboard nearby. He gazed at it with a mix of shock and curiosity, his heart pounding in his chest. The display showcased two images side by side. A Spider-Man, which wasn't him, and a handsome blonde man. Above the pictures, the title blazed with undeniable impact, shattering Peter's understanding of reality. What the hell? He muttered in shock. Spider-Man dead. Identity revealed. Peter stood there, his heart pounding in his chest as he stared at the electronic billboard displaying the shocking headline. Realization began to sink in. He had somehow been transported to a universe where the Spider-Man of this world had met his demise. The weight of the situation pressed heavily upon him as he thought about the consequences of his sudden arrival. I'm not in my universe anymore. Peter whispered to himself, his voice filled with a mix of excitement and trepidation. The bustling streets of Times Square seemed unfamiliar, and the curious glances from passersbys only served to intensify his unease. With determination set in his eyes, Peter knew he needed answers. He had to find out more about this alternate version of himself and the loved ones he may have left behind. He scanned the surroundings, searching for any sign of a computer that could provide him with the knowledge he needed. After all, he didn't have his phone or laptop right now and portals didn't exactly work across the multiverse. Spotting a cyber cafe not too far away, Peter made his way through the crowded streets, his spider sense heightened and alert to the world around him. Finally reaching the cafe, he stepped inside and headed straight to an unoccupied computer terminal. Peter swiftly sat down, his fingers dancing across the keyboard, his skills honed from years of crime fighting and resourcefulness. He searched for any available information on this universe's version of Spider-Man, hoping for some clue about who killed his counterpart. As he dug deeper into the archives, his eyes widened at the wealth of information he found. News articles, photographs, and videos painted a picture of a hero who had fought valiantly but ultimately met a tragic end. Peter's heart ached as he saw images of the fallen hero alongside a familiar face. His Aunt May, who now looked like a shell of her former self, grieving the death of a man who was practically her son. Though she should probably be called Grandma May, as she was much older in this universe. Peter let out a sad sigh as he searched up May's information. His breath caught in his throat as he watched a video of her weeping at the funeral that took place earlier in the day. Maybe I should visit her? He wondered, knowing that she must be going through a lot right now. With renewed determination, Peter gathered his thoughts and made his way out of the cyber cafe. Swinging through the melancholy city, he made his way to Aunt May's house, which was public knowledge at this point. Finally, he arrived at the small brownstone home where May Parker resided. The street was packed with people, their faces etched with grief as they held candles, paying their respect to the home and family of their fallen hero. Peter landed on a house across the street, noticing that the blinds were closed and May wasn't among the crowd. Can't take a hint, can they? Just as he was about to jump down there and disperse the crowd himself, a large group of policemen arrived, telling those gathered to head home. On their way out, many people left candles, flowers, photos, and other trinkets in front of the house. And once everyone was gone, including the police, the front door opened and out came Aunt May, her eyes red from crying and her face etched with sorrow. She stood there, the weight of grief evident in every line on her weary face. Her gaze soon fell upon the things left at her doorstep, finding it hard to look at any of the Spider-Man-themed trinkets. Taking a deep breath, Peter jumped off of the roof and stepped onto the sidewalk, making his way to the grieving woman. He took a deep breath, steeling himself for the emotional encounter that lay ahead. 
He walked across the street, his footsteps light yet filled with purpose. The flickering flames from the candles created a solemn atmosphere, casting shadows on the dark street. Aunt May stood there, her eyes red and puffy, a testament to the grief that consumed her. She peered at Peter, clad in his unique spider suit, with a mixture of confusion and surprise. Um, hi. Are you a fan of my Peter? She asked, her voice trembling with a hint of hope. Peter couldn't help but smirk at her assumption. Well, you could say that, he replied, reaching up to unmask himself. As the mask slid off, he shot a web at a nearby Spider-Man stuffed animal, pulling it into his hands before presenting it to Aunt May. Aunt May's eyes widened in shock as she took in the sight of the young man standing before her. Her hands trembled as she accepted the stuffed toy, feeling a wave of disbelief washing over her. Peter, she whispered, her voice barely audible. Yeah, Aunt May, Peter confirmed, his voice filled with warmth and compassion. I know this might be hard to believe, but I'm from another universe. I, somehow ended up here. Aunt May stood there, momentarily speechless, her gaze shifting between the unfamiliar face of her nephew's counterpart and the spider suit that he wore. The weight of her grief and confusion mingled in her eyes. After a few moments, she found her voice again. Come inside, she said, her tone a mixture of wonder and trepidation. We have a lot to talk about. Peter nodded, following Aunt May into the house. The surroundings offered a sense of comfort amidst the whirlwind of emotions. As they settled in the living room, Peter carefully explained his situation, recounting the events that had led to his arrival in this parallel universe. Aunt May listened intently, her eyes filled with a mixture of sorrow and curiosity. Peter's words resonated with her, as she began to comprehend the impossible truth that stood before her. This has to be connected to the case my Peter was working on before he. Aunt May revealed, unable to complete the sentence. Peter's eyes narrowed. What was he working on? Without a word, May led Peter through the house and out into the backyard, where a lone shed stood at the far corner. The evening breeze carried a sense of anticipation as May inserted a key into the lock dangling from the door. With a click, the shed came alive, glowing with an array of advanced technology. Peter's eyes widened in amazement as the shed door swung open, revealing a hidden elevator. The sleek design and intricate spider-themed patterns showcased the ingenuity of this alternate universe's Spider-Man. It was like stepping into a superhero's secret lair. Whoa! Peter breathed, his voice filled with awe. This is incredible. May smiled, pride shimmering in her eyes. My Peter was quite the inventor. He built this hideout to help him in his mission. He was always looking for ways to make a difference. Stepping into the elevator alongside May, Peter couldn't help but marvel at the spider-themed bat cave. As they descended, the whole place lit up, revealing everything inside. Spider-themed gadgets and tools were meticulously organized, waiting to be utilized in the fight against crime. Vehicles designed for swift and silent travel, a giant computer displaying a web of interconnected data, and a row of different styled spider suits, each with its own unique capabilities. I never had anything like this in my universe. I have access to stuff like this, but I've never made my own high-tech lair. Peter admitted, a tinge of envy in his voice. Your Peter was very impressive. May placed a comforting hand on his shoulder. Well, gadgets and technology can be helpful, but it's the heart of a hero that truly matters. Her words resonated with Peter. He nodded, smiling gratefully for her perspective. Finally, the elevator came to a stop and the two stepped off into the spider cave. Peter's eyes widened in amazement as he took in the sight before him. He couldn't help but feel a mixture of admiration and envy at the level of preparation and dedication that had gone into creating this sanctuary. May walked over to a central computer station and booted it up. A holographic image appeared, and Peter's eyes focused on the face of the kingpin. Though this universe's version of the man looked like a giant with no neck, his body somehow both fat and muscular at the same time. And as Peter stared at the holographic image of Wilson Fisk, realization suddenly struck him. Wait, is this the Spider-Verse with Miles? Immediately, everything started to make sense. The dead Spider-Man, older Aunt May, the Spider Cave. Before Peter could think any further, May spoke up, her voice growing serious. This is the case that he was working on. He believed that the Kingpin was behind a company named Alchemax, which has been experimenting with something that's been sapping the city's power grid like crazy. Peter stared at the image of the Kingpin, memories of his voice over the phone resurfacing. The Kingpin. I know a bit about him. Wait and I plan to hunt him down, but I've been busy lately. Wait. May asks curiously. Oh, he's another hero. My world has a lot more heroes than just me. Peter explains briefly. May nodded, her expression filled with curiosity. Your arrival here might be connected to this case. We need to find out why you were brought here and how the Kingpin and Alchemax are involved. Peter's resolve hardened, and he stepped closer to the computer. Alright, what else does he have? May smiled, a spark of hope igniting within her tired eyes. Well, as they delved into the information, Peter couldn't help but wonder where all of the other spider people were. After all, they should be out there somewhere. And he was especially interested in meeting a certain pig. Peter and May sat side by side in the spider cave, surrounded by the glow of holographic displays and the hum of high-tech equipment. The weight of their mission and the memory of the fallen Peter Parker hung in the air, but they found solace in their shared determination. 
The holographic image of Wilson Fisk loomed before them, his face frozen in a permanent scowl. Peter's eyes scanned the information displayed on the computer screen, absorbing every detail. Alchemax, a research company, he murmured, his voice filled with curiosity. Based in Hudson Valley, New York. Looks like they're working on some top-secret project for Fisk. May nodded, her brows furrowing with concern. But beyond that, we don't have much information about Alchemax or its employees. Peter glanced at May, his voice filled with conviction. May, I think it's time we pay a visit to Alchemax. We need to find out what they're hiding and how it connects to the Kingpin. It might lead us to the answers we're looking for. Of course, he already knew all of these answers as he saw the movie, but he couldn't exactly say that. May looked torn, her eyes flickering with a mix of curiosity and concern. Peter, I want to help, but I don't want to get in your way. I'm not the hero my Peter was. Peter turned to her, his eyes filled with warmth and understanding. Aunt May, your family. Even in a parallel universe. And family sticks together, especially in times like these. Besides, you know this world better than I do. Your knowledge could be invaluable. Although that's partially true, Peter could easily maneuver around this universe on his own. The real reason why he's offering her this chance is simple. Her son just died. May just lost the only living relative left and it was someone she raised since he was a child, so Peter knew, at the very least, that she wanted to be involved in finding his killer and bringing him up justice. Looking at her for a moment, Peter wondered. Maybe she would want revenge? He thought. And if she wanted that, then he would happily facilitate it for her. After all, what's family for if not to exact bloody vengeance on your enemies? A mixture of emotions played across May's face. She looked down for a moment, contemplating her options. Finally, May looked up and nodded. All right, Peter. If you think I can be of help, then I'll go with you. I want to find out who. Yet again, she couldn't finish that sentence. Who killed my Peter? Peter smiled warmly as he pulled her into a hug. Don't worry, we'll find them. They stood up from the computer station and made their way back to the elevator. As they stepped inside, the doors closed, enveloping them in darkness. The elevator ascended with a low hum, taking them back up to the surface. As the doors opened once again, they stepped out of the familiar backyard shed. The evening breeze whispered through the trees, carrying a sense of anticipation. Peter turned to May, a determined glint in his eyes. Let's head to Alchemax and see what we can uncover. May nodded, her eyes reflecting newfound resolve. I'm ready, Peter. Let's find out the truth. They made their way out of the shed, the spider cave locking back up behind them, returning to its appearance as a normal-looking shed. As they walked through the backyard, suddenly, a tall dark shadow descended over top of them, sending a chill down Aunt May's spine. Peter and May looked up, their eyes widening in surprise as they spotted an ominous silhouette perched on the edge of the roof, outlined by the moon's glow. The figure appeared tall and foreboding, casting an intimidating shadow over them. Aunt May's heart skipped a beat, her imagination conjuring images of a fearsome adversary lurking above. Peter, what is that? May's voice trembled with a mix of fear and confusion. She instinctively reached for Peter's arm, seeking comfort in his presence. Peter's senses tingled, a familiar tingling that he's only ever felt around MJ and Lily, alerting him to the presence of another spider person. His eyes narrowed as he studied the figure, trying to make sense of what he was seeing. I don't know. But I sense something, familiar about it. As they watched, the figure crouched on the edge, its hunched form resembling that of a predator ready to strike. The tension in the air was palpable, filling both Peter and May with a sense of unease. Suddenly, with a swift movement, the figure leaped off the edge, hurtling through the air towards them. Peter instinctively stepped in front May, preparing to defend his aunt's counterpart from the potential threat. But as the figure descended closer, something seemed off. Peter's eyes widened in disbelief, and he couldn't help but let out an astonished laugh. May, still clutching Peter's arm, looked at him with a mix of confusion and concern. Peter, what's so funny? Is it, dangerous? Peter shook his head, his laughter subsiding as he pointed at the descending figure. No, Aunt May, it's, it's just. He struggled to find the right words, pure amusement coursing through him. You'll believe it when you see it. As the figure landed gracefully in front of them, the moon's light illuminated its features, revealing the unmistakable form of a small cartoon pig dressed in a Spider-Man costume. Insert picture of Spider-Ham here, Spider-Pig, or Peter Porker, stood before them with a comical grin on his face, his nose twitching with excitement. A slash N, the wiki said his name is Spider-Ham but that sounded lame so I changed it. Maybe I've been influenced by that one family guy meme. IDK. Hey there, fellow spider guy. Looks like you could use a little help. Spider-Ham exclaimed, his voice surprisingly chipper for the circumstances. May's initial fear evaporated, replaced by a mixture of bewilderment and amusement. She released her grip on Peter's arm, her expression transforming into one of incredulity. Peter, is this, for real? A cartoon pig in a Spider-Man suit? Am I dreaming? Peter chuckled, nodding in confirmation. Yep, he must be from another universe, like me. Spider-Pig struck a pose, puffing out his chest proudly. That's right. The name's Peter Porker, the spectacular Spider-Pig. And I'm here to lend a hoof? I mean, hand. He held out a hoof, which then transformed into a hand, waiting for one of them to give it a shake. 
though hidden in the center of his palm was a small electric device, which would no doubt shock anyone who accepts his greeting. Peter's smirk widened as he used his expertise in magic to manipulate the situation. As his hand clasped around spider pigs, a subtle surge of energy flowed through his fingertips, channeling his mystical abilities into the interaction. Unbeknownst to spider pig, Peter's touch triggered a carefully woven spell. In an instant, the small electric device concealed in spider pig's hand was flipped, reversed, and its purpose redirected. The shocking prank was about to take an unexpected turn. Nice to meet you too, spider pig, Peter replied, his voice laced with playful amusement. As their hands connected, a burst of electric energy surged through spider pig. His eyes widened, and a comically exaggerated yelp escaped his snout as visible strands lightning crackled around his body. It smells like bacon. Aunt May commented as she sniffed the air. Whoa! Wah, what just happened? Spider Pig exclaimed, stars floating around his head as he wobbled on his feet. Peter couldn't contain his laughter any longer, the sound bubbling forth as he released his grip on Spider Pig's hand. Magic. He stated cryptically. Aunt May joined in on the laughter, her eyes sparkling with mirth. Well, I must say, that was quite shocking. Peter rolled his eyes at May's horrible pun. Even in this universe her jokes are cringe. Spider Pig took a moment to compose himself, adjusting his Spider-Man mask, he grinned up at Peter and May. Sorry about that, folks. Sometimes I forget that I'm not the only one with tricks up my sleeve, Spider Pig chuckled, his voice a jovial blend of enthusiasm and cartoonish charm. Peter and May exchanged amused glances before Peter spoke up, curiosity evident in his voice. So, Spider Pig, you're from a cartoon universe, right? Like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck. Spider Pig nodded, a mischievous glint in his eyes. You got it, buddy. I hail from a surreal and wacky realm. Picture a world where everything's a little bit zanier, a little more exaggerated, and a whole lot more fun. We've got talking animals, whimsical gags, and villains with wild and wacky schemes. May listened attentively, her curiosity piqued. It sounds, different, to say the least. How did you end up here? Spider Pig scratched his chin, the cartoonish motion accentuating his playful demeanor. Well, Aunt May, I was just doing my usual hero gig back in my dimension when all of a sudden, a swirling vortex whisked me away. Next thing I know, I'm crash landing here. Peter nodded as his words matched his knowledge from the Spider-Verse movie. Looks like the multiverse is full of surprises, huh? But we're glad you're here, Spider Pig. We could use some backup, if you're up for it? Spider Pig beamed, a cartoon mallet appearing in his hands. That's what I'm here for, my web slinging compadre. I may bring the laughs, but I pack a mean punch too. May smiled warmly, her eyes filled with appreciation. Thank you, Spider Pig. We appreciate your willingness to help. You know, my Peter, the one from this universe, he, he passed away. It means a lot to have someone like you helping out. Spider Pig's expression softened, his eyes conveying a mixture of sympathy and understanding. I'm sorry to hear that, Aunt May. Losing a hero like him must be tough. But don't you worry, we're going to find out who did this and make sure justice is served. Peter placed a comforting hand on May's shoulder, offering her silent support. All right, let's head out. It's almost morning, he said as the sky slowly began to brighten. May nodded, her determination renewed. Right, let's not waste any more time then. We've got answers to find and justice to serve. Her eyes narrowed dangerously. Dashing through the corridors of an Alchemax facility with a desktop computer in hand, an overweight Spider-Man in dirty sweatpants frantically searched for a way out. Insert picture of chubby Spidey here, followed closely behind him, a teenager who seemed to be wearing a Spider-Man Halloween costume, rushed to keep up, their footsteps echoing against the sterile walls. Insert picture of Miles here, the air was heavy with tension as they weaved through the maze of hallways, pursued by a horde of security guards. Keep up, Miles. We can't let them catch us. Fat Spider-Man shouted, his voice laced with urgency. He glanced back, noticing the guards gaining ground. With a swift motion, he tossed the computer to his younger companion. Here, take this for a second. Miles fumbled for a moment, catching the desktop as it was tossed to him. His eyes widened, a mix of surprise and uncertainty. Why don't you carry it? You can obviously use the exercise. Hey, he gasped in offense. This is all muscle. He countered as his stomach jiggled with every step he took. Yeah, sure. Miles looked unconvinced. Whatever you say, Peter. As they continued their frantic escape, the guards closed in, their shouts filling the air. Bullets whizzed past them, narrowly missing their mark. Peter activated his web shooters, firing strands of webbing to create makeshift barriers and tripwires, temporarily slowing down their pursuers. But they still needed to quickly get out of this facility. Rushing out of the building, Peter took back the computer and flung one of his web shooters towards Miles, the device landing in his hands. Here, I'll trade ya. It's time to learn how to swing. Miles stared at the web shooter, his brows furrowing with uncertainty. I don't know how to use this. Peter didn't have time to explain in detail. Trust me, you'll figure it out. Just shoot the web, aim for something solid, and swing. As he spoke, Peter aimed his remaining web shooter at a nearby tree and swung off, showing the teenager exactly how it's done. 
Miles hesitated for a moment, then aimed the web shooter and fired, lifting off the ground and swinging into the snowy woods behind Peter. Looking over his shoulder, Peter gave Miles an approving nod. There you go. That's what I'm dash bang, he may have spoke too soon. Instead of a graceful swing, Miles's attempt resulted in an awkward trajectory that sent him crashing into a nearby tree. He stumbled backward, dazed and disoriented. And from the shadows emerged a figure, carrying herself with an air of malevolence. Olivia Octavius, also known as Dr. Octopus, floated towards Miles, her mechanical tentacles extending menacingly. Insert picture of Olivia Octavius here, Miles's eyes widened with fear as he found himself running away from the villainous Dr. Octavius on foot. Uh oh, Miles muttered as she grew closer and closer, his voice trembling. What do I do now? Peter, still swinging away, turned his attention back to Miles. You have to swing. Trust your instincts. Miles looked at Peter, panic evident in his eyes. But I don't know how. Peter's frustration peaked, his voice growing desperate. Don't think, Miles. Just feel it. He hoped Miles's spider senses would assist him. With a surge of determination, Miles let go of his fear and focused on the odd feeling coursing through his body. He aimed the web shooter once more, firing a strand of webbing towards a distant tree. This time, a wave of exhilaration washed over Miles as his body instinctively adjusted to the swing. He soared through the air, narrowly avoiding Dr. Octavius's menacing reach. As Miles swung away, Peter's relief was palpable. That's it, Miles. You're doing great. Miles clung to the sensation of swinging, his movements growing smoother and more confident. Ha ha. I'm doing it. Together, they swung through the snowy woods, leaving Dr. Octavius in the distance. Breathing heavily, Peter glanced at Miles, a mixture of pride and relief in his eyes. See? I knew you could do it. We make a good team. Miles couldn't help but smile, his heart still pounding with the adrenaline of their escape. Thanks, Peter. I couldn't have done it without Dash KSHHHH suddenly, an eerie electronic sound emanated from Peter's body, accompanied by a series of rapid glitches and flickering lights. He convulsed, his limbs jerking as if he were trapped within a malfunctioning video game. Peter. Miles shouted, his voice laced with panic as he watched his friend's distressing transformation. The vibrant colors that danced across Peter's glitching form created a mesmerizing yet unsettling sight. In the midst of his glitching fit, Peter's grip on the desktop computer loosened, slipping from his hands, hurtling towards the ground. Acting on instinct, Miles lunged forward, his body propelled by a surge of adrenaline. Time seemed to slow as his outstretched hand snatched the computer from midair, narrowly averting disaster. The weight of the computer pressed against Miles' palm, its significance now magnified. It contained crucial information, the key to stopping Fisk's plans. Meanwhile, Peter's glitching episode came to a sudden halt, and he plummeted uncontrollably towards the ground. A sharp crack reverberated through the wintry air as he crashed into a thick tree branch, which mercifully cushioned his fall. Miles rushed to Peter's side, concern etched across his face. He carefully placed the computer on the ground, its safety no longer his immediate priority. Kneeling beside Peter, he assessed the damage, his hands trembling slightly. Peter, are you okay? Miles asked, his voice filled with genuine worry. Peter groaned, slowly sitting up and rubbing his head. Yeah, I'm. I'm fine, just a little disoriented. Miles helped Peter to his feet, supporting him as they both stood. What, what was that glitch? Are you okay now? Peter nodded, a hint of exhaustion etched on his face. Yeah, it's just, this universe doesn't seem to agree with me. It's rejecting me, causing those glitches. But they don't last long. With great effort, Peter managed to stand up, gingerly rubbing his throbbing head. He surveyed the surroundings, their situation more perilous than ever. The sound of rapid movement in the distance, unmistakably belonging to Dr. Octavius, grew louder, reminding them that time was running out. Miles's eyes widening as he noticed Dr. Octavius closing in on them, using the trees to propel herself forward. Her mechanical tentacles whirred menacingly, ready to strike. We don't have much time, Peter said, his voice strained. Take the computer and run. I'll hold her off. Miles shook his head, determination filling his eyes. No, Peter. I can't let another Spider-Man die because of me. We're in this together. Peter's expression softened, understanding the weight of Miles' words. He nodded, a grateful smile playing on his lips. All right, kid. Together it is. The two Spider-Men stood side by side, facing the approaching Dr. Octavius. The air crackled with tension as the villainess loomed over them, her eyes filled with malicious intent. Give me the computer, she demanded, her voice dripping with contempt. It doesn't belong to you. Miles tightened his grip on the desktop, refusing to back down. You want it? Come take it? He stated challengingly. Peter's voice was firm, his resolve unyielding. Yeah, so run off back to Daddy Kingpin, or else. Dr. Octavius let out a sinister laugh, her mechanical tentacles twitching with anticipation. You fools can't stop me. I am superior. With a sudden burst of speed, she lunged at them, her mechanical arms slashing through the air. Miles and Peter reacted swiftly, their spider senses guiding their movements. They weaved and dodged, each relying on their own unique fighting style. Miles' inexperienced agility paired with Peter's strength and web-slinging skills. Though it wasn't enough. 
Peter and Miles fought valiantly against the malevolent Dr. Octavius, but their combined efforts were no match for her superior strength and experience. The battle became a desperate struggle, an uphill climb against insurmountable odds. Peter, out of shape and weakened by his glitching episode, found his movements sluggish and imprecise. His muscles ached, and his breath came in ragged gasps as he tried to evade Dr. Octavius's relentless assault. He swung punches and kicked with diminished force, but each strike seemed feeble against the villainous's robotic tentacles. Miles, despite his determination, was hindered by his lack of training and experience. He stumbled and faltered, his reflexes not finely honed like Peter's. He attempted to launch his own attacks, but they were easily deflected by Dr. Octavius's mechanical appendages. With each passing moment, the situation grew direr. The sinister doctor toyed with the two Spider-Men, her movements calculated and precise. Her tentacles struck with blinding speed and unyielding strength, knocking Peter and Miles off balance, leaving them vulnerable. The best they could do was toss the computer away, hoping that it wouldn't break in the process. Peter grunted in pain as a tentacle wrapped around his neck, yanking him off his feet and slamming him into the ground. He struggled to break free, but his weakened state rendered him helpless against Dr. Octavius's superior power. Miles fared no better as a tentacle snaked around his chest, pinning him to the ground. He strained against its grip, his face contorted with determination, but it was a futile struggle. He had never encountered an adversary of this magnitude, and his lack of experience left him defenseless. Dr. Octavius loomed over the defeated heroes, a sadistic smile playing on her lips. Her tentacles tightened their grip, exerting increasing pressure on Peter and Miles. Their struggles only seemed to amuse her further. You thought you could beat me? She taunted, her voice dripping with malice. How adorable. Peter grunted, his strength waning as he fought against the crushing force of Dr. Octavius's tentacles. He exchanged a glance with Miles, a mixture of resignation and determination in his eyes. As their vision blurred and the world darkened around them, Peter and Miles prepared themselves for what was to come. They refused to succumb to fear, their spirits unyielding even in the face of death. As Dr. Octavius prepared to deliver the final blow, her eyes glinting with sadistic delight, a strange golden portal opened up behind her, shocking the downed heroes, as an odd group stepped out. A Spider-Man with a hood, RMC, a cartoon-styled Spider-Pig, and a familiar old lady. Huh? Are we late? The hooded Spider-Man asked as he kicked off the ground. In an instant, a red and blue blur passed over Miles and Peter, severing the tentacles that pinned them down. Ayaha! Dr. Octavia screamed in pain as a green liquid gushed from her tentacles. As she screamed, a mallet-wielding pig appeared before her. Hey there, Missy! He greeted as the hammer came crashing down, knocking poor Olivia back toward the Alchemax facility. Appearing beside the shocked and relieved Spider-Man, Peter, our MC, crouched down and gave them a quick wave. Yo! A slash N, since the Peters are going to get out of hand soon. It's time for nicknames. Peter slash MC, Peter Miles, Miles Peter Benjamin Parker slash Chubby Peter, Ben Spider-Pig, Spider-Pig Spider-Man Noir, Noir Painy Parker, Painy Gwen Stacy, Gwen, as the dust settled and the defeated Dr. Octavius was blown back to where she came from, Ben and Miles slowly regained their footing, their bodies aching from the intense battle. They looked at each other, relief evident in their eyes. Thanks for the save, Ben said, his voice filled with gratitude toward Peter and Spider-Pig before his eyes fell on Aunt May. Is, is that? He asked, his voice trembling in recognition. After all, his Aunt May passed away years ago, so Ben was both shocked and elated to see her again, alive and well. Peter chuckled and shook Ben's hand. No problem. I'm just glad we arrived in time. He shrugged it off as his eyes peered down at Ben's legs. Are you wearing sweatpants? Yeah, that's what they are. Ben answers awkwardly as he sucks in his stomach, feeling self-conscious with a physically fit Spider-Man in front of him. Spider-Pig offered a friendly snort and a wave, his cartoonish appearance adding a touch of levity to the situation. It's always a pleasure to lend a hand, even if it means getting a little dirty, he says as he dusts some green tentacle liquid from his body. Ben's attention shifted back to May, realizing how dangerous it was for her to be here. Aunt May, what are you doing here? Aunt May, her face etched with concern, approached him. We all came together to help. I need to know who, who killed my Peter. She says, staring up at Ben. It was like she could picture her Peter in his place. Minus a few pounds of course. Miles looked at Aunt May, his eyes widening in surprise. You have spider powers too? Aunt May shook her head, a small smile playing on her lips. Oh, heavens no. Ben took a moment to process the sight before him. He couldn't help but feel worried knowing that a version of his Aunt May could get hurt at any moment. Just as everyone was about to exchange further introductions, a rustling in the nearby woods caught their attention. As the rustling grew louder, everyone turned their attention towards the source of the noise. Peter's senses tingled, alerting him to the presence of someone approaching. Moments later, a figure emerged from the foliage, clad in a sleek black and white suit spider suit, insert picture of Gwen Stacy here, it was Gwen Stacy, also known as Spider-Woman. Gwen's arrival brought a sense of relief to the group, as they thought another enemy would appear, especially Ben and Miles, who had just faced a perilous battle. 
She landed gracefully, her web shooters retracting as she approached the others. Sorry I'm late, Gwen said, a hint of sheepishness in her voice as she removed her mask, revealing her face. Had to deal with a few pesky criminals on my way over. Miles' eyes widened as he recognized Gwen as his crush from school. Gwanda, he exclaimed, his voice filled with surprise. Gwen smirked. Close, but it's Gwen, Gwen Stacy. Gwanda was just a name I made up because I didn't know if there was another me in this universe or not. Miles grinned, happy that the girl he liked was also a spider person, like him. How many of you came to my universe? Peter chuckled and patted Miles on the back. Quite a few, apparently. But don't worry, we're all here to help. Suddenly, the sound of approaching guards and barking dogs could be heard in the distance. Aunt May's voice rang out with urgency. Quick, everyone. Back to the portal. Portal. Gwen asked as she noticed the floating golden doorway. Weird. Ben gawks as he picks up the computer they stole, checking it for any damage. Cool. Miles comments alongside them as they watch Aunt May step through, motioning for everyone to follow from the other side. As everyone filed into his portal, Peter eyed the incoming guards with interest. I could end this whole thing now, but that might not be the best idea. After all, he hadn't met all of the other spider people yet. And Miles still needed some proper incentive to become the hero that he's meant to be. When he was the last to go through the portal, Peter caught a glimpse of the kingpin's giant body in the distance. Damn, he's a lot bigger in this universe? He thought as he gave him a wave before stepping inside and closing the portal behind him. Back in Aunt May's house, Peter and the rest of the spider people emerged from the portal, their eyes widening as they took in the scene before them. Aunt May's house was now crowded with even more versions of Spider-Man, each hailing from different universes. I guess, I didn't have to wait long for them to appear. Peter thought as he eyed the two intruders. Penny Parker, a young girl with a giant robot companion, and Spider-Man Noir, a gritty and monochromatic detective. They approached the two with a mix of curiosity and wariness. Peter waved towards them, a friendly smile on his face. Ah. Uh, hey, I'm Peter, but I guess that's a given around here. Since this isn't his world, Peter hasn't been wearing his mask, as his identity meant nothing around here. Penny nodded her head enthusiastically. Nice to meet you, Peter. Your universe is a lot like mine. She glanced over at Spider-Pig, curious about his cartoon appearance. Insert picture of Penny Parker here, Peter shook his head. This isn't my universe, he said as he gestured to Miles. I'm pretty sure that he's the resident Spider-Man. Noir, standing in his black detective attire, surveyed the scene with a hint of skepticism. His voice had a husky tone as he addressed the group. The name's Peter, but you can call me Noir. Seems like we've got a multiverse problem on our hands. Insert picture of Spider-Man Noir here, Gwen looked at Noir with interest. Nice trench coat. But don't you think the fedora is a bit much? Noir raised an eyebrow and adjusted his fedora, his voice dripping with old-fashioned charm. Fashion is part of my charm, doll. Keeps me hidden in the shadows and the dame swooning. Miles, who was still in awe of the gathering spider people, couldn't help but chime in. Whoa. I never thought I'd meet so many different versions of Spider-Man. Truthfully, he never thought that he could meet a single Spider-Man, but that was before his life got flipped upside down. Peter ruffled Miles' hair playfully. Well, get used to it, kid. This is just the beginning. We're a team now. Ben, who had been silently observing the newcomers, mustered up the courage to speak. I'm Peter B. Parker, by the way. Just your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man from another universe. But you can call me Ben. After all, there's a lot of Peters here. Penny turned her attention to Ben, her eyes sparkling with curiosity. Wow, another Spider-Man. Do you have a robot like mine? Ben chuckled. Nah, I'm just your average Spider-Man. No tech, robots, cartoon hammers, or anything like that. Spider-Pig snorted and twirled his mallet between his fingers, clearly enjoying the attention. As the group continued to introduce themselves, Aunt May stepped forward, commanding everyone's attention. All right, everyone, Aunt May began, her voice firm and determined. Does anyone want any snacks? Her tone turned motherly in an instant, a tray of food appearing in her hands. Although they were stunned by the sudden change, the spider people nodded, stuffing their faces with nostalgic snacks. After all, every Spider-Man has had an Aunt May, so any of her cooking would always be preferable. A slash N, ick if that actually true but whatever. After eating some home-cooked food, the whole group settled into the living room, ready to discuss business. Gwen crossed her arms, her gaze fixed on the group. We need to share our knowledge, and come up with a plan. I have to admit. I don't know much. Noir leaned against the wall, a dark cloud of mystery surrounding him. We'll uncover the truth, no matter how deep the rabbit hole goes. Seeing that he knew the most, Miles stepped up to explain. Well, this rabbit hole ain't that deep. He goes on to explain all that he knows alongside Ben, who offered a few words here and there to clarify certain details. Once Miles was finished, Peter nodded his head. So Fisk is making a super collider designed to bridge the gap between dimensions, which is probably why we're all here. And that computer you stole has the information we need to stop it? He summed it all up into two sentences. Miles nodded. Yeah, pretty much. 
As everyone started throwing out ideas on how to handle the situation, offering their own insights and experience, nobody but Peter seemed to notice Aunt May shakily leaving the room, tears flowing from her eyes. In his explanation, Miles revealed who killed her nephew. Or rather, her son. Wilson Fisk. As Aunt May left the room, tears flowing down her face, Peter couldn't help but follow after her, leaving the remaining spider people in the living room, their expressions filled with determination and concern. As they sat together, the weight of their shared responsibility hung in the air. They knew they had to stop Kingpin and his absurdly dangerous plan of his, but a difficult decision loomed over them. Someone had to stay behind and destroy the Collider. Or else people like Kingpin will just pick up where he left off, throwing the multiverse into chaos once again. And sadly, doing so is practically a death sentence, as this universe is almost constantly rejecting their presence. Eager to sacrifice themselves for the cause, each spider person volunteered simultaneously. I'll do it, one after another, they proclaimed. No, no, no. You guys don't get it, a voice interrupted their chorus. It was Miles, the young Spider-Man none of you can stay here. If you stay, you'll die. I'm the one who's going to turn it off, and I'll get you all home before I do. The group exchanged confused glances, prompting one of them to ask, Who are you again? Noir asks. This is Miles, Ben chimed in. And he's going to save the multiverse? He proclaims proudly. Yeah. Miles nods of his head proudly. This kid can turn himself invisible. Watch this. Ben tried to demonstrate Miles' ability, but nothing happened. Miles shook his head. I can't do it on command. Unfazed, Ben turned to the group. He can't do it on command, but it is cool. Show him the zappy thing, Miles. Squeezing his eyes shut and tensing his muscles, Miles tried but once again failed miserably. I can't do it on command, he repeated dejectedly. Instantly, each spider person besides Ben and Gwen gave Miles a doubtful look. Penny crossed her arms, her gaze fixed on Miles. He's too new. Are we sure he's ready for this? Her robot companion nodding behind her. Noir leaned against the wall, his voice laced with skepticism. I've seen what happens when someone inexperienced tries to take on these kinds of villains. It doesn't end well. Miles clenched his fists, his determination shining through. I understand, but I can't just sit back and watch. Not again. This is my responsibility too. I promised Spider-Man that I would stop Kingpin, and I meant it. As if on cue, a glitch coursed through the room, causing each spider person to flicker momentarily as they fell to the floor, groaning in pain. Miles seized the opportunity to drive his point home. See? We need each other. Who's going to send you all back home if you don't include me? I made a promise, and I'm not backing down. The spider people exchanged glances, realizing the truth in Miles' words. They couldn't help but agree that he had something unique to offer as well. Ben cracked a smile. Looks like the kid knows what he's talking about. I say we give him a shot. Despite the skepticism, Gwen defended Miles. Look, I've seen him in action. He's got potential. I think he's going to get us home. Their stamp of approval seemed to slightly wash away the doubt in the room, each of them eager to help Miles prepare for what's to come. Addressing Miles with a cigarette hanging from his lips, Noir cautioned. Okay, little fella, Kingpin's gonna send a lot of mugs after ya. I'm talking hard boys, real biscuit boxers. Can you fight them all off at once? I haven't actually fought anyone. Miles admitted awkwardly. Trying to help Miles comprehend the expectations placed upon him, each member crowded around. Can you swing and flip with the grace of a trained dancer? Gwen asks. Can you close off your feelings so you don't get crippled by the moral ambiguity of your violent actions? Noir asked a much heavier question. Can you rewire a mainframe while getting shot at? Penny joins in. Can you float through the air when you smell a delicious pie? Spider Pig floats by, his snout sniffing the air. Can you be strong? Heroic? Disciplined? The more they spoke, the more Miles seemed to get overwhelmed by the entire situation. Unimpressed by his uncertainty, they continued to demand more from him. Show me some moxie, soldier. Noir exclaimed as they piled on even more challenges and expectations. Gwen stepped up, eyeing Miles seriously. Above all, no matter how many times you get hit, can you keep getting back up? She sends a kick to his stomach, knocking him to the ground. On the floor, Miles was met with a chorus of never-ending encouragement. Come on, Miles. You can do it. You can do this. Their words seemed to pile on top of him, refusing to allow him any breathing room. Guys, cool it. Ben spoke up, though his voice was drowned out among the chaos. With every word spoken, the intensity grew. Come on. You can do it. Get up, Miles. Come on, Miles. Get up. However, seeing that he couldn't get back up, the group began to voice their doubts once again. We need to be more honest with ourselves about this. He's not ready. It's obvious. There's no way. He's just a kid. If he can't do this, we have to stay and do it for him. As the conversation unfolded, Miles couldn't help but notice their discussion centered on him. Feeling extremely self-conscious, he unintentionally turned himself invisible and rushed out of the house, slamming doors shut on his way out. Minute earlier, Peter followed Aunt May out of the bustling living room, sensing the weight of grief that burdened her frail shoulders. He couldn't imagine the devastation of losing a nephew, someone who was like a son to her. 
As he stepped into a child's bedroom, he found Aunt May sitting on the twin bed, her trembling hands clutching a framed photograph of her Peter. The room was filled with remnants of his counterpart's early years. Posters of superheroes, model airplanes, and well-loved toys. Peter approached her quietly, his heart aching for her pain. He sat down on the edge of the bed, careful not to disturb her fragile state. Aunt May, Peter said softly, his voice laced with empathy. I know how much he meant to you. I can't even begin to imagine the pain you're feeling right now. Losing someone you love is, it must be the hardest thing in the world? Aunt May's tear-streaked face turned towards Peter, her eyes filled with sorrow and longing. She saw the reflection of her Peter in this unfamiliar features. Different, yet similar. Her heart ached, and she leaned into his presence, finding comfort in his words. He was my whole world, Aunt May whispered, her voice choked with grief. He was so young. I was the one who was supposed to go first. Not him. And now he's gone because of that monster, Wilson Fisk? Her voice grew heated as she spat his name. Peter's expression hardened at the mention of Fisk. He understood the anger and desire for vengeance that burned within Aunt May. Aunt May, Peter said, his voice tinged with determination. I want to ask you something. Do you want Kingpin dead, or do you want him brought to justice? I can arrange both, but I need to know what you want. Aunt May's eyes widened in surprise at the proposition, her gaze locked onto Peter's face. She saw a reflection of her Peter, but there was something different in his eyes. A ruthlessness that her Peter had never possessed. She would be lying if she said it didn't scare her, but a part of her found it oddly comforting as well. Her Peter would never purposefully kill anyone, but maybe, just maybe, he would still be alive right now if he did. Before Aunt May could respond, the sound of the front door being slammed shut reverberated through the house, interrupting their conversation. Peter's senses heightened, and he quickly stood up, his instincts kicking into overdrive. I'll be right back, Peter assured her. With a swift motion, he left the room, leaving Aunt May alone with her thoughts. She stared at the closed door, uncertainty and conflicting emotion swirling within her. Revenge or justice? The choice weighed heavily on her heart, and she knew she had to make a decision soon. Outside the room, Peter returned to the living room, his senses on high alert. He took in the scene before him, his newfound allies looking uneasy, their expressions clouded with guilt. The room felt heavy with the weight of their actions. What happened? Peter demanded, his voice firm. Gwen spoke up, her voice tinged with remorse. We. We pushed Miles too hard. We were testing him, but it might have been a bit overwhelming. He turned invisible and ran off. Peter's frustration flared, his tone turning stern. Are you kidding me? We're a team, for crying out loud. We should be supporting each other, not tearing each other down. Spider Pig interjected, his expression crestfallen. We didn't mean to dash Peter cut him off, his voice a mix of anger and concern. I don't care what you meant. We have a mission, and we can't do it without Miles. Ignoring any replies from the group, Peter turned and stormed out of the house, his senses honed in on any sign of Miles. After a moment, Peter's keen eyes caught a glimpse of movement in the distance. He swung toward it, following the trail until he landed on a rooftop. There, teetering near the edge, was Miles. He stood on the edge staring down at the city below, too scared to jump. Of course, he wasn't planning on killing himself. He wanted to prove everyone wrong and show that he could be Spider-Man too, but as soon as he looked down, Miles lost all confidence. Peter approached cautiously, taking a seat on the edge beside him. He spoke softly, his voice filled with reassurance. You want to talk about it? Miles turned to face Peter, his eyes puffy from tears and his expression a mix of vulnerability and determination. I thought I could handle it all, but I... I don't know if I'm ready. Peter nodded his head. That's normal. None of us knew if we were ready when we started. But we learned along the way. You're lucky, you know. Miles turned to him in disbelief. How? Peter patted the edge next to him, motioning for Miles to sit. Do you think we had a team of spider people hanging around when we started? You may be new to all of this, but you have us. We can help you. Miles looked up at Peter, searching his eyes for sincerity. Slowly, a small smile tugged at his lips. Thanks. Peter smiled back, a mix of relief and pride washing over him. You're part of our team, Miles. We're in this together. And we're going to stop Kingpin, save the multiverse, and get everyone home. But first, I think a training montage is in order. He declared as his hand met Miles' back. Hot, Miles grunted in shock as he was shoved over the edge. Miles felt the rush of wind against his face as he hurtled towards the ground. Panic gripped his heart, and his mind raced to remember what little Ben had taught him about swinging. He desperately flailed his arms, trying to activate the single web shooter on his right arm. Just as he was about to give in to his fear, a blur of red and blue shot towards him. Peter, his newest mentor and fellow Spider-Man, dove off the building as well. He was prepared to save him should he fail to swing on his own. But then something miraculous happened. Miles' web shooter fired, shooting out a strand of web that latched onto a nearby lamppost. The sudden jolt halted his fall, and he swung upward, leaving Peter behind for a moment. Miles spun around, his eyes wide with a mix of fear and exhilaration. I did it, he exclaimed, a nervous laugh escaping his lips. I actually did it. Peter caught up with him, swinging alongside him with a proud grin on his face. That's it, Miles. You've got the hang of it now. 
Just follow my lead. With newfound confidence, Miles focused on Peter's movements. He observed the way he angled his body, the timing of his swings, and the precise moment to release and shoot another web. It was like a dance, a symphony of acrobatics and agility. As they swung through the city, Peter led Miles on a makeshift obstacle course. They dove and weaved between buildings, utilizing signs, buildings, fire escapes, and other obstacles to hone Miles' skills. Each swing became more fluid and controlled, his fear melting away with each successful maneuver. Laughter bubbled up from Miles' chest as he soared through the air, adrenaline coursing through his veins. He was doing it. He was becoming Spider-Man. The weight of responsibility felt exhilarating rather than daunting. Peter's voice shouted back at him, guiding Miles through the course. You're doing great, Miles. Keep it up. We'll take a break soon, but for now, show me what you've got. With a renewed sense of determination, Miles pushed himself further. He twisted and turned, seamlessly transitioning between webs and obstacles. The city became his playground, his web-slinging skills growing with each passing moment. Time seemed to blur as they swung from one location to another, traversing the urban landscape with finesse. Miles was in awe of the freedom and power that came with being Spider-Man. The weight of his decision to take on this new responsibility felt much lighter now. As they swung side by side, Peter's voice echoed with pride. You're a natural, Miles. Miles grinned, his confidence growing by the second. Thanks, Peter. I won't let you down. I'll become the Spider-Man the city deserves. Together, they continued their exhilarating journey through the cityscape, swinging, diving, and weaving through the obstacles that stood in their way. With each obstacle overcome, Miles felt a surge of determination, knowing that he was one step closer to fulfilling his promise and stopping Kingpin. The training session had just begun, but Miles knew that he had the support and guidance of his fellow Spider-People. As he swung through the city, he couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement for what the future held. Soon enough, Peter landed on a tall building with a flat rooftop, waiting for Miles to follow his lead. Miles landed in front of Peter with a perfect superhero landing, crouching down on one knee and raising his other hand in the air triumphantly. Peter grinned and gave him a thumbs up. Not bad, kid, he said, his voice filled with approval. You're getting the hang of this hero stuff? Miles couldn't help but feel a surge of pride as he stood up straight, his chest puffed out. He had always dreamed of becoming a superhero, like all children who idolized Spider-Man, and now he was training with a seasoned veteran like Peter. Peter motioned for Miles to join him at the center of the rooftop. Okay, Miles, we've covered the basics of web-slinging, but being Spider-Man is more than just swinging through the city. It's about being prepared for anything. That includes hand-to-hand -hand combat. Miles nodded eagerly, ready to learn how to fight like a badass. Peter continued. As much as we rely on our powers, there will always be times when we can't rely on them alone. We have to know how to fight. And the best way to beat someone in a fight is simply by being better than them. Having strong superpowers was one thing, but there were others out there with powers of their own. Being able to hold his own in a fight would give Miles an edge. Miles listened attentively, his gaze fixed on Peter. He began to respect his new mentor's experience and knew he had a lot to learn from him. Peter stepped forward, adopting a fighting stance. Let's start with the basics. Remember, your spider senses will give you an advantage in combat. They'll help you anticipate your opponent's moves, so pay attention to your instincts. Miles did his best to mirror Peter's stance, feeling a mix of excitement and nerves. He had never been in a real fight before, aside from a few schoolyard conflicts that were more like hugging and rolling around on the floor. Peter swung a quick punch at Miles, who barely managed to dodge in time. Good reflexes. Now, try to counterattack. Miles attempted to throw a punch in return, but it was slow and uncoordinated. Peter easily evaded it and gently corrected his form. Remember, speed and accuracy are key. Try again. They continued the training session, with Peter patiently guiding Miles through various combinations of punches, kicks, and defensive maneuvers. At first, Miles struggled to keep up, but his enhanced physique and spider senses helped him adapt quickly. As time went on, Miles grew more confident in his movements. He started to anticipate Peter's attacks and respond with quicker, more precise strikes of his own. The sound of fists hitting the air and the occasional thud of a successful hit echoed across the rooftop. Peter nodded approvingly as Miles executed a series of well-timed punches. That's it, Miles. You're getting the hang of it. Remember, it's all about finding the right balance between offense and defense. Miles grinned, sweat dripping down his forehead. He could feel his muscles working and his heart pounding with exhilaration. This was a whole new level of training, and he relished the challenge. They continued their hand-to-hand -hand combat training, pushing Miles to the absolute limit. Peter would occasionally throw in a surprise move or feint, testing Miles' ability to react quickly. Each time, Miles relied on his spider senses to guide him, his body moving with an almost instinctual grace. As the sun started to set, casting a warm glow over the city, Peter called for a break. Miles collapsed to the ground, his chest heaving with exertion as he wiped the sweat from his brow. You're doing great, Miles, Peter said, a hint of pride in his voice. I'll make an Avenger out of you yet, Avenger? Miles asked curiously. What's that? As Peter saw the curiosity in Miles' eyes, he realized that there was something he had overlooked. 
In all the excitement, he hadn't properly introduced himself. You know, Miles, Peter began, his voice gentle yet filled with a weight of experience. I've been so caught up in everything that's happened that I forgot to give you a proper introduction. My apologies for that. Miles looked up at Peter, his eyes widening with anticipation, signaling his readiness to listen. I'm Peter Parker, as you've probably guessed, Peter said with a wave. I was the first official superhero in my world, but it didn't take long for other heroes and villains to start popping up. You see, in my universe, we have a whole range of extraordinary individuals, from metahumans to aliens. Peter paused for a moment, letting the weight of his words sink in. He continued, to protect our world from both foreign and domestic threats, I co-founded the Avengers, a hero organization that works tirelessly to maintain peace and security. We have a council, and I'm one of its members. Miles listened attentively, his eyes widening with each revelation. The name Avenger sparked recognition in his mind, realizing what Peter meant only moments ago. But that's not all, Peter added, a glimmer of pride in his voice. In addition to being Spider-Man, I've also studied under the Sorcerer Supreme of Kamartage, mastering the mystic arts. It's given me an understanding of magic and the ability to tap into its power. As he says this, Peter waves his hand and bends the horizon out in front of them, distorting it in odd waves. Though no one else seemed to notice but them. Miles couldn't hide his astonishment. The pieces were slowly coming together, revealing the vastness of Peter's abilities. You're the one who made that portal? He asked in awe. Peter nodded his head. Yeah, cool right? It's one of the many perks that come with being a sorcerer. Miles' jaw dropped, unable to process the sheer magnitude of Peter's abilities. Unbeknownst to them, the other spider people had arrived while they were engrossed in their conversation, and they had watched and heard everything. Each of them stood there, their eyes wide with astonishment and disbelief. Ben was the first to break the silence, his voice tinged with a mix of awe and humor. Well, ain't that a kicker? We got ourselves a web sling and sorcerer here. I didn't see that one coming. Spider Pig blinked his large eyes and squealed in disbelief. Whoa, how did he do that? He gestures to the horizon, which was now back to normal. Noir adjusted his fedora and rubbed his chin thoughtfully. I've seen my fair share of weirdness, but this takes the cake. Sorcery and spandex, a peculiar combination indeed. He commented between drags of his cigarette. Painey looked down from atop from her mechanical companion and scratched her head, a mix of curiosity and admiration in her eyes. Wow, you never mentioned that you had such mystical abilities. This changes everything. With his magical abilities, their plans would have to change. Though it would be for the better. Peter and Miles stood across from the group of spider people on the rooftop, the weight of their gazes heavy upon them. Peter cleared his throat, breaking the silence. All right, everyone, Peter began, his voice filled with determination. I know you've all had your doubts about Miles joining us, but I believe he's proven himself today. So, here's what we're going to do. I want each of you to raise your hands if you still think Miles shouldn't be involved. One by one, the spider people slowly raised their hands, their expressions a mix of hesitance and guilt. Gwen and Ben were the last to reluctantly raise their hands, their eyes filled with empathy for Miles. Of course, they didn't see the training that Peter put him through, so a demonstration would be needed. Peter nodded, his gaze shifting from one person to another. All right, fair enough. But before we make a final decision, let's settle this with a little wager. I propose a challenge. You can choose a champion between all of you, someone to face Miles in a fight. If Miles wins, he becomes part of the team. But if he loses, he'll stay behind when we go to stop Kingpin. Miles looked at Peter in surprise and fear, not at all confident in his abilities, which had only been properly honed for a single day. But Peter smiled and rested a comforting hand on his shoulder, assuring him silently. The group of spider people exchanged glances, considering Peter's offer. After a moment, Noir stepped forward, his voice filled with conviction. I'll be our champion. I've got the most experience here, and Ben's a bit out of shape. Ben patted his stomach with a sheepish look. This is muscle. I swear. Peter pulled Miles to the side, speaking in a low voice. Miles, listen carefully. During the fight, just trust me. I'll make it so only you can hear me. If I call out a body part or instruction, react and strike as quickly as possible. I'll guide you through this. Miles looked up at Peter, uncertainty etched on his face. But what if I mess up? What if I'm not good enough? Peter smiled reassuringly. You've come this far, Miles. I've seen what you can do, and I believe in you. Just trust yourself and trust me. We'll get through this together. Miles nodded, a mix of determination and nervousness in his eyes. He would put his faith in Peter and give it his all. With the terms of the challenge agreed upon, Noir and Miles stood across from each other, the tension palpable in the air. Peter waved his hand and formed a spell circle, which sunk into the ground, creating a small rooftop arena for the impending fight. Everyone stared between Peter and the arena in shock, still new to the idea of magic. Inside the arena, Noir cracked his knuckles and adjusted his hat, his eyes fixed on Miles. You ready, kid? Miles took a deep breath, his voice steady as he replied, as ready as I'll ever be. Peter stood at the edge of the makeshift arena, his voice projecting clearly for all to hear. Ladies and gentle spiders. It's time for our main event of the evening. 
In this corner, we have the seasoned hero from the shadows, the master of mystery and danger, Noir. Peter gestured to Noir as everyone stared at him in exasperation. Peter ignored their stares and continued, motioning to Miles this time. And in the opposite corner, the young and fearless newcomer, ready to prove himself to all Spiderlings in attendance, Miles, the amazing Spider-Man. With the introductions finished, Peter walks out into the center of the ring, a conjured black and while referee shirt appearing over his suit. A slash N, he's using magic, not the reality stone. Standing between the two competitors, Peter says a few words. Before we begin, I want to remind both competitors to fight fairly and within the rules. I will be closely observing the match to ensure a fair contest, stepping in only when necessary. Now, touch gloves, take your positions, and may the best Spider-Man prevail. He steps back as the sound of a bell being struck fills the air, starting the fight. Instantly, the fight between Miles and Noir commenced. The two Spider-Men locked eyes, their determination etched on their faces. Noir made the first move, lunging forward with incredible speed and precision. Miles, still grappling with his nerves, barely managed to react in time. He attempted to dodge Noir's strike, but his inexperience betrayed him as he stumbled backward, narrowly avoiding a devastating blow. The crowd of spider people watched with bated breath, their hopes resting on the young hero. Peter, taking his role as referee seriously, observed the fight with intense focus. He could see Miles struggling to find his footing, his movements hesitant and unrefined. He knew it was crucial for Miles to gain confidence quickly if he had any chance of matching Noir's expertise. Noir, capitalizing on Miles' momentary falter, launched a series of lightning-fast punches and kicks. His strikes were precise, calculated, and designed to exploit any weaknesses in his opponent's defense. Miles, relying on his instinct and the limited training he had received, did his best to evade and block the onslaught. The sound of blows landing filled the air as the fight continued. Miles fought with determination, his eyes never leaving Noir, searching for an opening. He swung his fists and kicked with all his might, but each attack was deftly parried or dodged by the seasoned Noir. Peter, watching from the sidelines, noticed an opportunity. He called out, his voice magically projecting straight to Miles. Left leg. Miles trusted Peter's guidance and swept his leg low, aiming to trip Noir off balance. However, he didn't react quick enough and Noir managed to effortlessly jump over Miles' leg, landing behind him. Before Miles could react, Noir delivered a swift strike to his back, sending him sprawling to the ground. The crowd gasped in shock as Miles hit the ground, his body trembling with pain and fatigue. Noir, with a hint of sympathy in his eyes, approached the fallen kid. You've got heart, but you're still green, he remarked, his voice laced with understanding. You're not quite ready for this fight. Miles, fighting through the pain, pushed himself up from the ground. He looked up at Noir with determination shining in his eyes. I won't give up, he declared, his voice filled with newfound resolve. I can do this. Peter's heart swelled with pride as he saw the transformation taking place within Miles. He knew that this fight, even if Miles didn't emerge victorious, was crucial in shaping him into the hero he was destined to become. Noir, impressed by Miles' determination, nodded and prepared to continue the fight. He respected the young hero's spirit at the very least. Miles wiped the blood from his lip and took a deep breath, his gaze never leaving Noir. He could feel the pain throbbing through his body, but his determination burned brighter than ever. This time, he wouldn't let his nerves get the best of him. He trusted Peter's guidance and hoped that with each move called out, he could turn the tide. Noir prepared for another attack. He lunged forward, his fists flying towards Miles with precision. But this time, Miles was ready. Peter, acting as the referee, observed the fight with laser-like focus. He called out, Miles, down. Uppercut. In that split second, Miles ducked, narrowly avoiding Noir's punch, and struck back with a swift uppercut. The blow connected with precision, sending Noir staggering backward. The crowd of spider people erupted in cheers and applause, their faith in Miles growing with each successful move. They watched with awe as he started to gain confidence and find his rhythm. Peter's voice appeared again, left leg. Miles planted his left foot firmly on the ground and swung his right leg in a wide arc, aiming for Noir's leg. With agility and speed that contradicted his inexperience, Miles connected with a powerful kick, knocking Noir off balance. Noir grunted in surprise, his eyes narrowing. He hadn't expected this level of skill and precision from the young hero. But he wouldn't back down either. He quickly regained his footing and launched a counterattack. Peter, ever watchful, called out, Miles, web his arm. Miles reacted swiftly, his web shooter releasing a thin strand of webbing that caught Noir's arm mid-punch. The web tightened, restraining Noir's movement and leaving him vulnerable. With a burst of adrenaline, Miles seized the opportunity. He spun around, delivering a spinning kick that connected with Noir's chest, sending him crashing to the ground. The spectators roared with excitement, their cheers echoing through the arena. Miles stood tall, a mixture of exhaustion and triumph in his eyes. Noir, lying on the ground, looked up at Miles with a mixture of admiration and pride. All right, I admit defeat. You've got some serious potential, kid he admitted, a hint of a smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. Consider me impressed? Miles offered a hand to help Noir up. Thank you. 
As Noir took Miles' hand and stood up, the rest of the spider team joined them in the center of the arena, their expressions filled with newfound respect and acceptance. Gwen stepped forward, a smile gracing her face. Welcome to the team, Miles, she said, extending her hand. You've earned it. Miles beamed, shaking Gwen's hand. The weight of his doubts and insecurities had lifted, replaced by a newfound sense of belonging. Peter approached Miles, a proud smile on his face. See? I told you. You've got what it takes. Miles nodded, a surge of determination coursing through his veins. With the support of his new team and Peter's guidance, he was ready for any challenge that came his way. After Miles proved himself and joined the team, everyone gathered in the spider cave, their determined expressions illuminated by the glow of computer screens and flickering monitors. They knew that time was running out, and they needed to finalize their plan to stop Kingpin and his destructive super collider. Peter took the lead, standing at the center of the room. All right, team, he began, his voice steady and authoritative. We know that Kingpin Super Collider is the key to sending us all back to our respective universes. Painey, how are we looking with Dr. Octavius's computer? Painey, immersed in her work, looked up briefly and nodded. I've managed to extract the data we need. The blueprints and coding for the Super Collider, security protocols, and just about everything we need to shut it down. It's all here. She gestured to the computer in front of her, the screen displaying complex algorithms and schematics. Gwen leaned in closer, her eyes scanning the information on the screen. Good work, Painey. We'll need to study those blueprints and identify any potential vulnerabilities. If for some reason we can't shut it down as planned, then sabotaging the super collider will have to be the backup plan. Noir, leaning against a wall with his fedora tilted over his eyes, chimed in with his usual dry tone. And what about the big guy himself? How do we plan to take him down? Peter nodded, acknowledging the valid concern. You guys can leave Kingpin to me. Since Ben and Miles' little heist at Alchemax, I wouldn't put it past Fisk to hire some more muscle so you guys can focus on Dr. Octavius and whoever else shows up. Ben nodded his head. Sounds good to me. Nobody voiced any disagreement with his rather simple plan. All right, then I guess we have a game plan. Peter smirked as he turned to Painey. Painey, get to working on that override key. We need it done by tomorrow. Aye, Captain. She salutes Peter before returning to work, her robot companion hovering over her. Miles, still riding the high of his recent victory, spoke up. What about me? How can I help? Peter turned to Miles. There's nothing for you to do today, Miles, so head home and get some sleep. Tomorrow, you'll fight Kingpin's minions with the rest of the team. And if everything goes according to plan, you'll send us all home? Miles nodded, determination burning in his eyes. I won't let you down, Peter. I'll do whatever it takes. Peter placed a hand on Miles' shoulder, his voice filled with conviction. I know you will, Miles. I have complete faith in you. Now head home and get some rest. We have a busy day tomorrow. After being shooed away, Miles said his goodbyes and ran off, returning to his dorm room for the night. Peter stepped out of the spider cave, thinking of a few things that needed to be done before tomorrow. As he made his way back into the dimly lit house, he found himself standing outside the door of his deceased counterpart's childhood bedroom. Taking a deep breath, he pushed the door open and entered. Inside, he found Aunt May still sitting on the edge of the bed, her eyes fixed on a framed photograph of her late Peter. Her face held a mixture of grief and determination, her resolve evident even in the midst of her pain. She glanced up as Peter entered, a flicker of sadness in her eyes before a small smile tugged at her lips. I'm back, Peter said softly, his voice filled with understanding. He had left May with a choice earlier, and now it was time for her to give an answer. Aunt May set the photograph aside and stood up, facing Peter with a resolute expression. I've made my decision, she declared, her voice steady. I've thought long and hard about what you asked me earlier. Kingpin needs to pay for what he's done. I want vengeance for my Peter, for all the pain he caused. Peter's heart sank a little, knowing the weight of the choice she had made. But he also understood the depths of her grief and anger. He nodded, his voice filled with a quiet determination. If that's what you want, Aunt May, then I'll help you. We'll make him pay. Aunt May's eyes shone with a mix of gratitude and sadness. She reached out, placing a hand on Peter's cheek. Thank you, Peter, she whispered. I know it's a heavy burden to bear, but we can't let him get away with what he's done. We have to make sure that no one else loses someone they love to that maniac. Peter's gaze locked with Aunt May's, a shared understanding passing between them. He knew the path they were about to take was a dark one, but sometimes, darkness was the only way to bring about justice. We'll make sure Kingpin never hurts anyone again, he vowed, his voice unwavering. Now, why don't you go and get some rest? Aunt May squeezed Peter's hand before returning to the twin-sized bed. I'll get some sleep soon. I just want to stay here a bit longer. As Peter stepped out of the bedroom, his mind filled with the weight of Aunt May's decision, he found Noir leaning against the wall in the hallway. The detective Spider-Man had heard everything and wore a thoughtful expression. Noir pushed himself off the wall and approached Peter, his fedora casting a shadow over his eyes. Quite a heavy burden she's taken on. He remarked, his voice low and gravelly. Peter nodded, acknowledging the gravity of the situation. I know it's not an easy choice, but she's made up her mind. She wants vengeance. 
Noir's gaze met Peter's, his eyes searching for understanding. I get it, I do. But you can't let her be the one to pull the trigger. She shouldn't have to bear that weight. It'll haunt her. Peter's expression softened as he considered Noir's words. He understood the detective's concern for Aunt May's well-being. You're right, Noir. I don't want her to carry that burden. I'll make sure she's not involved in the final act. Noir's shoulders visibly relaxed, a sense of relief washing over him. Good, he replied, his voice filled with a mix of gratitude and determination. And don't worry. I won't tell the others about this. They wouldn't agree with taking a life. They're young and naive. It's better this way. Peter nodded in agreement. I appreciate that, Noir. Aunt May deserves some semblance of peace. A faint smile tugged at the corner of Noir's lips, acknowledging the agreement between them. We'll take him down. We'll make sure justice is served. And I promise, your secret is safe with me. As the situation settled between them, Peter couldn't help but feel a sense of connection with Noir. He had always considered himself to be a hero who didn't mind killing, and it seems that he's met a kindred spirit. You're not the only one with a dark past, Peter, Noir said, his voice carrying a hint of regret. I've got a few bodies under me too. But we can't let that define us. We have to make sure we do what's right, even if that means getting our hands dirty. Peter looked at Noir, a mixture of understanding and empathy in his eyes. I couldn't agree more. With a solemn nod, the two Spider-Men parted ways, knowing that the path they were about to take was a difficult one. They each carried the weight of their choices, their shared understanding binding them together in the pursuit of justice, even in the face of darkness. Later that night, Peter made his way back to the spider cave. As the elevator descended, he was greeted by a sight that filled him with relief. The team, exhausted from their preparations, lay sprawled across various surfaces of the spider cave. Gwen was curled up in a corner, her head resting against a pile of web shooters. Penny and her robot companion were huddled together, their heads tilted to the side in slumber. Ben, with his suit partially unzipped, snored softly in a makeshift hammock alongside Spider-Pig, who was spooning his head. The only one missing was Noir, who seemed to disappear after their talk earlier. Peter's gaze shifted to the computer where Dr. Octavius's data was stored. It was located on the workbench, tempting him with its secrets. He knew that the plans for the Super Collider could grant him multiverse travel, and he couldn't afford to leave them behind. Silently, he crept across the room, his footsteps barely making a sound. He approached the computer, his spider senses on high alert. With practiced ease, he accessed the hard drive and carefully detached it from the computer. Holding the drive in his gloved hand, Peter tucked it away inside his suit, ensuring its safety. He knew he had to study its contents thoroughly when he returned to his own universe. His eyes flickered to the slumbering members of his new team, their trust and faith in him unwavering. Peter couldn't help but feel a pang of guilt for keeping the secret from them. But that guilt soon faded away, never to be seen or felt again. After all, this was multiverse travel. He could easily make it up to them when he visits their universes one by one. Taking one last glance at the sleeping heroes, Peter made his way out of the spider cave, leaving them undisturbed. With resolve burning in his veins, he disappeared into the distance, leaving behind a quiet spider cave and a team of heroes unaware of the secret he carried with him. Peter stood in Aunt May's bedroom, the soft glow from the windows casting a gentle light on her sleeping form. He hesitated, contemplating whether to wake her up or leave her to her much-needed rest. Memories of his conversation with Noir echoed in his mind, reminding him of his agreement. Finally, he made his decision. He couldn't bring himself to disturb her peace, not when she had already endured so much. Instead, he quietly turned away and stepped out of the room, careful not to make a sound that would disturb her slumber. As he walked down the hallway, his footsteps echoed softly against the wooden floor. He knew deep down that keeping Aunt May out of Fisk's killing was the right choice. It was a dark path, one that would only lead to more pain and regret for a normal person like her. Especially at her age. Either way, Fisk wouldn't live past the night. Returning to the spider cave, Peter entered the dimly lit room to find his team in various states of slumber. They lay sprawled across the surfaces, their exhausted bodies seeking solace in sleep. Just as he was about to approach and wake them, their bodies twitched and distorted, their faces contorting in discomfort. Peter watched as they groaned in frustration, the glitches manifesting in visible ways. It was a reminder of their outsider status in this universe, a constant struggle to exist. And just as quickly as the glitches had appeared, they vanished, leaving the team in their normal forms once again. Confusion and annoyance clouded their sleepy expressions, their shared experience unsettling as always. As the team began to process what had just happened, Gwen spoke up, her voice laced with curiosity. Peter, why didn't you glitch like the rest of us? You're not from this universe either. Peter shrugged, a slight smile playing at his lips. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe it's because I've traveled to other universes before, or maybe it's because I dabble in the mystic arts. Whatever the reason, I've never felt any rejection from this universe. His answer sparked a momentary silence as the team absorbed the information. Their gaze shifted from Peter to one another, silently acknowledging the depth of their shared experiences. Although he didn't say it, Peter thought of one more possibility. Maybe it's because I have the reality stone in me? Though I can't use it here. 
As everyone was staring at Peter in jealousy, suddenly, the elevator came alive, sliding down with a mechanical hum. Peter turned his attention toward the sound, and a smile tugged at the corners of his mouth as he saw Miles stepping out, clad in his loose Spider-Man Halloween costume. Miles, Peter called out, his voice filled with warmth and familiarity. Nice of you to join the party. You're just in time. Just then, Peter's attention turned a nearby table, where he had stashed a wrapped gift for Miles. It was a small token of his appreciation for his latest student's progress. Peter picked up the gift, a glimmer of anticipation in his eyes. Miles, he called, motioning for him to come closer. I managed to finish this about an hour ago. Miles eagerly approached, his eyes shining with curiosity. With excitement, he ripped open the gift to reveal a sleek black and red spider suit, complete with slim built-in web shooters. Instantly, the room filled with gasps of awe and admiration. But as soon as Miles touched the suit, it disappeared from his hands, leaving him and the others startled. Confusion replaced the excitement, and Miles looked at Peter with a mixture of disbelief and curiosity. WH where did it go? Peter chuckled, a mischievous glint in his eyes. Think about putting on the suit, Miles. With a hopeful expression, Miles closed his eyes and focused. In an instant, his shabby Halloween costume vanished, replaced by a perfect black and red spider suit. The room erupted in astonishment, the team gathering around Miles to admire his new attire. To further indulge in the moment, Peter snapped his fingers, conjuring a mirror so that Miles could fully admire his work. Insert picture of Miles' Spider-Man suit here, Peter took a deep breath, preparing to explain the enchantments he had added to Miles' new suit. He cleared his throat and looked at the expectant faces of his teammates. All right, here's the deal, he began, his voice steady. The suit I made for you, Miles, doesn't have all the bells and whistles that mine has, but it has some pretty cool features. First, it's bullet resistant. Here, let me show you. Peter conjured a small caliber pistol and aimed it at Miles. The others gasped, their eyes widening in shock. Without hesitation, Peter squeezed the trigger, emptying the entire magazine into Miles. The room fell into silence as they waited for the aftermath. But to their amazement, Miles stood unscathed, his suit intact. Slowly, he looked down at himself, a mixture of relief and disbelief washing over his face. Whoa, I'm okay. It's really bulletproof. Peter nodded, a satisfied smile on his face. Sort of. It can withstand small caliber bullets, like the ones from that gun. But anything bigger, like .44 Magnum, and there's a good chance it could breach the suit. So be careful out there. Don't get complacent. The team exchanged glances, a combination of awe and envy evident on their faces. Each of them wondered whether they should ask for a suit of their own as well. Peter continued, knowing Miles was hungry for more information. Next, the suit is temperature resistant. It can help regulate your body heat, keeping you comfortable in extreme cold or hot environments. It even has some fire-resistant properties, so it can handle a little fire if necessary. As he spoke, Peter conjured a pool of flames under Miles' feet. The flame danced across his legs but left no trace, extinguishing itself without causing any damage. The room erupted in murmurs of astonishment, the team realizing the true extent of the suit's capabilities. And lastly, Peter continued. It's self-cleaning and self-repairing. It will never get dirty or develop any unpleasant odors. And should it rip or tear, it can fix itself back to pristine condition over a short period of time. The other spider people stared at Miles' suit with a mix of admiration and envy. They couldn't help but feel a twinge of jealousy, seeing the incredible features it possessed. Peter's expertise and craftsmanship were evident in every stitch and enchantment. Suddenly, Peter remembered something. Oh, and the web shooters have infinite fluid inside, so you'll never have to refill them. Gwen's eyes narrowed slightly, a playful smirk forming on her lips. Well, aren't you lucky, Miles? Looks like you hit the jackpot. She couldn't hold back the small bit of jealousy hidden in her voice. Miles nodded, a sheepish grin spreading across his face. I can't believe it. This is, amazing. Thank you, Peter. Seriously, thank you. Peter patted Miles' shoulder. You earned it, Miles. You've come a long way in a very short time, and I have no doubt you'll make the suit proud. The team stood in awe of Miles' new spider suit, their eyes filled with longing and envy. They couldn't help but imagine themselves donning a suit with similar incredible features. It was as if the possibilities were endless, and Peter's craftsmanship had elevated their expectations. However, reality quickly set in when Peter's attention turned to Painy, who was also gawking at Miles' suit. Painy, I need the override key. Painy's eyes widening with surprise. The override key? Uh, yeah. I finished it last night. She reached into her pocket, retrieving a small flash drive and held it out to Peter. Here. Without another word, Peter took the drive and handed it toward Miles, who took a step forward, his eyes fixed on the flash drive as if it held the weight of the world. Miles hesitated, his voice filled with uncertainty. Are you sure about this? I mean, what if I mess up? Peter placed a reassuring hand on Miles' shoulder, offering a comforting smile. Miles, I don't trust anyone more than you to send me home. I believe in you. So believe in yourself. The room fell into a hushed silence as the team surrounded Miles, their expressions filled with encouragement and support. Their longing for a suit like Miles momentarily forgotten as they rallied behind their young teammate. 
Gwen stepped forward, her voice gentle yet firm. Miles, you can do this. We've seen what you're capable of. Trust yourself, just like we trust you. Ben chimed in, his voice gruff but kind. Yeah, kid. You got the potential to be the best of us. Don't doubt yourself. Spider Pig added his own words of encouragement, his voice filled with enthusiasm. You've got this. Show him what you're made of. Even Noir stepped up, appearing from the shadows. Don't doubt yourself, kid. Miles glanced around at his supportive teammates, their unwavering faith in him giving him the strength he needed. He took a deep breath and reached out, accepting the flash drive from Peter's hand. All right, he said, clutching the drive carefully. I'll do it. I'll send you all back. Peter nodded, his eyes filled with gratitude and trust. Good, now for some more gifts, he said, surprising everyone. Under everyone's watchful eyes, Peter pulls out a set of sleek smartphones, their screens reflecting the dim light of the spider cave. Peter handed them out, one by one, to Noir, Spider Pig, Miles, Gwen, Ben, and Penny. Each of them eagerly accepted the device, their eyes filled with curiosity and anticipation. These phones are connected through a special enchantment, Peter explained, his voice steady. They should allow us to communicate even after we return to our own universes. Noir raised an eyebrow, his expression a mix of skepticism and intrigue. Communicate across the multiverse? That's quite the bit of magic. Peter shrugged, a carefree look in his eyes. Eh, it wasn't as complicated as you'd think. He motioned for everyone to unlock their phones and find the app titled mChat. Multiverse chat, as they tapped their way through the screens and located the app, their excitement grew. Peter's magic had proven to be very impressive thus far, and they were eager to see what else he had in store. Once the app was open, they were greeted with a simple text-based chat room, similar to Discord. Each phone displayed a similar interface, with a blank message box. As they were staring, Peter typed a quick message, which popped up on each screen. Ski Shooter 69420XD, yo waving hand. The team members looked at their screens, their expressions shifting between surprise and amusement. The choice of chat name elicited a mix of chuckles and groans, but they couldn't deny the brilliance of Peter's plan. Ben, ever the curious one, voiced the question that was on everyone's mind. Where did you get these phones? I mean, they have to be at least $800 a piece. You should be as broke as the rest of us in this universe. Peter shrugged nonchalantly, a sheepish grin tugging at his lips. Well, uh, I may have acquired them through, unconventional means. Let's just say a small portal opened up in an apple factory in China. Although that got him a couple disapproving looks, most didn't seem to care about his crime. Even Spider Pig let out a snort of laughter. Peter winked, his eyes gleaming with mischief. But hey, they're for a good cause. Now we can stay in touch once this is all over. Gwen chimed in, a smile playing on her lips. It's pretty amazing, Peter. Thank you for thinking of this. It's like having our own spider support line. Miles smiled in relief as threw a few glances at Gwen while she wasn't looking. Yeah, this is incredible. Thank you. Peter smirked, noticing his student's odd behavior. I'm happy to help he winked at Miles as he motioned to Gwen, knowing exactly why Miles was so thankful. Instantly, Miles started flailing, motioning for Peter to stop before Gwen noticed anything. After teasing Miles for a bit, Peter made his way back to Aunt May's bedroom, his heart heavy with the weight of his impending departure. The soft glow of the setting sun bathed the room in a warm, orange hue, casting a gentle light on Aunt May's peaceful form as she lay in bed. He stood by her bedside, gazing at her sleeping face, contemplating the words he needed to say. Memories of their short time together and the love she had shown him flooded his mind, bringing a bittersweet smile to his lips. With a heavy sigh, he reached for a pen and a piece of paper on the nightstand. He knew this was the right thing to do, but it didn't make it any easier. Gently, he began to write, pouring everything he wanted to say onto the page in carefully chosen words. As he finished the letter, Peter carefully folded the paper and placed it on Aunt May's nightstand, right beside her. He leaned down, pressing a gentle kiss on her forehead. Goodbye, Aunt May, he whispered, his voice filled with a mix of sadness and determination. And just as he left the room, Aunt May stirring in her sleep. Her eyes fluttered open, revealing a mixture of sadness and relief after a good rest. It didn't take her long to find the folded piece of paper on her nightstand. She reached for the letter, her hands trembling, and unfolded it. As she read each word, her eyes filled with tears, and her lips quivered with emotion. Dear Aunt May, by the time you read this, I'll be long gone, back to my own universe. I'm sorry for leaving without saying goodbye in person, but I couldn't bring myself to wake you. You deserve the rest, especially after everything you've been through. I know that you're hurting. Losing your child is a pain I can't even begin to imagine. And I promise you, Aunt May, I won't let his death go unanswered. I will avenge him, for you, and for everyone who cared for him. But I want to ask something of you in return. I want you to be there for Miles. He's just a kid and he needs guidance and support. You have shown me so much love and kindness, and I know you can do the same for him. Help him become the hero he's destined to be, just like you did for your Peter. I hope that by forging a bond with Miles, you can find some solace and purpose in your life. Losing your Peter is unimaginable, but I believe that you have the strength to continue living and to find joy again. You deserve that, Aunt May. You deserve to be happy. Please take care of yourself, and look after Miles. 
He may stumble and make mistakes, but with your guidance, I know he'll grow into an amazing Spider-Man. Thank you, Aunt May, for everything. Your counterpart has been a mother to me when I needed one the most, just as I'm sure you were to your Peter as well, and I think I can speak for us both when I say we will be forever grateful. With all my love, Peter, the weight of Peter's words hit her with full force, and she clutched the letter to her chest, her shoulders shaking with silent sobs. Peter and the team of spider people emerged from a golden portal, stepping into an empty hallway in the subfloors of Fisk Tower. The air felt heavy with anticipation as they made their way down the corridor, their footsteps echoing in the silence. All right, team, Peter said, his voice filled with determination. We're getting closer. Stay focused. The group moved with purpose, their eyes scanning the surroundings for any signs of trouble. As they approached a door, Peter reached out and turned the handle, pushing it open slowly. The sight that greeted them took their breath away. They stepped onto a balcony of a massive white spherical room, as large as a sports stadium, with two enormous lasers pointed at each other. The room hummed with a low, steady energy, the air charged with anticipation. Whoa, Ben exclaimed, his eyes widening at the sight before him. This place is huge. Noir, his voice filled with a hint of cynicism, surveyed the room. This is the heart of Fisk's operation. Painey, her robotic companion by her side, analyzed the situation. I'm detecting a strong power source from the lasers. Peter glanced at his team, his mind racing for a plan. We need to either wait until the collider is activated or activated ourselves dash, just as Peter said this, the lasers began to hum and brighten, preparing to fire. Second earlier, Kingpin strode into the collider's control room, his imposing figure casting a shadow over the room. Olivia Octavius, the Prowler, and Tombstone followed closely behind, their eyes filled with a mix of loyalty and fear. Tombstone, an imposing figure with gray skin and a sharp flat-top haircut, stood at Kingpin's side. His white hair added to his formidable presence, and his suit exuded a sense of power and authority. Insert picture of Tombstone here, the Prowler, a figure shrouded in mystery and danger, walked with an air of stealth and malevolence. Clad in a sleek, form-fitting purple suit, every inch of his body concealed, he seemed to blend seamlessly with the darkness that surrounded him. Insert picture of the Prowler here, eyeing the many scientists and technicians in the room, Kingpin's deep voice commanded attention. Begin the sequence. Instantly, a flurry of activity erupted among the room, each person diligently working to boot up the collider. Buttons were pressed, switches were flipped, and the room buzzed with the energy of impending chaos. And amidst this chaos, Fisk and his goons gazed out of the control room window, catching a glimpse of an unwelcome group of intruders across the way. Kill em. Fisk commands mercilessly as his three lackeys rush off to the get the job done. Peter and the team stood in awe as the two lasers fired, their beams colliding at the center of the spherical room in a dazzling display of multicolored light. The energy crackled and danced, filling the air with an otherworldly hum. The entire building seemed to glitch, the walls flickering and distorting as universes collided. Cars, buildings, and other constructs began to emerge from the collider's beam, torn from their original universe. The team members felt a strange sensation wash over them, a temporary disruption of their own realities. Spider-Pig, his cartoonish features warping and stretching, let out a startled oink. Whoa, this is trippy. Gwen, her voice filled with concern, glanced at her hands as they momentarily faded in and out. Is everyone okay? Peter clenched his fists, his gaze fixed on the colliding beams of energy. He could sense the immense power being unleashed, the potential to reshape reality itself. Noir adjusted his fedora, his voice laced with determination. We need to shut this thing down before it tears apart every universe. Painey nodded, her robotic companion beeping in agreement. We need to find where to insert the override key. Miles, his eyes wide with both excitement and fear, gripped the flash drive in his hand, frantically looking around the room for some sort of control panel. Peter's eyes narrowed as he spotted the control panel on the far side of the collider, embedded in the wall, pointing it out to the others. He knew they had to act quickly before any permanent damage is done. But their path was quickly blocked as three figures emerged from the shadows, their presence unmistakable. Where do you think you're going? A shrill feminine voice asked playfully. Olivia Octavius, her mechanical tentacles whirring with anticipation, advanced with calculated steps. She lashed out with her appendages, sending a flurry of metal towards Ben, Spider-Pig, and Noir. Ben stumbled backward, barely managing to evade the attacks, while Noir and Spider-Pig deftly weaved through the barrage with impeccable reflexes. The Prowler, his eyes glowing with a predatory intensity, lunged forward with remarkable speed. His movements were agile and deadly as he swung his weapon towards Miles. But thanks to his training, Miles managed to dodge, narrowly avoiding the lethal strike. Tombstone, his imposing frame radiating strength, drew two pitch-black desert eagles, which seemed small in his massive fists. Rapidly pulling the triggers, he shot straight at Gwen, who instantly rolled out of the way, returning fire with her web soon after. Gwen strained to hold her ground as Painey came to assist her, determination shining in her eyes. As the team fought their respective adversaries, Peter's gaze shifted towards Miles, who frantically dodged his opponent in fear. Peter knew he had to take charge. Focus. Peter called out, his voice cutting through the chaos. Remember what I taught you. 
Fight smart. Miles nodded, snapping out of his momentary hesitation. With newfound confidence, he swung into action. His spider sense tingled as he expertly maneuvered through the battlefield, delivering swift strikes against the Prowler. As the fight raged on, Peter's mind raced with a plan. He needed to reach Kingpin, the man responsible for all of this, before he could escape or cause any more harm. You guys can handle this, Peter said to his team, his voice radiating a calmness that none of them currently had. I'll find Kingpin and deal with him. But remember, don't shut down the Collider until we're all back in our universes. His team nodded in understanding, their determination etched on their faces. Peter rushed away, his web slinging him across the room, towards the control room where Kingpin awaited. Peter stepped into the Collider's control room, his eyes scanning the scene before him. Kingpin stood near the window, his massive figure casting a dark shadow over the room. The sound of the ongoing battles outside echoed through the walls, filling the space with a tense energy. Kingpin turned, his menacing gaze fixed on Peter. A sinister smile crept across his face. Ah, Spider-Man. I've been expecting one of you to show up. How touching that you've brought a little team with you. Peter maintained a confident stance. Well, us Spider-Folk are like a Hydra. Cut one head and more will rise to take its place. He quoted an evil Nazi organization. Kingpin's face hardened, his fists gripped so tightly that his knuckles cracked. Oh, I'll be sure to take pleasure in killing as many of you as I can. The scientists and technicians in the room huddled behind their desks, fear and anticipation etched on their faces. They knew that a clash between these two powerful forces was about to unfold. Kingpin's muscles tensed as he prepared for the confrontation. You ready time die? He asked as he stomped over, winding up one of his fists. Peter's gaze narrowed, his spider sense tingling as he sensed the imminent danger. With lightning-fast reflexes, he caught Kingpin's incoming punch with a single hand, halting the villain's momentum with ease. The room fell silent, everyone's eyes locked on the unexpected turn of events. A mix of shock and disbelief washed over Kingpin's face as he strained against Peter's hold. How, how is this possible? Peter smirked, a glint of mischief in his eyes. I'm a bit different from the average Spider-Man. In a swift motion, Peter released his grip on Kingpin's fist and delivered a powerful palm with his free hand, striking the crime lord squarely in the stomach. The force of the blow sent Kingpin hurtling backward, crashing through the window as he spit blood from his mouth. Glass shattered, raining down below as Kingpin plummeted into one of the many floating buildings, which was brought over by the Collider's activation. The room erupted with gasps and murmurs as the scientists and technicians peered out the broken window, witnessing the dramatic turn of events. Peter stood tall, his eyes showing a bored look. How the hell did this universe's Peter lose to such a weakling? He muttered as Kingpin shakily picked himself up. Well, at least he can take a punch. As her mechanical tentacles whirred with deadly precision, Olivia Octavius moved with an uncanny grace whilst facing off against Ben, Spider-Pig, and Noir. Her four mechanical appendages moved in sync, their razor-sharp ends ready to strike. Belly jiggling with each nimble movement, Ben dodged one of the tentacles with surprising agility. He lunged forward, delivering a powerful punch to one of the tentacles. Spider-Pig, his cartoonish features stretching with determination, swung from the ceiling, narrowly avoiding the whipping tentacles. He let out a playful snort as he somersaulted through the air, planting a swift kick against Olivia's metallic body. Hog wild. Trench coat billowing behind him, Noir expertly weaved through the barrage of tentacles. With each movement, he dodged and countered with precise strikes, relying on his speed and agility. Analyzed their movements, Olivia's eyes glowed with a mix of intelligence and malice. She adjusted her strategy, launching a volley of tentacle strikes at Ben, attempting to overpower him with sheer force. The rotund Spider-Man's reflexes were pushed to the limit as he deflected and dodged, his moves surprisingly swift for his physique. Spider-Pig unleashed his inner Looney Tune, causing Olivia to momentarily falter with a mixture of confusion and irritation as she found herself dodging falling anvils, pianos, and lit sticks of TNT. Utilizing the cartoon distractions to his advantage, Noir grabbed a nearby pipe and swung it like a weapon, deflecting the tentacles with expert precision. With each strike, he chipped away at Olivia's defenses, aiming for critical weak points in her metallic appendages. With her frustration mounting, Olivia retracted her tentacles and formulated a new plan. She activated her mechanical suit's propulsion system, launching herself into the air. Hovering above the three spider people, she used her tentacles to rain down a barrage of energy blasts, forcing them to scatter like roaches. Ben, his web shooters at the ready, swung around, attempting to close the distance and launch a surprise attack. Spider Pig used his odd reality bending to zigzagging through the air with a cartoon jetpack that just appeared on his back. As Olivia momentarily focused her attention on Spider Pig, Noir leaped forward, delivering a devastating blow to her mechanical suit. The impact sent her crashing to the ground, temporarily disoriented. Seeing this, the team took the opportunity and closed in, each one of them launching a flurry of coordinated attacks. Ben delivered powerful punches, which cracked her metallic suit and appendages. Spider Pig utilized his cartoon ability one again, summoned his mallet, which he swiftly began to beat her with. Noir struck with precise and calculated blows, exploiting any weaknesses in Olivia's armor. 
Soon enough, their adversary seemed to pass out, but they didn't stop. Grabbing each of her tentacles, the team of three used her own appendages against her, tying her into a knotted mess. Spider Pig smirked as he stood victorious above his defeated opponent. Looks like this little piggy has you hogtied. Haney and Gwen quickly assessed the situation, their eyes locked on Tombstone, who stood before them with a menacing grin. With their minds in sync, they exchanged a nod, silently communicating their plan of attack. Painey stepped forward, her robotic companion obediently following suit, swallowing her safely inside. The large mechanical suit resembled a spider, with multiple limbs extending from its back, each armed with various gadgets and weapons. The robot's eyes glowed with a blue hue as Painey's voice echoed from its speakers. Let's give him a taste of our teamwork, partner. The robot lunged forward, its limbs springing into action. It deftly evaded Tombstone's initial strikes, sidestepping his punches with remarkable agility. Painey controlled the suit with finesse, analyzing Tombstone's movements and counterattacking with calculated precision. Gwen, her webs fluidly weaving through the air, swung into action, creating barriers to protect herself and Painey. She swiftly closed the distance between them and Tombstone, her moves a graceful dance of agility and speed. As Gwen engaged Tombstone in close combat, Painey's robot companion launched a volley of projectiles. Gatling guns mounted on its shoulders unleashed a hail of bullets, forcing Tombstone to retreat and seek cover. The onslaught continued as the robot fired rockets from its back, detonating in bursts of concussive force. After running out of explosives, Painey maneuvered the robot into a flanking position. She expertly coordinated its movements, delivering precise strikes with its mechanical limbs. Each blow carried the weight of her determination, striking Tombstone with powerful force. Tombstone grunted, his durable body absorbing the impact of the blows, but Painey and Gwen refused to relent. They pressed their advantage, their teamwork seamless and fluid. Gwen's webs ensnared Tombstone's arms, momentarily restricting his movements, while Painey's robot delivered a devastating uppercut, sending him crashing to the ground. Gasping for breath, Tombstone attempted to rise, but Gwen swiftly webbed his legs, rendering him immobile. Painey's robot joined in as well, encased him in a thick web cocoon, ensuring he wouldn't escape. Breathing heavily, Gwen watched as Painey jumped out of her robot companion, a rather unique-looking spider sat on her shoulder. The two standing side by side, their eyes locked on their defeated foe. They exchanged a triumphant smile, knowing their teamwork had prevailed. Gwen extended a hand to Painey, who gratefully accepted it. Great job, Painey. Your robot was amazing. Painey beamed with pride as she she lovingly pet the spider on her shoulder. He is amazing, isn't he? She cooed as the arachnid seemed to preen at her attention. Miles swung through the air with a grace that contradicted his inexperience, his spider sense guiding his every move. The prowler matched his agility, his movements fluid and calculated. They circled each other, their eyes locked in a fierce struggle for dominance. Suddenly, Prowler activated his boots and flew forward, his claws slashing through the air. Miles somersaulted backward, narrowly evading the deadly strike. He retaliated with a quick burst of webbing, aiming to immobilize his opponent. But the Prowler, trained and agile, dodged the sticky trap with a nimble twist of his body. Miles couldn't afford to hold back. He knew that he couldn't match the Prowler's skill and experience, but thankfully, he had many superpowers that his opponent didn't. Gathering his courage, he pressed forward, his fists clenched. They exchanged blows with incredible speed, the sound of their impacts echoing through the massive room. Miles relied on his agility and acrobatics, flipping and diving to avoid the Prowler's deadly strikes. His spider sense buzzed with intensity, warning him of incoming attacks milliseconds before they landed. As they continued their intense battle, Miles spotted an opening. With a swift kick, he knocked the Prowler off balance, causing him to stumble backward. Seizing the opportunity, Miles leaped forward, his fist reaching for the Prowler's face and with one solid hit, he managed to accidentally pull the Prowler's mask off. Instantly, time seemed to slow as the truth was revealed. Underneath the mask stood Aaron Davis, his eyes narrowed dangerously. Realization washed over Miles, freezing him in place. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. Uncle Aaron. He was beyond shocked. The connection between them surged in Miles' mind. But the battle wasn't over, and the Prowler, regaining his composure, lunged forward once again, delivering a clean hit to Miles' frozen, masked face. Prowler watched Miles fall backwards with a satisfied smirk, unaware that he just punched his own nephew. His brother would be furious if he found out. Peter leaped down from the control room, his landing sending a shockwave through the air. He stood before the dazed and battered Kingpin, his expression filled with cold anger. Enough games, Kingpin, Peter growled, his voice low and filled with venom. Your actions have hurt a very kind woman. And now, it's time to pay. Kingpin struggled to his feet, blood dripping from his mouth. He attempted to steady himself, but his legs wavered, weakened from the devastating blow Peter had delivered. Fear flickered in his eyes, but he tried to mask it with false bravado. You think you can defeat me? Kingpin sneered, his voice strained. I'm the kingpin of crime. I've got it guys a hundred times your size. Peter cracked his knuckles, a chilling smile spreading across his face. Well, you know what they say. Size isn't everything. A slash n, small schlong copium, in a blur of motion, Peter launched himself at kingpin, 
his fists a blur as he unleashed a barrage of lightning-fast punches. Each strike landed with bone-crushing force, shaking the building with every impact. Kingpin's attempts to defend himself were feeble at best. His massive frame was no match for Peter's agility and strength. Blow after blow landed, leaving Kingpin staggering, bloodied, and broken. The room echoed with the sickening sound of flesh meeting flesh, accompanied by the grunts and groans of Kingpin's pain. Peter's movements were a symphony of precision and power, his years of training as Spider-Man honed to perfection. You're nothing more than an overgrown bully, Peter taunted between strikes. A coward hiding behind a criminal empire, Kingpin's body trembled with each blow, his once imposing figure reduced to a mere punching bag. His face contorted with agony, his attempts to fight back becoming weaker and slower. With a final surge of power, Peter delivered a devastating uppercut, lifting Kingpin off his feet and sending him crashing into the ceiling. The impact left a gaping hole in the structure, debris raining down around them. Kingpin came crashing back down onto a floating bus, barely conscious. His breathing was labored, his body battered and broken. Peter approached him, his expression cold. You still alive? Peter asked, his voice laced with a dark amusement. Peter raised his hand, a fiery energy crackling around it, as he tapped into his phoenix powers. The air shimmered with fiery currents, the room growing tense with anticipation. Kingpin's eyes widened, fear replacing his arrogance. Wait, please. He pleaded, his voice barely a whisper. But Peter's resolve was unyielding. With a swift and decisive movement, he released a surge of fire that coursed through Kingpin's body, overwhelming him with excruciating pain. The area filled with the smell of burnt flesh and the sound of Kingpin's agonized screams. Peter's eyes remained locked on his target, his expression cold and unwavering. As the seconds stretched into eternity, the flames dissipated, leaving nothing behind. Not even a charred corpse was left. Just a bit of ash that blew away moments later, disappearing into the wind. Hopefully, this will help Ant-May move on. Miles groaned in pain as he hit the ground, his vision momentarily blurred. The impact had knocked the wind out of him, leaving him gasping for breath. He struggled to rise to his feet, his mind racing with conflicting emotions. Uncle Aaron. He whispered between labored breaths, his voice unheard. Prowler stood over him, his menacing presence looming. His face hardened into an intense glare. Miles could see the cold look in his uncle's eyes as he stared down at him. Without an ounce of pity, Prowler lunged at Miles once again, his movements fueled by a mix of anger and loyalty to his criminal employer. Miles barely had time to react, narrowly evading each strike. His heart sank as he realized that his uncle's actions spoke louder than any words. UNC Miles tried to create some distance between them, hoping to find a moment to talk and reveal himself, but Prowler relentlessly pursued him, his strikes becoming faster and more ferocious. Miles' thoughts raced as he dodged and weaved. He couldn't give up. He had to find a way to reach his uncle, to show him that they were family. But each attempt to reveal his true identity was met with a barrage of attacks that left him unable to get the words out. In a brief moment of desperation, Miles reached for his mask, hoping that removing it would break through the Prowler's aggression. His fingers barely grazed the edge before a powerful punch slammed into his gut, knocking the wind out of him once again. The pain intensified, forcing him to collapse to his knees, his mask still securely in place. Miles tasted blood in his mouth as he staggered to his feet. His vision blurred for a moment, but determination fueled his every move. He began to realize that he couldn't let his emotions cloud his judgment. He had a responsibility as Spider-Man, no matter who his opponent was. Prowler circled him, a smirk playing on his lips. Didn't think I'd be this tough, did you, kid? He taunted, his voice dripping with venom. Miles gritted his teeth, throwing away the idea of revealing himself. You're not the strongest guy I've faced, he replied, his voice tinged with determination. Peter hits way harder than you. With renewed determination, Miles launched himself at Prowler, his fist swinging with a newfound intensity. He weaved through the air, striking with expert precision. Prowler blocked and dodged, his movement slowing ever so slightly. Miles could see the fatigue setting in, his uncle's stamina waning. This gave him a glimmer of hope. You can't beat me, kid. Just give up and go home. Prowler growled, attempting to land a blow on Miles. But the young Spider-Man was too quick, sidestepping the attack and countering with a powerful punch of his own. As their fight raged on, Miles tapped into his mentor's teachings. Peter's experience and skill melded with his own, creating a unique style that was becoming increasingly effective against his uncle. With a calculated move, Miles flipped over Prowler's head and landed behind him. He seized the opportunity and delivered a series of rapid punches to his uncle's back, each strike filled with a mix of anger and resolve. Prowler stumbled forward, his strength fading. Miles pressed on, his movements fluid and precise. He spun a web around his hands, like a boxer taping his knuckles, and delivered a powerful uppercut to Prowler's jaw. The impact sent his uncle sprawling backward, crashing into a nearby wall. Dust and debris rained down, shrouding him momentarily. Miles stood there, panting heavily, his heart pounding in his chest. As the dust cleared, Prowler struggled to rise. Blood trickled from his split lip, his purple suit torn and ripped. He glared at Miles, a mix of anger and surprise in his eyes. 
Flashback only a couple days ago, after Miles' first day in his new school, he managed to sneak off and visit his uncle, whom he usually had to visit in secret. After all, his father always did everything he could to keep them apart. So, you like this girl, Gwen? Uncle Aaron turned to Miles, who hesitantly nodded his head. All right, then let me teach you something important. Confused but intrigued, Miles looked up at his uncle. Question mark. Aaron leaned in closer, his voice filled with wisdom. Getting a girl is all about confidence, Miles. When you want to ask a girl out, you gotta make your move with style. Watch and learn. With that, Aaron straightened his back, took a deep breath, and walked up to him. Miles watched as his uncle approached, casually placing a hand on his shoulder. Hey, he said, his voice oozing with charisma. A slash N, Riz God, his nephew stared at him doubtfully. Seriously? That's it? Miles asked as he reached over and placed a hand on his uncle's shoulder. Hey, Aaron laughed, a twinkle in his eye. Haha. Yeah, just put your hand on her shoulder and say hey, works every time. It's science. I'm telling you, flashback N. Miles smirked as he thought of a way to get back at his uncle for the beating he was just given. Walking up to his downed opponent, Miles crouched down to eye level, pulled off his mask, and places a hand on his uncle's shoulder. Hey, he says, activating his charm. Prowler's eyes widened, a flicker of recognition crossing his face. But before he could respond, electricity danced along Miles' body, converging on his outstretched hand. Exclamation point. Uncle Aaron convulsed as his nephew's venom strike spread from his shoulder to the rest of his body. Aha! He screamed in pain before his eyes rolled back, knocked out cold. The air crackled with tension as the remaining spider people emerged from the shadows, each of them bringing with them their own captured villains. Olivia Octavius, also known as Dr. Octopus, was suspended in midair, her tentacles restrained and bound by webs. Beside her, Tombstone struggled within a tight cocoon of sticky silk. Peter glanced at the defeated foes, his eyes filled with a mix of satisfaction and pride in his team. He was especially happy to see Miles' uncle alive and breathing, unlike his movie counterpart. Turning to I the active collider, he knew they couldn't stay in this universe for much longer, and it was time to bid farewell to their new allies and return to their own worlds. Good work, everyone. Peter said, a sad smile on his face. We stopped Fisk and now it's time to destroy the collider. But first, we all have to go back to where we belong. Wait. Gwen interrupted as she eyed her surroundings. Where's Fisk? Peter exchanged a knowing glance with Noir before answering. I left him in the control room. Miles can grab him later. He shrugged, playing it off perfectly. Not a single person doubted him but Noir, though he already knew Peter's plans. Ben, still catching his breath after the intense battle, stepped up. It's been a wild ride, but I have someone waiting for me back home. And hopefully, she'll take me back. Spider Pig sadly stared at the ground as a dark cloud appeared over his head, raining down on him. He didn't want to leave so soon. Noir adjusted his hat and tie. I brought justice to this universe. My work here is done. Haney looked at her companions with a hint of sadness. I'll miss you guys. It's been so much fun fighting alongside all of you. Gwen stepped forward and placed a hand on Miles' shoulder. Take care of yourself, Miles. You're gonna do great things. And remember, we're all here for you, no matter what. She says, pulling out the phone that Peter had given them. Miles nodded, his voice filled with gratitude. Thanks, Gwen. I couldn't have done it without all of you. One by one, the spider people approached the interdimensional collider, their captured villains left behind with Miles. Each of them gave Miles a farewell nod or a pat on the back before leaping into the center of the lasers. Peter, the last remaining spider person, turned back for a moment, his eyes meeting Miles' gaze. You're a great Spider-Man, Miles. Keep being amazing. As Peter disappeared into the swirling vortex of the collider, leaving Miles standing alone with the defeated villains, a mix of emotion swirled within him. He felt a sense of loss, yet also a newfound determination to continue his newfound journey as Spider-Man Miles turned his attention to the control panel across the room, his face set with resolve. Swinging over and plugging in the override key, he hit a single button, which caused the collider to reverse, imploding in on itself. There was only one thought in Miles' mind as he ran for his life with three captured villains over his shoulder. Where the hell is Fisk? Peter fell out of a swirling, multicolored portal and landed gracefully on his feet. As he regained his balance, he looked around, finding himself atop a building in a rather familiar New York City. Though was it his? The bustling streets of Times Square stretched out before him, the bright lights and towering billboards shining even in the daylight. Re-equipping his mask, just in case, Peter's gaze fixated on one of the massive screens adorning a nearby building. It displayed a news report, featuring an image of Spider-Man in his iconic red and blue suit alongside an unmasked picture of himself. The headline blared, Spider-Man Unmasked, Public Demands Answers. A video played below the headline, showing a very satisfied J. Jonah Jameson. I haven't seen that guy in a while. Peter thought. There you have it, folks. Conclusive proof that Spider-Man was responsible for the brutal murder of Mysterio, an interdimensional warrior who gave his life to protect our planet, and who will no doubt go down in history as the greatest superhero of all time. But that's not all. Here's the real blockbuster. 
Brace yourselves, you might want to sit down. Jonah really seemed to be enjoying himself. Suddenly, an image of Quinton Beck, a bearded man with slicked back hair, appeared. Spider-Man's real. Spider-Man's real name is. He spoke with grave urgency as the video seemed to distort and glitch before finally returning back to normal. Spider-Man's name is Peter Parker. Insert picture of Quinton Beck slash Mysterio here, after that, the video seemed to repeat again, starting with Jonah's happy rant. What the hell? Peter whispered, his voice filled with disbelief. He watched the footage, his eyes widening as he recognized the events unfolding on the screen. It was the same video from the movie Spider-Man, No Way Home. Peter pulled out his phone and swiftly unlocked it, navigating to the multiverse chat app, which connected all the spider people across dimensions, allowing them to stay in touch and provide support to one another. With a bit of trepidation, Peter composed a message in the chat, his fingers dancing across the virtual keyboard. Ski Shooter 69420XD, hey, everyone. Just wanted to check in and see if you all made it back home safely. He pressed the send button, his eyes fixed on the screen, waiting for the familiar blue check marks that indicated his message had been delivered. Time seemed to stretch as he anxiously awaited a response, hoping that the chat actually worked. After what felt like an eternity, the chat bubble started to appear one by one, indicating that his fellow spider people were typing their replies. Peter's heart skipped a beat as he read the incoming messages, relief flooding through him. Hey me. Hey, Peter. I'm back in my universe, no problemo. Ben, made it back to my universe too. It's good to be home. Spider pig. Home sweet home. Noir, made it out of that colorful nightmare. Back in the shadows. Gwen, back in my own dimension too. Hey, Miles, are you okay? Did everything go well with the collider? Miles, yeah, I'm good too. I'm surprised these phones actually work. A mix of emotions washed over Peter as he read their responses. Relief that his multiverse's chat actually worked and that his new friends returned to their respective universes, but also a sense of isolation, knowing that he was the only one who had been diverted from his intended path. Though he knew that he wouldn't be alone for long. I wonder if the Andrew and Toby Spider-Mans that I've met will show up? Peter wondered, knowing that he's met versions of them before in his genie trials. Not to mention the Peter Parker that this universe belongs to. Hmm, let's go find my twin brother and mess with him a bit? Peter muttered as a sinister look formed under his mask. Peter's heart raced with anticipation as he made his way through the bustling streets of New York City. The sound of cars honking, people chattering, and the occasional sirens filled the air, reminding him of the vibrant and chaotic world he had seen on the big screen. His mind focused on the task at hand, Peter quickly located a nearby internet cafe and hurried inside, ignoring the odd looks he received for his spider suit. He approached one of the vacant computers, fingers already itching to start his search. With practiced efficiency, he typed in a series of commands and algorithms, utilizing his spider-like speed and agility to navigate through the vast expanse of the digital world. As the search results populated the screen, Peter's eyes scanned the information, searching for the names and addresses of the counterparts he sought. MJ, Aunt May, Ned, and even his own counterpart. Each piece of data brought him closer to his goal, igniting a mixture of excitement and mischievous within him. Finally, he found what he was looking for. A small donut shop situated not too far from his current location. The name Michelle Jones Watson appeared beside the address, confirming that this was indeed the place where this universe's MJ worked. A smile tugged at the corners of his lips as he imagined the surprise on her face when she realized he wasn't her Peter. Walking out of the cafe, Peter summoned a shimmering cloak of magical energy, transforming his Spider-Man suit into a more casual outfit. A simple t-shirt, jeans, and a hoodie. With his appearance fixed, he left the internet cafe, blending into the crowd as an ordinary young man. Or at least, that what he hoped would happen. The second that Peter's face was revealed, everyone on the street turned to eye him curiously. Their gazes filled with a mix of awe and fear. Instantly, Peter realized his mistake. Oh, yeah. I forgot that my face is very famous in this world. He wanted to slap himself for forgetting this. Opting to just ignore the stairs, Peter approached the donut shop, his face split in a devious smirk. He paused for a moment and peered through the front windows. And there she was, MJ, his MJ. Well, not his MJ. They certainly looked like twins but his MJ is a bit more fit and curvy thanks to her enhancements. Her back was turned to him as she worked the register. Peter's eyes softened a bit as he watched her, a rush of affection washing over him. He couldn't help but admire the way she moved with grace and confidence, even in such a mundane setting. Not wasting any more time, Peter pushed open the door and stepped inside the shop. The smell of freshly baked goods enveloped him. The bell above the door chimed softly, drawing MJ's attention. She turned around, her eyes widening in surprise as they locked with Peter's, not expecting her boyfriend to show up like this. Walking up to the counter, Peter locked eyes with MJ, his mischievous smile still playing on his lips. He feigning nonchalance as he leaned against the counter, pretending to study the donut selection. Hey, beautiful, he said, his voice laced with playful charm. I'll take a dozen of your finest donuts, please. MJ blinked, her surprise morphing into a mix of confusion and suspicion. She studied Peter's face intently, trying to understand why her boyfriend was acting so weird. 
He would never call her beautiful in public, nor would he do whatever sort of play this was. And if he did, he would be much more awkward than this. Something definitely felt off. He was taller. About five inches taller. And instead of tilting her head down to look at him, she found herself looking up, which wasn't normal whatsoever. Uh, do I know you? MJ asked, playing along for the moment. Peter chuckled lightly, his eyes twinkling with mischief. Nah, we haven't met before. I'm new in town. Just thought I'd try these donuts everyone's raving about. Mind giving me some recommendations? He asks, gesturing to the wide selection of pastries. MJ's suspicion grew, but curiosity got the better of her. She glanced around the shop, noticing the lingering glances of the other customers who were just as intrigued by Peter's presence. After all, he's Spider-Man. With a sigh, she began to fill a box with donuts, throwing in the ones that sold the most. Here, these are popular. Peter's grin widened, his eyes sparkling with delight. Thanks, I'll trust your judgment. And hey, while I'm at it, can I ask for your number? Maybe I can swing by sometime and take you out on a date. MJ's eyes narrowed as his request hit her. Her mind raced, questioning the possibility of her Peter playing some kind of prank on her. She hesitated for a moment, her fingers twitching with uncertainty. Um, sure, she replied, her voice guarded yet intrigued. She quickly grabbed a piece of receipt paper and a pen, scribbling down her phone number. As she handed it to Peter, their fingers brushed lightly, sending a jolt of electricity through her. Peter took the paper, his fingers lingering for a brief moment longer than necessary. Thanks, MJ. I'll be sure to give you a call soon. With that, he straightened up, a triumphant smirk playing on his lips. As he turned to leave the donut shop, MJ's mind raced, piecing together the inconsistencies, the height difference, and the feeling that something was amiss. Scrambling for her phone, she quickly dialed her boyfriend's number. It only took seconds for him to answer, his voice filled with warmth and familiarity. Hey, MJ, what's up? Everything okay? He asked. MJ's voice trembled as she spoke. Peter, there was someone here who looked exactly like you, but he's taller, and he, he just asked for my number. It's not you, right? There was a pause on the other end of the line. Is this a joke? He asked, confirming all her suspicions. Relief flooded through MJ as she realized her instincts were right. She watched anxiously as her genuine Peter, her short king, walked through the door seconds later, his eyes searching for her. He approached the counter, a concerned look etched on his face. Hey, why do you look like you've seen a ghost? Walking toward his next destination, Peter smirked as he bit into one of his free donuts. Luckily, MJ was far too shocked and confused to realize that he didn't pay for them. This is more fun than I thought it would be. He couldn't keep the amused smile from his face. Soon enough, Peter found himself in front of an apartment building, his senses heightened as he navigated the security-filled corridors. He made his way up to Aunt May's apartment, a mix of excitement and nerves bubbling within him. Would Aunt May recognize him? Would she suspect that he wasn't her Peter? Taking a deep breath, Peter approached the door and used a simple spell to phase through it like a ghost, entering the apartment with ease. Honey, I'm home. He called out jokingly. And I brought donuts? Peter, you're home early. Aunt May peeked her head out from down the hall, her voice tinged with a mix of confusion and concern. Is something wrong? Peter smiled warmly as soon as he saw her, his eyes sparkling with hidden mischief as he held up the box of donuts. Hey, May. No, nothing's wrong. Just thought I'd surprise you with some treats. A slash N. Just to avoid confusion, the Peter in the first part of this chapter is this universe's Peter, not the MC. Here are some nicknames that will be used later, just like Into the Spider-Verse, our MC, Peter Parker. Andrew Parker, Andrew Garfield, Andrew Peter. Toby Parker, Toby Maguire, Toby Peter. Thomas Parker, Tom Holland, Tom Peter. Hey, why do you look like you've seen a ghost? Peter asked as he stashed his phone away, his voice filled with genuine concern. He was rushing over to tell MJ and Ned that he planned to speak to the dean at MIT and plead their cases for enrollment, hoping that he could convince the school to at least take his friend and girlfriend in. Ever since he was outed as Spider-Man and blamed for the death of a fake hero-slash-villain, their peaceful lives have been flipped upside down. Not to mention the fact that not a single college would accept him or anyone related to him. Peter even went as far as asking for help from Doctor Strange, hoping that magic could fix his problems, but that failed spectacularly and he only seemed to anger the man that tried to help him all while nearly tearing a hole in the fabric of the universe. Or whatever magic mumbo-jumbo Strange was ranting about as he threw him out of the New York Sanctum, slamming the door shut behind him. But all of that was put to the side for now. MJ took a deep breath, her mind racing to make sense of the encounter. Peter, there was someone here who looked exactly like you, but he's taller, and he, he just asked for my number. You're not playing a prank on me, right? Peter's brow furrowed, his eyes narrowing with confusion. MJ, I promise, it wasn't me. I have no idea who you're talking about, he reassures her as he eyed one of the security cameras behind the register. The cameras here work, right? MJ followed his line of sight, nodding her head as she realized what he meant. Yeah, follow me. The duo quickly moved to the back of the shop, where a small office housed the security camera footage. Peter sat down in front of the computer, his fingers dancing across the keyboard as he accessed the recordings. 
MJ leaned over his shoulder, her heart pounding with a mix of curiosity and apprehension. The screen flickered to life, displaying the footage from earlier. As they watched the events unfold, Peter's eyes widened in disbelief. There, on the screen, was their mysterious doppelganger, completely identical to Peter, save for a few extra inches in height, the mischievous smile, and the confident posture. Besides that, he was all too familiar what the... Peter muttered, his voice trailing off. MJ's gaze shifted between the screen and Peter, her mind racing to make sense of the situation. Peter, who is he? How is this even possible? Peter let out a sigh, his mind racing to grasp the reality of what they were witnessing. I don't know. But one thing's for sure, we need to find out who he is and what he's up to. With a renewed sense of determination, Peter reached for his phone and began texting furiously, sending messages to everyone he knew in their close-knit circle of friends and family. The warning messages described the doppelganger and urged everyone to be cautious. However, there was one person who didn't respond as quickly as they'd hoped. Aunt May. May's not answering her phone, Peter muttered, a hint of worry creeping into his voice. We need to check on her. Something doesn't feel right about all this. MJ nodded in agreement, her eyes filled with concern. Let's go. We can't waste any more time. As they hurriedly made their way toward the exit of the donut shop, they bumped into Ned, who was about to walk inside, clearly curious about the texts he had received. Ned's eyes widened as he took in the urgency etched on their faces. What's going on? Ned asked, his voice filled with concern. I heard something about a doppelganger. Explaining along the way, Peter and MJ rushed out of the donut shop followed by Ned, their minds filled with questions and concerns. Peter, our MC, and May sat at the small dining table in the cozy apartment, surrounded by the remains of their shared donut feast. The room was filled with the warm aroma of freshly baked pastries and the soft glow of the afternoon sun filtering through the curtains. May took a bite of her last donut, savoring the sweet taste as she looked at Peter with a fond smile. You know, Peter, it's been a while since we've had a chance to sit down and just relax like this, together. I've missed it. Peter nodded, his expression filled with a mixture of affection and determination. Yeah, I've missed it too. I've been so caught up with everything lately that I just haven't had time. May's phone, lying on the kitchen counter, suddenly buzzed with notifications. Calls and texts from her Peter filled the screen, warning her about the presence of a doppelganger. However, the phone was on silent, and both Peter and May remained blissfully unaware of the urgent messages. Gazing at his aunt's counterpart, who looked just like her, Peter made a silent vow to himself. He would protect May, no matter what it took. He wouldn't allow her to suffer the same fate as her movie counterpart. This May might not be his, but he still watched her die in the theater, crying his eyes out like everyone else. He couldn't bear the thought of watching it happen in real life. Leaning forward, Peter reached out and gently placed his hand over May's. May, I want you to know that I'll always be here for you. You're like a mother to me, and I won't let anything happen to you. I promise. May's eyes softened, her hand squeezing his in return, unaware of the underlying meaning behind his words. Peter, I couldn't be prouder of you, but you don't have to worry about me so much. My problems are simple compared to yours. Peter smiled, returning back to his donut. Oh really? What might those simple problems be? Well, Happy wants to get back together. She started happily ranting off all of her problems, one by one. As they finished the last of their donuts, the room was filled with a comfortable silence, though that silence would soon be ruined. Outside in the hallway, Peter could hear the elevator opening alongside the sound of three people stepping out. Do you think he's a clone? Ned asked as they paced to the apartment door. A lot of the time in comic books, the hero's DNA gets stolen and some villain makes a clone of him. Peter smirked as he heard this universe's Peter, MJ, and Ned talking about him. Well, this has been fun, but I should probably get going now. He said out of nowhere. Huh? Where are you going? She asked as he stood up from his seat and waved his hand. Exclamation point. In an instant, a golden portal opened in the center of her apartment, shocking her into a stunned silence. I'll come visit again, okay? Peter smiles as he gives her a wave and steps through the portal. Oh, yeah. One more thing. Turning back around, Peter pointed in her direction, and suddenly, a golden spell circle drew itself in front of him before shrinking to the size of a pin and shooting into her body. W what was that? She hopped out of her seat, alarmed. Just a small protection spell? Peter answers as the portal began to close. Stay safe, okay? And just as the portal snapped shut, the front door swung open abruptly, revealing Peter, Ned, and MJ. As they walked in, calling for Aunt May, they found her standing there with an empty donut box on the table and a bewildered look on her face. Her eyes widened even further as she took in the sight of the trio standing before her. Peter. May's voice trembled slightly as she stared at them, her heart pounding in her chest. What's going on? Who are you? Peter stepped forward, his voice filled with urgency. May, it's me, Peter. I know this is hard to believe, but there's some doppelganger of me out there. Was he here? MJ, always the observant one, noticed box on the table from the shop she works at. Her eyes narrowed, and she pointed at it. Looks like he brought over his donuts. Did he say anything? May's confusion deepened as she glanced at the Peter before her, realizing the height difference immediately. 
He said he'd come visit again, and he did this magic that shot into my chest. He called it a protection spell. After the portal snapped shut, Peter, our MC, donned his spider suit once again and made his way to one of the many manholes that covered the streets of New York City. If I recall the movie correctly, Doctor Strange found the first villain in the sewers. Sighing to himself, as he really didn't want to go down into the shit and piss-filled tunnels, Peter nonetheless descended into the grimy depths, his senses immediately assaulted by the putrid stench that permeated the air. Acting quickly, Peter cast a spell on his mask, filtering the air as if he was wearing a lavender-scented gas mask. The brief light of the spell revealing the damp and moss-covered bricks, along with the occasional rat scurrying through the shadows. With each step, the echo of his steps reverberated through the labyrinthine tunnels, amplifying the eerie atmosphere. The distant sound of water dripping added a haunting melody to the symphony of the underground. As he ventured deeper into the labyrinth, the claustrophobic surroundings closed in around him, the narrow passageways seeming to twist and turn with no end in sight. The darkness seemed to consume everything, save for the occasional flickering of dimly lit bulbs that hung from the ceiling, casting eerie shadows along the walls. Peter's heightened senses detected movement ahead, a faint scuffling sound mixed with a low, guttural growl. He readied himself, knowing that he was about to confront the dangerous creature lurking within these foul corridors. The sound of dripping water seemed to intensify, echoing through the labyrinth like a haunting symphony. Peter focused, his gaze fixed on the darkness ahead. Casually, he moved forward, his footsteps careful and deliberate. The wall seemed to ooze with filth, the grime clinging to his suit. He fought the urge to gag, pressing on. Finally, he reached a wider section of the sewer. The flickering light revealed a figure lurking in the shadows, hunched over and emitting low, raspy growls. It was a giant humanoid lizard, its reptilian features twisted and grotesque. Insert picture of the lizard slash Dr. Connors here, Dr. Connors, once a respected scientist, had succumbed to his own experiment, transforming into the monstrous lizard. The lizard's eyes narrowed, studying Peter with a mix of curiosity and aggression. Its snout curled into a menacing sneer, revealing rows of sharp, jagged teeth. A low hiss escaped its throat as it prepared to attack. Peter approached, his spider sense tingling, alerting him to the imminent danger. With a wave of his hand, he greeted the creature, his voice firm yet tinged with an air of familiarity. Yo! As Peter stepped forward, his confident posture and relaxed demeanor contrasted sharply with the ferocity of the lizard monstrosity before him. Before he had the chance to introduce himself, the creature lunged at him with lightning speed, claws extended and jaws gaping wide. Peter effortlessly sidestepped the attack, fluidly evading the lizard's assault. You know, your teeth are nasty, right? Peter quipped, effortlessly dodging another swipe of the lizard's claws. As someone who used to be human, you should really brush your teeth every once in a while. Lizard monster or not, that shit's disgusting. The lizard growled in frustration, its attacks becoming more desperate. Peter continued to effortlessly avoid each strike, his agility and spider sense guiding him flawlessly through the chaotic dance. With a swift and precise movement, Peter flipped over the lizard's head, landing gracefully behind it. As the creature turned and dived his way, Peter simply stepped out of the way, sending it sprawling into the grimy sewer water. I hope you don't mind getting a little dirty, Peter taunted, his voice laced with amusement. Though it seems like you're already familiar with this environment, the lizard hissed in anger and lunged again, claws slashing through the air. Peter effortlessly weaved around the attacks, occasionally throwing out a few taunts to keep his opponent feisty. As the fight continued, Peter's strategy became clear. He wasn't aiming to defeat the lizard at all. In fact he hasn't tried to counter with a single attack. Instead, he was patiently wearing down his opponent by letting him flail around and waste all of his energy with agile maneuvers. The echoes of their scuffle reverberated through the sewer tunnels, creating an eerie soundscape as the lizard roared in tired frustration. Peter's movements were a blur of speed and precision, each strike that came his way was dodged with calculated efficiency. After almost 10 minutes of staying centimeters out of reach of the monster's grasp, the lizard stumbled forward, panting as he crashed against a moss-covered wall. Peter took advantage of the opening, using his webs to immobilize the lizard's limbs, cocooning it in a sticky trap. Looks like you've been caught and I didn't even have to do anything, Peter chuckled, standing triumphantly over the restrained creature. Maybe next time you'll be able to land a hit. Just be sure to eat your vegetables and grow up to be a strong lizard, okay? The lizard snarled, its reptilian eyes filled with a mix of defeat and fury. Peter approached casually, crouching down so they stood at eyes level. So, you can talk right? Peter asked, knowing that he could talk in the movie. Without uttering a single word, the lizard before him cleared his throat and spat straight in Peter's face. Okay, Peter stood up and wiped the green-tinted lizard man mucus off his mask, fighting the urge to puke at how nasty it was. That was gross? Dr. Connors peered up at him, his expression a mix of anger and frustration. Damn you. Spider-Man, he spoke, his voice strained. Peter nodded back at him, a hint of gooey lizard spit still on his mask. I love you too, buddy. Before Dr. Connors shocked and confused eyes, Peter waved his hand and opened a golden portal, which seemed to lead to a some sort of old building. Shooting one more web at the giant lizard's bald head, Connors was dragged through, watching the portal in interest. 
After all, he may look like a lizard right now but Dr. Connors is still a very accomplished scientist. Making their way out of the grimy sewers, leaving behind the echoes of their fight and the faint scent of feces and victory in the air, the portal snapped shut behind them, darkening the sewers once again. Peter, not RMC, Ned, and MJ rushed Aunt May to the New York Sanctum, their hearts pounding with worry. As they entered the ancient building, the group was greeted by the stern face of Dr. Strange, who seemed to appear after sensing their arrival. Strange's brow furrowed as he saw the group barging in. What is the meaning of this intrusion? He demanded, his gaze laced with annoyance, especially when he eyed Peter in their little group. I thought I made it clear that you're not welcome here anymore. Everyone's eyebrow raised as they heard that, wondering what the sorcerer meant. Peter took a deep breath, his voice shaky but determined. Yes sir, please, we need your help. There's a doppelganger of me running around, and he visited Aunt May. He placed some kind of spell on her, and we don't know what it does. Strange's annoyance softened into curiosity as he listened to Peter's explanation. He looked at Aunt May, who stood there with a bewildered expression on her face. And you believe this doppelganger poses a threat? Strange asked, crossing his arms in contemplation. Peter nodded. Yes, he seemed, off. And the fact that he performed magic worries me. I don't know what his intentions are and I don't like it. Strange sighed, his gaze shifting to Aunt May. Very well, let me take a look. He motioned for Aunt May to step forward, and she cautiously approached him. Strange raised his hands, conjuring golden spell circles that floated surrounded May's entire body, scanning her for any traces of the spell. The room fell into a tense silence as Strange's magic worked its way through May's being. The spell circles hummed softly, their intricate patterns shifting and pulsating. After what felt like an eternity, Strange lowered his hands, dispelling the spell circles. He frowned, his expression pensive. This is a very impressive protection spell. I won't be able to disarm it without setting it off. Peter's eyes widened, a mix of relief and concern washing over him. So, she's protected? But protected from what? Strange shook his head, his eyes meeting Peter's. I'm not sure, Peter. This spell is powerful, and its purpose seems to be to keep her safe. We'll need to tread carefully and find out more about this doppelganger. He said, his mind drifting to the incident that happened on Peter's first visit of the day, which could be the reason for all of this. May's voice trembled as she spoke up, concern etched on her face. What does this mean? Am I in danger? Strange stern expression softened, and he placed a reassuring hand on May's shoulder. We won't let anything happen to you, May. I'll keep a close eye on the situation, and we'll find a way to handle it. For now, I suggest you stay with us here at the Sanctum for your own safety. May nodded, her trust in Peter and Strange evident in her eyes. Okay, if you say so. But please, be careful, all of you. Although I don't think this other Peter has any bad intentions, it's still better to keep your guard up. Peter glanced at Aunt May, his determination reignited. We will, May. We'll figure this out together. Strange turned to the rest of the group, his tone stern once again. Now, if you're going to be staying here, you'll have to abide by the rules of the sanctum. No tampering with any artifacts, no wandering off, and definitely no web slinging in here. We don't need any more cobwebs stuck to the ceiling. Peter nodded, a sheepish smile on his face. Got it, Dr. Strange. No web slinging in the sanctum. As the group started to settle into the sanctum, suddenly, a golden portal appeared in the middle of the main entrance, catching everyone's attention. The group's eyes widened in surprise as the golden portal materialized, its shimmering hues casting a warm glow in the dimly lit sanctum. Peter, our MC, otherwise known as the doppelganger, stepped out of the portal, nonchalantly dragging a giant lizard monster behind him. His casual demeanor was in stark contrast to the tense atmosphere that had enveloped the room just moments ago. With a wave and a simple yo, Peter greeted them as he removed his mask, his voice carrying a mix of confidence and mischief. Ned, MJ, and Aunt May exchanged bewildered glances, struggling to comprehend the sudden appearance of another Peter. Doctor Strange, too, was taken aback, his stoic expression momentarily faltering. Peter's eyes flickered across the room, a mischievous smile tugging at the corners of his lips. He couldn't help but revel in the astonishment that painted the faces before him. Hey, guys, he finally said, his voice infused with a casual tone. I brought a friend. I hope you don't mind the extra company. The lizard, still cocooned tightly in webs, emitted a low growl of frustration, his reptilian eyes narrowing at the sight of the bewildered faces in front of him. He squirmed within his constraints, but the thick layers of web held him back. Dr. Strange composed himself, regaining his authoritative presence. With a wave of his hand, he threw a spell at Peter, hoping to capture him for some good old-fashioned interrogation, but that wasn't happening. Peter simply scoffed as he coated his hand in a golden energy and slapped the spell away, sending it crashing into a case in the corner. Peter looked towards Strange, a playful glint in his eyes. That wasn't very nice. I see that this universe's ancient one didn't teach you any manners. Ned's jaw dropped. Dude, that was badass. Peter shot his friend's counterpart a mischievous grin. I know, right? Peters observed the astonished expressions on the faces before him with a hint of amusement, enjoying the moment. Tom, this universe is Peter, and Ned exchanged glances, their curiosity peaked. Aunt May stood there with a mixture of surprise and concern etched on her face. 
MJ, who had been mostly silent, watched Peter intently, her eyes scanning his every move. So, you're another Peter Parker? MJ asked, her voice laced with skepticism. Well, hello again, gorgeous. Peter chuckled at the glare she gave him. But no, I'm not just another Peter Parker. I'm Peter Parker. The one and only Spider-Man. At least, in my universe. Ned's eyes widened, his voice full of excitement. No way. So, you like traveled across the multiverse? Peter nodded. Yup, but I wasn't exactly trying to. In my universe, I was the first hero, the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man started my hero gig as a freshman in high school, and it's been a pretty wild ride ever since. MJ raised an eyebrow, her skepticism evident. And you learned magic? Peter nodded once again. Actually, I did. The Ancient One saw potential in me and took me under her wing. I learned some cool tricks from her over the years. Doctor Strange, who had been observing the exchange with a mixture of surprise and curiosity, finally spoke up. This is quite the tale. Peter. But how did you end up in this universe? Peter's smirk faltered for a moment as he recalled his unexpected journey. Well, you see, I was taking a shower when this gooey portal opened up and swallowed me whole. I ended up in another universe, helping a bunch of spider people take down Kingpin Super Collider. Long story, don't ask. I thought I was heading home after that, but I somehow ended up here instead. I'm not complaining though, this little vacation has been fun, though Lily might be a bit jealous when I tell her about it. Aunt May quirked her head to the side. Who's Lily? She asked curiously. Peter's confident facade softened, his gaze meeting Aunt May's. That would be your granddaughter? He revealed as his gaze turned to MJ. And your daughter? All eyes widen in shock almost instantly. I have a daughter with MJ? Tom asked, bewildered. Peter nodded. Well, she's an artificial intelligence, but yeah. She called me daddy as soon as I started her up. It was so cute? He said, reminiscing about the good old days. I even made her a body with our DNA and had the dwarves of Nidaveller forge her some metal bones. She's pretty badass for a 10-year-old kid. No one knew what to say as they listened to Peter brag about overpowered daughter. Dr. Strange studied Peter intently, his voice steady but cautious. You may be skilled, Peter, but we'll need to assess the situation carefully. We can't take any risks, especially when it involves another version of you. Peter nodded, understanding the gravity of the situation. I get it, document safety first, right? But trust me, I'm not the one you should be worried about. He turned his gaze at Dr. Connors, the man transformed into the formidable lizard. He's not from this universe either. Dr. Strange, intrigued by Peter's observation, nodded and raised his hands, conjuring golden spell circles that hovered around Dr. Connors. The circles emitted a soft hum as they scanned the lizard's form, searching for any anomalies. After a few moments, the spell circles dissipated, and Dr. Strange's expression turned grave. You're right. There are traces of multiversal energy within him. He's not from this universe. Peter crossed his arms, his eyes darting between Dr. Strange and Tom. See? I told you there's something going on here. There could be others out there too. We need to figure out what happened. Someone must have messed up big time for all of this to occur, he said, knowing exactly what happened. Tom and Dr. Strange exchanged a silent glance, realizing the weight of the situation. Earlier that day, Tom had approached Strange seeking his help. The world now knew his secret identity, and he desperately wanted everyone to forget. Strange offered to perform a spell, but a combination of Peter's insistence and their mutual miscommunication had caused the spell to go awry. Taking a step forward, Peter Thomas Parker introduced himself rather awkwardly. Uh, hey. I'm Peter too, I guess, but you can call me Tom. It's my middle name. That way nobody gets confused, you know? After his awkward introduction, Tom and Strange explained their little mishap. Peter did his best to look shocked, a mixture of concern and realization playing out on his face. Do you think the spell is pulling everyone in the surrounding multiverse that knows Peter Parker is Spider-Man into this universe? He offered his knowledge to speed things along. Instantly, realization spread among the crowd. Even Doctor Strange seemed impressed with Peter's hypothesis. Of course, he only knew that because he watched the movie, but none of them needed to know that. So, Peter was the first to break the silence as he gestured towards Dr. Connors. Do you have a place to keep him? I really don't want to lug him around everywhere I go. <laughs> Strange thought for a moment before nodding his head. Yeah, follow me. The group followed him through the halls of the New York Sanctum, their footsteps echoing in the dimly lit corridors. The air was heavy with a sense of mysticism from the magical artifacts lining the walls, giving the place an eerie atmosphere. They descended a flight of stone stairs, and as they reached the bottom, the space opened up into an old cellar, which seemed to be used for storage these days. Welcome to the Undercroft, Strange announced. Don't touch anything. He exclaimed as Ned started fiddling with a pile of junk. Peter looked around, taking in the sight before him. The Undercroft was illuminated by a soft, ethereal glow emanating from old flicking light bulbs. The place was filled with dusty junk and forgotten artifacts, ancient relics of power that no longer had a place in the sanctum above. They exuded a sense of history and mystery, as if whispering tales of forgotten sorcery and long-lost secrets. But that wasn't all. 
The end of the room opened up into a dark cave, and embedded into the stone walls were prison cells. Nothing but a window of transparent glass and dense rock made up each cell, though Peter could feel the mystic energy in each of them. It would take someone like the Hulk or Thor to break out of these bad boys. As they approached the cells, Dr. Connors began to thrash like crazy, unwilling to be caged. In a matter of seconds, the lizard managed to snap the thick web and break free. With its primal instinct flaring, it lunged toward Peter, attempting to rip his throat out with its sharp, jagged teeth. Exclamation point. May, MJ, and Ned jumped in fright, cringing in horror as they expected to see something very gruesome. But thankfully, Peter's reflexes were far quicker than they could imagine, and he effortlessly sidestepped the attack, tossing the transformed scientist into one of the glass cells. With a frustrated growl, the lizard thrashed and banged against the glass, which it just phased through only seconds ago, desperately trying to escape. But sadly, for him, cell held firm, the magical barriers preventing any physical contact between the lizard and the outside world. The sound of impact reverberated through the undercroft, creating an unsettling noise of frustration and captivity. Peter watched the futile struggle, his expression firm. He knew that, for now, Dr. Connors would be contained within the confines of the cell, though if things go the same as the movie, then he'd be released soon enough. I don't think he'll be going anywhere, Peter stated, turning back to everyone else. But we need to find out what's going on and how to fix this. There's probably others like him out there as we speak, displaced from their own universes, he said as his gaze turned to Tom. Who knows, there could be other Peters out there too. Dr. Connors wondered what the hell was going on as he continued to thrash against his cell, slowly using his genius mind to put the puzzle pieces together. This isn't my universe, he thought as his gaze turned to the two Peters. And those certainly aren't my Spider-Man. The others nodded in agreement, their eyes reflecting the seriousness of the situation. Dr. Strange turned to face the group, his voice firm and resolute. We'll need to work together, gathering information and dash, before he could finish that sentence, everyone's phone suddenly went off, vibrating and chiming. Each member of the group pulled out their devices, their faces contorting with surprise and concern as they read the flood of notifications. Peter, being the odd one out without a phone from this universe, observed their reactions with curiosity. Ned's eyes widened, his voice trembling with urgency. Guys, look at this. There's a news report about some green elf flying around on a hoverboard. He's throwing grenades all over the city. Ha 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 ha. A shrill laughter could be heard from his phone. MJ's brow furrowed as she read another news report. And here's another one. It says there's a man with four mechanical squid arms running around, demanding Spider-Man appearance. Peter Parker. She played a video of said man throwing cars along the highway. Show yourself you traitorous coward. Dr. Strange's expression shifted from resolute to grim as he absorbed the information. It seems our troubles have multiplied. As the news alerts buzzed through the room, Peter's eyes narrowed in recognition. He turned to face the group, his voice laced with urgency. Guys, listen up. Those villains they're talking about are Green Goblin and Doc Ock. Obviously, they're from other universes, like me. Ned's jaw dropped, his voice barely a whisper. No way, you know their names? Peter nodded. Yeah, I haven't faced them in my universe since they don't exist, but they existed in the last universe I was in. Green Goblin should be Norman Osborn, a ruthless and highly intelligent adversary. He's got a glider that he rides on and uses bombs as his primary weapons. Be careful, he's a master of manipulation. MJ raised an eyebrow, her curiosity peaked. And what about Doc Ock? Peter continued his explanation. Dr. Otto Octavius, also known as Doc Ock, is a brilliant scientist. He uses four mechanical tentacles that he controls with his mind. They're incredibly strong and agile. His fighting style is ruthless, and he won't hesitate to use his tentacles to cause destruction. Tom's eyes widened, his voice full of determination. We can't let them hurt anyone else. We need to stop them. Peter nodded, his voice resolute. Exactly. We'll have to split up and take them down. Tom nodded, a determined look on his face. I'm ready. Let's get out there and put an end to this. Dr. Strange stepped forward, his expression stern. While you handle the immediate threat, I'll stay here and try to find a way to send everyone back to their respective universes and fix the damage caused by the spell? Peter glanced at Dr. Strange, gratitude in his eyes. Thanks, document. Dr. Strange nodded as he quickly left the undercroft, his focus shifting to the task at hand. Stay safe, both of you. Ned, MJ, and May exchanged worried glances, but Peter reassured them. You guys stay here in the sanctum. It's safer for now. Though if this was my universe, you could all just tag along. But sadly, you don't have any powers here. Instantly, their eyes widened in shock. We have powers in your universe? Ned asked, a genuinely shocked and odd look on his face. Peter nodded. Yeah, I gave you all power since I didn't want you to get hurt if I wasn't around. May and Ned are super soldiers and my lovely MJ has spider powers as well. She goes by the name Silk? He explains to the stunned crowd. How? Tom asks, knowing that doing something like that would be extremely difficult. Peter looked over at him and raised an eyebrow. You know, the majority of Peter Parkers out there are geniuses, right? If one of us is in a universe, it's almost impossible for us to be normal. Are you dumb in this universe? 
he asked. Tom's eyes widened. Ah, uh, no. I don't think so. He replied, scratching the back of his head awkwardly. He was always the top of his class. Even if he wasn't trying, Tom could easily reign supreme in his school. Good, then you should be able to enhance them later down the line if you want, Peter said with a shrug. Here's a hint to get you started. Steal from the bad guys. They always have the best toys. Are you telling him to become a thief? May asks in disbelief. Yeah, pretty much. Peter confirmed without an ounce of shame. Think of it like a video game. Loot your enemies as much as you can and you'll have an easier time. You know, when the Kree and Chitauri invaded my planet, we stole as many ships as we could. And now, the Avengers has a huge fleet of advanced spaceships that protect the planet. Stealing is just the best, trust me. No one had any arguments there, though they felt like they should. Anyway, we should get going. Peter says as everyone suddenly remembers the two villains. And after a few goodbyes, Peter opened a portal under his feet and disappeared, whilst Tom watched jealously. I should ask Strange to teach me magic. He muttered before running off. Tom swung through the city, his web-slinging skills on full display as he searched for Doc Ock. The destruction in the streets below was evident, and the panicked screams of innocent bystanders filled the air. As he neared the epicenter of the chaos, his heart raced with determination. Finally, he spotted the towering figure of Doc Ock, his mechanical tentacles wreaking havoc all around him. Buildings crumbled under the weight of his powerful strikes, and cars were flung through the air like toys. Tom landed on a nearby rooftop, his eyes fixed on his opponent. Insert picture of Dr. Octavius here, alright, Otto. Tom muttered under his breath, his voice filled with nervous energy. Let's see what you're made of. With a surge of adrenaline, Tom leaped off the rooftop, descending upon Doc Ock with a flurry of punches. But his blows were easily deflected by the mechanical arms, which moved with incredible speed and precision. Doc Ock's laughter filled the air as he effortlessly swatted Tom aside, sending him crashing into a nearby wall. Gasping for breath, Tom quickly regained his footing and sprang back into action. He shot his webs at Doc Ock, hoping to immobilize him, but the villain expertly dodged the sticky strands and retaliated with a powerful swipe from his tentacles. Tom barely managed to evade the attack, narrowly avoiding being impaled. You finally decided to show yourself, Peter. Doc Ock taunted, his voice dripping with contempt. It's time you paid for what you've done. Although he has no idea what his opponent was talking about, Tom was nonetheless undeterred. He pressed on, his mind racing for a strategy. He knew he couldn't match Doc Ock's strength head-on, but he had to find a weakness. He continued to dodge and weave through the chaos, using his agility and spider sense to anticipate Doc Ock's every move. However, with each passing moment, Tom grew wearier. Doc Ock's relentless assault took its toll, leaving him bruised and battered. The realization that he might not be able to stop this threat sank in, but he refused to give up. Doc Ock lunged forward, his tentacles striking at Tom with blinding speed. Tom managed to dodge a few, but one of the mechanical arms grazed his side, sending him sprawling across the pavement. Pain surged through his body, but he forced himself to stand. Gritting his teeth, Tom unleashed a series of acrobatic flips and kicks, aiming to disorient Doc Ock and create an opening. Yet, his attack seemed ineffective against the villain's mechanical fortress. With a swift motion, Doc Ock seized Tom's leg, hoisting him into the air. Tom struggled, desperately trying to break free, but Doc Ock's grip was unyielding. The world spun around him as he dangled helplessly, his breath coming in ragged gasps. Doc Ock sneered down at him, his victory seemingly assured. Just a boy playing dress up, Doc Ock mocked, tightening his grip. It's time to put an end to this. With adrenaline coursing through his veins, Tom refused to let Doc Ock's taunts break his spirit. Summoning every ounce of strength and determination, he twisted his body, contorting in mid-air to free himself from the villain's grip. With a swift kick, he propelled himself away from the mechanical arms, landing nimbly on the ground. As Doc Ock lunged forward, his tentacles striking out once more, Tom anticipated the attack. He dodged, ducked, and weaved through the onslaught, evading the metallic limbs with remarkable agility. With each movement, he analyzed the pattern of Doc Ock's strikes, searching for a vulnerability. Spotting a split-second opening, Tom leaped forward, launching himself off a nearby car. He flipped in mid-air, his foot connecting with the side of one of the mechanical arms, sending it spiraling off course. The impact jolted Doc Ock, momentarily throwing him off balance. Seizing the opportunity, Tom landed gracefully on the ground and darted forward. He delivered a series of lightning-fast punches and kicks, targeting the joints of the mechanical arms. The metallic limbs whirred and clanged as they absorbed the blows, but Tom's relentless assault began to take its toll. Doc Ock staggered backward, his control over the tentacles wavering. Sensing his opponent's vulnerability, Tom launched himself into the air, somersaulting over Doc Ock's head and landing behind him. He swiftly ensnared the villain's arms with his webs, immobilizing them and leaving Doc Ock defenseless. Now, it's time to end this, Tom declared, his voice filled with determination. As Doc Ock struggled against the webbing, Tom positioned himself strategically. With his enhanced senses, he was able to anticipate the villain's movements, sidestepping each desperate attempt to break free. Time seemed to slow down as Tom analyzed every detail, 
planning his next move with precision. As if in a dance, Tom weaved in and out, using his speed and agility to his advantage. He delivered a series of devastating blows, targeting vital pressure points on Doc Ock's body. With each strike, he could feel the villain's resistance weakening, the fight slowly ebbing out of him. With one final surge of strength, Tom unleashed a powerful punch, sending Doc Ock sprawling to the ground. The mechanical arms fell limp, their threat neutralized. The battle was over. Breathing heavily, Tom stood over his fallen opponent, triumph and relief washing over him. He had done it. He had defeated Doc Ock. Stay, down, Tom warned his unconscious opponent, his voice laced with a joking authority. You're not going anywhere. As Tom restrained Doc Ock with webbing, dragging him back to the sanctum. The chaos around them began to subside, the city slowly recovering from the devastation caused by their clash. The streets fell into an uneasy calm, the bystanders in awe of the young hero who had emerged victorious. Love him or hate him, they knew that Spider-Man would always do his best to protect the city and its people. And as he swung away with Doc Ock over his shoulder, a masked man in a similar red and blue spider-themed costume watched from atop a nearby building. Although he was hesitant on whether to show himself, he still followed after Tom from a distance, hoping to figure out what was going on. After dropping out of a portal, Peter swung through the city, following the trail of destruction left by Green Goblin. The sound of explosions and terrified screams echoed through the air, intensifying his determination to put an end to this chaos. As he turned a corner, he spotted Green Goblin soaring above, his glider leaving a trail of smoke and flames in its wake. Peter landed on a nearby rooftop, watching as Green Goblin continued his rampage. The goblin's laughter echoed through the streets, his malicious joy evident in every bomb he dropped. His menacing figure stood tall, draped in a tattered green and purple suit that bore the marks of numerous battles. A twisted grin adorned his face, accentuating the madness that flickered in his eyes. His hair, once a vibrant shade of brown, now disheveled and streaked with gray, added to his eerie and unpredictable aura. Insert picture of Green Goblin here, Peters casually waved, his voice laced rather calm for the situation. Yo! He called out, getting his opponent's attention. Green Goblin spotted Spider-Man and his grin widened. Ah, Spider-Man? Wait! You don't look like my Peter? He realized, as Peter's mask was still off. Not to mention the different style spider suit that he wore compared to most Spider-Men. Maybe you're just getting old, Osborne? Peter said as he took a seat at the edge of building. It might be time to schedule a doctor's appointment. You could have dementia? Let's see if I'm too old to remember how to do this. Green Goblin exclaimed as he tossed a handful of grenades down at the crowded street below. Haha. <laughs> he laughed, expecting Peter to dive down and save the poor innocent bystanders. Peter remained seated. Sorry to disappoint you, but... His voice trailed off as he waved his hand. Suddenly, a portal opened up below the grenades, which deposited them directly above Osborne's head. Huh? Boom! Green Goblin uttered just as the grenades surrounded his body, exploding in a fiery concussive blast. Instantly, cheers filled the whole area as the people below shouted their thanks. Even in the nearby buildings, people opened their windows and cheered Peter on, thinking he was the Spider-Man they knew. As the smoke cleared, without warning, Green Goblin launched forward, only slightly charred and battered from the explosion. Haha! <laughs> he laughed like a maniac as a barrage of pumpkin bombs flew towards Peter. But Peter's reflexes were unparalleled. He gracefully dodged each explosive with ease, barely breaking a sweat. His movements were fluid, his body seemingly one with the rhythm of the battle. Is that the best you've got? Peter taunted, his voice dripping with boredom. Before Osborne had the time to answer, he shot a web at one of the glider's wings, causing it to malfunction and spiral out of control. Green Goblin's eyes widened in shock as he struggled to regain control of his glider. You, you're stronger than I thought. Peter yawned dramatically. I face tougher opponents, Norman. You're just a schizo with nice toys. As Green Goblin tried to regain his composure, Peter closed the distance between them in a blink of an eye. He delivered a powerful punch, sending Green Goblin flying through the air. The villain crashed into a nearby building, his body leaving a dent in the brickwork. Peter walked calmly towards the fallen goblin, his voice dripping with authority. It's over, Norman. Surrender now, and I'll see about helping with that alter ego of yours. Although everything goes to shit in the movie because Tom wanted to help Norman and the other villains, Peter still agreed with the idea of curing them. The only problem came when he let them out of their cells. Why didn't he just keep them restrained while curing them? Peter wondered and instantly came to a conclusion. Because that would've made for a very boring movie, Green Goblin struggled to his feet, blood dripping from a cut on his forehead. He sneered, his voice laced with defiance. Never. I'll never surrender to the likes of you. Peter's expression remained unchanged, his voice unwavering. Fine. Have it your way. In one swift motion, Peter sprang forward, delivering a barrage of punches and kicks with incredible speed and precision. Each strike landed with devastating force, causing Green Goblin to stagger and groan in pain. The once-feared villain was reduced to a mere punching bag in Spider-Man's relentless assault. Through the flurry of blows, Peter maintained his calm demeanor. He moved effortlessly, evading Green Goblin's feeble attempts to counterattack. 
His web-slinging skills added an extra layer of finesse to his movements, enhancing his agility and ensuring that his attacks never missed their mark. As the fight reached its climax, Peter delivered a final punch that sent Green Goblin hurtling through the air, crashing into a parked car with a resounding thud. The villain lay motionless, defeated, and broken. Peter stood over Green Goblin, his expression unreadable. He looks almost peaceful when he's not smiling and laughing like a maniac. He swiftly webbed up the unconscious Green Goblin, before opening a portal and dragging him through, disappearing in front of a crowd of thankful New Yorkers. Peter strolled through his portal and appeared in the Sanctum's undercroft once again, dragging the unconscious and slightly charred form of the Green Goblin behind him. Smoke rose from Osborne's suit, evidence of the many grenades he had just endured. Ned, May, and MJ, who had been anxiously waiting, rushed forward to greet him. MJ eyed him in concern as she paced to Peter's side. Are you okay? What happened out there? She asked, her voice filled with worry. Though he could tell she was more worried about Tom than him, as her boyfriend hadn't returned yet. Ned, equally worried, followed closely behind. Dude, he looks like he's been through a war. Peter shrugged. He was pretty weak, but he just wouldn't give up, so. He gestured to Osborne's broken body. But don't worry, he'll be fine. Aunt May joined the group, her eyes widening when she saw the unconscious form of Norman Osborne. Peter, what happened to him? She asked, concern etched on her face. Peter gently lowered the green goblin to the ground and stepped back. He threw a bunch of grenades into a crowded street, so I delivered them back to him. Ned's eyes widened in awe. Cool. May looked down at Osborne's unmasked face in pity. Did you have to go so hard on him? It looks like he's in pain. Peter shrugged uncaringly. Well, it's hard to go easy when your opponent has what I call psycho energy. He just wouldn't give up, so I had to beat him down a bit more than usual. Seeing that May felt bad for normal, Peter waved his hand and cast two spells. One to disarm Osborne, depositing all of his weaponry and armor in the corner of the room, and then another, which healed his injuries to a certain extent. As the healing spell took effect, Osborne's wound slowly closed, and his breathing stabilized. He remained unconscious, his form now resting peacefully. Peter stood back, observing his handiwork. He'll be fully healed in an hour or two, he said, getting a relieved look from May as he deposited their second prisoner into his cell. Although she knew that she shouldn't feel bad for the maniac who was sweeping the city with bombs only moments ago, May just couldn't help it. She wasn't a hero who did this every day, so when she saw someone who's hurt and in pain, she feels the need to help. If only she knew that he would kill her. Peter sighed inwardly. Just then, Tom appeared, dragging their third captive down the stairs, making sure to bang his head on each and every step on the way down. Oops. Sorry. My bad. He apologized after every thud. Tom stepped into the light, his suit slightly torn, evidence of the intense battle he had just faced. May, Ned, and MJ rushed forward, their worried expressions turning into relieved smiles as they saw his return. May embraced Tom tightly, tears of relief welling up in her eyes. Oh, thank goodness you're back. Are you okay? Tom returned the hug, assuring her. I'm fine, May. Just a few scratches, but nothing serious. Ned patted Tom on the back, a wide grin on his face. Dude, are those his tentacles? He eyes Doc Ock's extra appendages. Tom chuckled. Yeah, cool right? MJ approached Tom, concern still etched on her face. Are you sure you're okay? It looks like you took quite a beating. Tom nodded, his gaze shifting to the unconscious form of Doc Ock. I'll be fine. He gestured to the webbed up villain. I managed to take him down, but he put up quite a fight. Peter, who had been watching the reunion, approached Tom. Nice job. You seem to have handled him well. Tom smiled proudly after hearing that. Thanks, man. It was tough, but he wasn't the hardest guys I faced. He immediately thought of Thanos' ugly purple face. Peter turned his attention to the webbed up Doc Ock. He waved his hand, casting the same spells he used on Green Goblin, disarming the villain and healing his injuries to a certain extent. Once the healing spell took effect, Doc Ock's wounds started to close, and his breathing steadied. Of course, he did the same for Tom, who was gratefully for the help. May looked at the unconscious Doc Ock with a mix of relief and concern. Will he be alright, Peter? Peter nodded, reassuring her. He'll be fully healed in no time. And don't worry, we'll keep an eye on him. As Peter prepared to throw Doc Ock into a cell, a figure descended down the stairs behind him. A man in a very familiar red and blue color scheme appeared, drawing everyone's attention. Taking off his mask to reveal the face of Andrew Garfield, he looked around, taking in the scene before greeting everyone with a warm smile. Hey, I hope you don't mind that I let myself in. Insert picture of Andrew Garfield Spider-Man here, Peter Andrew Parker descended down the stairs, his presence immediately capturing everyone's attention. He took off his mask, revealing his face, and greeted the group with a warm smile. Hey, I hope you don't mind that I let myself in. I'm Spider-Man, obviously. But my friends just call me Peter. Everyone, except Peter, stared at Andrew in shock, not expecting yet another Spider-Man to appear. How many Peters are out there? May muttered in disbelief. MJ's eyes narrowed suspiciously. Prove it, she said, crossing her arms. Prove that you're really Spider-Man. Andrew raised an eyebrow, slightly taken aback by the demand. 
Uh, how do you want me to do that? MJ grinned mischievously. Get on the ceiling. That's something only Spider-Man can do. Andrew chuckled, thinking she was joking. Come on, you're messing with me, right? But the expectant stares from the group made it clear that they were serious. Even Peter remained silent, as he found the idea rather amusing. Andrew sighed, realizing there was no way out of this. He shot a web at the ceiling and effortlessly hoisted himself up, hanging upside down. MJ nodded her head, a satisfied smirk forming on her lips. Not bad. Now crawl around. Andrew's eyes widened in surprise. Seriously? You want me to crawl on the ceiling? MJ nodded, her expression unyielding. Yep, do it. Andrew shook his head in disbelief but complied nonetheless. He crawled across the ceiling, his movement smooth and graceful, as if he had done it a thousand times before. He landed back on his feet, a smirk of triumph on his face. There you have it, Andrew said, a tiny hint of annoyance in his voice. Happy now? May approached Andrew, a warm smile on her face. Welcome to the team, Peter. Andrew chuckled. Thanks. But you can just call me by my middle name, Andrew. We've got enough Peters in the room already. Peter walked over and extended his hand. It's good to have you here. Andrew shook Peter's hand firmly. Likewise. This is definitely a unique situation we find ourselves in. Ned approached, a wide grin on his face. Dude, this is amazing. We're building a spider army. Andrew laughed, his eyes holding a hint of worry. Yeah, it looks like it. He couldn't help but wonder what could call for the assembly of so many Spider-Men. Seeing that everyone greeted the new arrival, Peter finally found the chance to ask something that's been on his mind. Uh, Andrew, I don't know how to ask this, so I'll just go ahead and spit it out. Is Gwen alive in your universe? Instantly, the room went silent as everyone wondered why Peter was asking such a question and who was Gwen. Wait, Andrew muttered as his eyes widened. Your voice sounds familiar, he uttered as realization began to set in. So it is you, Peter smirked. It's good to see you again, out of your body, of course, he clarified, which only furthered everyone's confusion. Can someone please explain what's going on? Ned asked what everyone else was thinking. Andrew was more than happy to explain, gesturing to Peter. This guy came to my universe and somehow took over my body dash MJ immediately interrupted him. And that's a good thing? She asked, eyeing Peter weirdly. I wasn't so sure at first, but after he helped me save my girlfriend's life and took down two very powerful bad guys, I couldn't really complain. Besides, he left once everything was taken care of, Andrew explained as he turned to Peter. Thank you. You have no idea how grateful I am for your help? No problem. Peter nodded his head. So, did you cure your friend or is he still, you know? Yeah, a complicated smile graced Andrew's lips. Harry is back to normal. Gwen even managed to cure his retroviral hyperplasia, so not only is he not a crazed goblin anymore, he'll also live a long and healthy life. I can see a but coming along somewhere in there. Peter guessed. He still hates me. Andrew revealed with a heavy sigh. We may have cured him, but he still blames me for a few things. His current imprisonment being one of them, well, that's life, I guess. Peter couldn't help but shrug. Sometimes people are shitty, no matter how much you try to help them, I guess. Andrew muttered in agreement. Pushing the sad stuff to the side, Peter continued. So, did you end up moving to London? He asked, knowing he planned to follow Gwen to her university. Yeah, Andrew nodded. It's actually a lot easier over there. Gun laws and all that. Don't get me wrong, they still have guns, but it's infinitely fewer than America. There are a lot of knives though. At this point, everyone was listening to Peter and Andrew catch up, still a bit surprised at the fact they knew each other. Especially Tom, who was beginning to feel a bit inferior to his other self. Peter seemed to be doing a far better job than him. From the few things he's heard, such as finding a way to give powers to his loved ones or his past multiverse travel, Tom just couldn't seem to stack up against him. And although he shouldn't mind, as everyone is different, Peter looked exactly like him, making their lives seem much closer in comparison. As he stared at his counterpart's back, Tom couldn't help but wonder, am I a good Spider-Man? A man in his early 20s slept in a puddle of garbage juice in a New York City alleyway. With short, messy blonde hair, his appearance would harbor a deceptive charm if not for his current predicament. Even his clothes were torn as if he had just gone through one hell of a fight, though his skin didn't hold a single blemish. Insert picture of Eddie Brock from Spider-Man 3 here, Eddie's eyes fluttered open, squinting against the harsh sunlight that filtered through the towering buildings. His head throbbed, and his body ached as he pushed himself up from the dirty concrete of the alleyway. Confusion clouded his mind as he tried to recall how he had ended up in this unfamiliar place. He shook his head, attempting to clear the fog that shrouded his thoughts, but the memories eluded him. The last thing I remember is? Eddie froze as he recalled the horrifying experience of exploding. I'm alive. He muttered in shock as he checked over his entire body, finding all of his appendages in the right place. Staggering to his feet, Eddie scanned his surroundings, taking in the bustling streets of New York City. The sights and sounds were familiar, yet strangely different. People hurried past him, seemingly uncaring or unaware of his presence. What the hell is going on? Eddie muttered to himself, his voice laced with frustration and annoyance. 
He reached up to rub his temples, only to find something amiss. His fingers grazed against the cold, smooth surface of the symbiote peeking out of his skin. Venom had somehow followed him, a twisted companion that seemed to thrive off his darkest desires. Insert picture of Venom here, the one from the Venom movies, hey! Watch where you're going, a passerby exclaimed, jolting Eddie out of his thoughts. He realized he had unconsciously walked in the middle of the sidewalk, lost in his own bewilderment. People cast him irritated glances before seeing the pitch-black monster with razor-sharp teeth attached to half of his face. Giving him fearful looks, they paced away, not willing to risk their lives. Eddie scowled, his eyes narrowing with an air of menace. That right? You better keep walking? Venom's voice echoed in his mind, the symbiote reveling in the fear of those around him, eyeing them like the tastiest food. Eyes, lungs, pancreas. So many snacks, so little time. Venom purred, amusement lacing its sinister tone. I'll find you someone to eat later? Ignoring the symbiote's hunger, Eddie focused on the task at hand. Finding his bearings and discovering the reason behind his odd predicament was at the top of his priorities right now. Stalking through the city streets, his predatory instincts guiding him towards the familiar scent of trouble, he soon found something interesting. As Eddie turned a corner, he stumbled upon a storefront with a large television screen displaying news headlines. Curiosity got the better of him, so he inched closer. The news anchor's voice blared from the screen, reporting on a recent event that had shaken the city. In a shocking turn of events, Peter Parker, our resident Spider-Man, has saved the day yet again. Eddie's heart skipped a beat as he heard the name. Peter Parker. The rival he had despised, the one who had always stolen his spotlight. After the new anchor spoke, videos of Peter and Tom defeating Green Goblin and Doc Ock played, though the public seemed to think they were the same person. And although Tom wore his mask, Peter didn't. What the? He muttered in disbelief. That's not Peter. Peter. Venom growled lowly, his voice barely audible amidst the chaos of the city. The realization hit both of them like a freight train. This wasn't their universe. Somehow, they had been thrust into a separate world, a place where Spider-Man was a known figure, and his own identity as Venom remained a hidden secret. A malicious grin tugged at the corners of Eddie's mouth, Venom reveling in the chaos that lay ahead. Oh, Eddie, my dear host? Venom hissed, its voice dripping with sadistic delight. We've hit the jackpot. Time to show this world what true terror looks like. As the conversation between Peter and Andrew continued, Andrew's attention was suddenly drawn to a figure lurking in the far corner of the room. Dr. Kurt Connors, also known as the Lizard, stood behind a thick pane of unbreakable glass, his eyes fixed on Andrew with a burning intensity. The memory of their past encounters flashed through Andrew's mind, and he couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. Ah, uh, guys, Andrew called out, diverting everyone's attention toward the imprisoned reptilian figure. Why is Dr. Connors here? And why is he, well, lizard-like, again? Tom, who had been silently observing the conversation, stepped closer to Andrew, his gaze fixed on the lizard. Again. In my universe, I cured him, Andrew replied, his confusion evident in his voice. I mean, I'm pretty sure I did. But this, this is like a step back. The group eyed the glass, their curiosity piqued by Andrew's words. The scaly creature paced restlessly behind the barrier, emitting low, rumbling growls that reverberated through the room. Peter examined the lizard, pretending to come up with an idea. Maybe the spell grabbed him further back in time? He let a bit of his movie knowledge out. Spell? Like a magic spell? Andrew asks as they haven't explained anything to him yet. Well, Tom quickly gives him a rundown on his and Doctor Strange's major mess up. Andrew nodded his head slowly, a mixture of shock and worry in his eyes. Right? So magic exists? He muttered as he walked up to Dr. Connors. Approaching the glass, the lizard's eyes fixed on him with a mix of anger and animosity. The reptilian creature hissed, its long, forked tongue flicking out menacingly. Dr. Connors, Andrew began, his voice calm yet filled with questions. Do you recognize me? It's Peter. Spider-Man. We've met before, and I gave you my father's research? The lizard's response was a guttural growl. Yes, but you forget the part where you stood in my way, traitor. If it wasn't for you, everyone in the city would know the joys of my transformation. Andrew's confusion deepened. I don't understand. We fixed you. We saved you. Why are you like this again? Suddenly, Peter stepped up. I think I have a way to confirm my hypothesis. He says as he turns to Dr. Connors. Can you tell me today's date? The cage doctor raised a reptilian eyebrow. March 23rd, 20 asterisk asterisk why? He asks in confusion. No reason. Peter says as he motions for everyone to follow him away from the cells. Am I right? He asked as they got out of hearing distance. Andrew nodded his head. Yeah, that was a while ago. He's from the past. He seemed even more shocked than when they explained magic. He ran a hand through his hair, processing the information. The lizard continued to snarl and thrash against the glass, annoyed that they left before explaining anything. So, what do we do now? Andrew asked, frustration seeping into his voice. Peter looked at his fellow Spider-Man, Andrew and Tom, as they stood together, contemplating their next move. The possible presence of more villains stirred up a sense of urgency and danger within the group, and it was clear that they needed a plan. Alright, 
Peter spoke up, his voice filled with certainty. We can't waste any more time. We need to start scouring the internet for any sightings of other villains that haven't shown themselves yet. Everyone nodded in agreement. They were ready to do whatever it took to protect themselves and the city. Ned, MJ, May, Peter addressed them, his tone serious. I need you three to dig deep into the web, search for any reports, rumors, or unusual activities that might be related to multiverse travelers. We can't let anyone slip through undetected. Ned, who had been the team's tech guru before, nodded enthusiastically. You got it. I'll get everyone set up, he said as he pulled a laptop from his backpack. MJ whipped out her phone, her eyes gleaming with determination. Consider it done. I'll check social media and find anything that could be relevant. May nodded, her expression filled with both concern and resolve. I'll make sure to keep an eye on local news and police scanners. If there's any sign of trouble, we'll know. With their roles assigned, the trio split off to fulfill their tasks, leaving the three Spider-Men alone once again. Now that we have eyes and ears on the ground, we need to cover as much territory as possible, Peter continued, his gaze shifting between Andrew and Tom. We'll split up and patrol the city individually. Tom raised his hand, as if her were at school. How do we communicate? Your phones won't work here. Come here. Peter walked up to his two counterparts and grabbed their masks. This should work. As soon as he touched them, golden etchings appeared for a brief moment before disappearing completely. Was that magic? One of us can do magic? Andrew exclaimed in shock. Yeah, jealous. Peter smirked, knowing they were both definitely envious of that. I made it so we can communicate through our masks. I'll leave something like this with Ned as well, so they can relay information to us. Andrew nodded, doing his best to hide the jealousy he was feeling. Sounds good to me. Tom adjusted his suit, a complicated look in his eyes, which didn't go unnoticed. I'll head out now. Remember, if you find something, call it out. Peter emphasized as Tom rushed off. We'll converge and take them down as a team. Andrew nodded in agreement before following after Tom with a worried look on his face. We'll see you out there. He called out as he and Tom disappeared up the steps. Andrew couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off with Tom. He had known him for less than an hour now, but he could still tell that something was wrong. Determined to find out the reason behind it, Andrew followed Tom as he made his way through the bustling streets of New York City. After a few blocks, Andrew finally caught up to Tom, who had paused in a brick building to catch his breath. Tom looked surprised to see him. Hey, Tom greeted him, trying to mask his earlier unease with a forced smile. Didn't expect to see you here. Andrew crossed his arms, his gaze fixed on Tom's troubled expression. Something's bothering you. And don't think I didn't notice. What's going on? Is it about this multiverse stuff? Tom sighed, his shoulders slumping. I guess I can't hide it very well. It's just, seeing Peter, my doppelganger, with all his confidence, accomplishments, and abilities, it's made me question myself. Andrew's eyebrows furrowed in confusion. What do you mean? Tom's voice dropped to a whisper. I've always felt like I was doing a good job, but as soon as Peter arrived, I realized that I'm struggling to measure up. I mean, I'm Spider-Man, but compared to Peter, I feel like a failure. He's got it all figured out, and here I am, just trying to get by. Andrew's heart went out to Tom as he listened to his every word. He placed a hand on Tom's shoulder, offering support. Listen, I get it. I've had my fair share of insecurities over the years, Andrew admitted, his voice filled with empathy. But we're all different versions of Spider-Man, each with our own unique strengths and weaknesses. Just because Peter seems to have it all together doesn't mean you're any less capable or important. Tom's eyes glistened with a mix of gratitude and vulnerability. You really think so? Andrew nodded, a reassuring smile gracing his lips. Absolutely. Besides, I doubt Peter's the perfect clone that you think he is. Everyone has problems and difficulties in life. And we're Spider-Men, after all. Adversity might as well be our middle name. Tom's shoulders relaxed, and a flicker of determination returned to his eyes. You're right. I can't let jealousy and doubt hold me back. Besides, just like you said, nobody's perfect, not even Peter. A slash N, you blind fools. My Spider-Man is a perfect god of all Spider-Men. He stands at the peak of all Parkers in existence. Your feeble minds couldn't begin to comprehend his mere presence. Ha 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 ha. Cough. Cough. Please excuse my outburst. Andrew grinned, clapping Tom on the back. Exactly. Now, let's go back out there and kick some ass. Tom chuckled, the tension lifting from his features. With renewed confidence and a strengthened bond, Andrew and Tom leaped off the building, ready to face whatever challenges awaited them. As they swung through the city, their shared determination and support for each other propelled them forward. Little did they know that their masks were transmitting that entire time. Peter was about to make Ned a communicator as well, but he stopped as he heard Andrew and Tom having what appeared to be a heartfelt conversation. And after listening to the whole thing, he didn't know how to feel. On one hand, he was happy that Tom had such a high opinion of him, but on the other hand, he felt bad for making him feel inferior. Our universes are pretty similar, so he could try to use some of my methods to catch up to me. Even if it's only a little bit, the question was would Peter be willing to share those methods? And sadly, for Tom, that answer was no. 
If Tom wasn't known as being a bit of a screw-up at times, then Peter might be willing to share some knowledge with him, but that just wasn't the case. Look at their current situation, for example. Although the blame could be equally placed on Dr. Strange's shoulders, that doesn't change the fact that Tom wanted to erase the entire world's mind just so he and his friends could go to the same school together. And he didn't even try to appeal his case with the school beforehand. He skipped straight to a worldwide mind wipe. Truly, he is a dumbass. A lovable dumbass, but a dumbass nonetheless. Sorry, kid. You'll have to figure it all out on your own. Though maybe I can drop some small hints and help him with stuff I know he can't screw up? After all, he is a nice guy. The three Spider-Men, Peter, Tom, and Andrew, swung through different parts of the city, watching for any odd villainous activity. Each of them ready and waiting for the next bout of chaos to begin. Tom, who only moments earlier found it impossible to concentrate, now felt much lighter, as if a weight was lifted from his shoulders. Venting his feelings seemed to have helped him keep his mind on the task at hand. Back at their base, Ned diligently monitored the communications while May and MJ worked alongside him, keeping an eye out for any signs of trouble. Suddenly, a surge of social media posts came through that caught their attention. Guys, I've got something, Ned announced, his voice filled with excitement. There's been a sighting of a man made of lightning. He was spotted near the electrical lines leading into the city. As soon as he said that, the lights all over the city began to flicker, catching everyone's attention. Peter, Tom, and Andrew quickly responded to the call, their instincts kicking into high gear. I don't think Dr. Connors is the only one who followed you here. Peter's voice transmitted to everyone. But you killed him? Andrew replied in disbelief. Well, sometimes the bad guys don't stay dead, Peter said as they all rushed to the location provided by Ned. Within minutes, Andrew was the first to arrive at the location, skidding to a stop on the side of an electrical tower. His eyes widened as he took in the scene below. Standing among the sparking electrical lines was a familiar figure bathed in crackling blue energy. Max, Andrew muttered under his breath, his voice tinged with both recognition and concern. You're alive. He had some doubts but those were long gone now. Andrew and Maxwell Dillon, also known as Electro, hailed from the same universe, where they had clashed multiple times. Though in the end, Peter ended up taking over Andrew's body and overloading Electro with massive amounts of electricity, killing him in a fiery explosion. Spider-Man. Electro smiled darkly in Andrew's direction. How good of you to join me? Before Andrew had a chance to react, the air crackled with electricity, and a bolt of lightning surged toward him. With reflexes honed by years of crime fighting, Andrew leaped out of the way, narrowly avoiding the electrifying attack. As the lightning fizzled out, Andrew landed on an adjacent tower, his mind racing. He had to find a way to stop Electro and prevent him from wreaking havoc on the city. Andrew's heart raced as he assessed the situation. Electro stood before him, crackling with raw power. The blue energy rushed into his body from the sparking power lines, illuminating his euphoric expression. Andrew knew he had to act quickly if he wanted to stand a chance against him. What's taking you guys so long? His transmitted to Peter and Tom. Little did he know that Peter had already arrived, taking a seat on a nearby tree to watch the show. I've already beat this guy, so I'll leave this one to you guys, Peter said as the sound of crunching popcorn could be heard. Are you seriously eating? At a time like this? Tom shouted, rushing to Andrew as fast as he could. No, Peter denied as the sound of soda being slurped through a straw filled their ears. Shaking his head in exasperation, Andrew lunged forward, his agility and speed on full display. He unleashed a series of acrobatic flips and spins, aiming to disorient Electro and catch him off guard. But Electro proved to be a formidable opponent, effortlessly evading Andrew's attacks with his electrifying speed. Bolts of lightning shot from Electro's fingertips, narrowly missing Andrew as he somersaulted through the air. The crackling energy scorched the ground beneath him, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. Andrew rolled and dodged, narrowly avoiding the deadly blasts. But with each passing moment, it became increasingly clear that Electro held the upper hand. The villain's power seemed to intensify as the battle raged on. The surrounding electrical lines hummed with energy, feeding Electro's strength. Andrew knew he had to come up with a plan, and fast. Gathering his resolve, Andrew focused on his web shooters. He shot a web line at one of the nearby towers and swung towards Electro with incredible speed. As he closed in, he delivered a powerful kick, aiming for Electro's chest. But the charged villain was ready, and he countered with a surge of electricity that sent Andrew crashing into ground. The impact rattled Andrew, but he refused to stay down. He pushed himself up, his muscles aching, and readied himself for the next attack. But before he could react, Electro sent a powerful shockwave through the ground, causing a web of lightning to ripple towards Andrew. Caught off guard, Andrew tried to evade, but the electricity found its mark. He cried out in pain as the shockwave coursed through his body, temporarily immobilizing him. The energy seemed to drain him, weakening his limbs and clouding his vision. I really should have worn my magnetized web shooters today. He regretted his choice in gear immediately. With a wicked smile, Electro advanced towards Andrew, ready to deliver the final blow. But just as he raised his hand to strike, a voice echoed through the night. Not so fast. Tom swung into the scene, 
clad in his Spider-Man suit, planting his boot across their electrified adversary's face, sending him flying across the clearing. You all right? Tom asked as he rushed over to Andrew's side. Andrew picked himself up off the ground. Yeah, I'll live, he said, taking a breath to steady himself. Can you keep him busy for me? You have a plan? Tom asked and received a nod in return. Then leave him to me. Just don't take too long, he said and rushed off towards their enemy. Andrew quickly analyzed some of the fallen electricity towers, assessing their structure and identifying the most suitable materials for his plan. He swiftly maneuvered through the debris, using his super strength to lift heavy metal beams and secure them together with his adhesive webbing. Meanwhile, Tom engaged Electro, who was more than surprised to see a second Spider-Man. How are there two of you? He asked as he discharged a flurry of electricity. Using his agility and acrobatics to dodge the villain's electrifying attacks, Tom landed powerful punches and kicks. Have you ever seen the movie Parent Trap? We're long-lost twins that were separated at birth. He joked, attempting to keep Electro occupied and divert his attention away from Andrew's plan. As Electro unleashed a torrent of lightning bolts towards Tom, the agile Spider-Man deftly weaved and dodged, narrowly avoiding the deadly blasts. Tom's quick reflexes allowed him to counterattack, delivering a flurry of blows to Electro's side. The two engaged in a spectacular display of combat prowess, their movements a blur of red and blue. Meanwhile, Andrew worked with precision and speed, his mind fully focused on his task. He connected the metal beams to form a sturdy framework, ensuring it would withstand the force of Electro's power. As he secured the final piece in place, Andrew's eyes caught sight of a fallen power line nearby. He swiftly grabbed the power line and held it against the framework. With his knowledge of electrical engineering, he carefully magnetized the metal construct, creating an electromagnetic field that would interfere with Electro's powers. It's done. Bring him over here. Andrew's voice echoed in Tom's ears. Back in the midst of the battle, Tom peeked over at Andrew and found him standing next to a larger metal box. Is that his plan? Although he doubted Andrew's plan, Tom skillfully did as he was told, using his web-slinging abilities to maneuver around the villain's attacks. He taunted Electro, luring him closer and goading him into unleashing his full power. Have you even touched me yet? I'm getting bored. Come on, show me what you've got. Tom shouted, his voice filled with confidence as he skillfully evaded each lightning blast. As Electro grew more enraged and desperate, his attacks became more erratic and unpredictable. With a final burst of electricity, he launched himself towards Tom, condensing his entire body into a huge bolt of lightning. But Tom had anticipated the move. He swiftly leaped to the side, narrowly avoiding the electrifying attack. And directly behind him stood Andrew, holding the door to his magnetized trap wide open. Instantly, Electro shot into the box, banging his head against its magnetized inner walls. Ugh! He grunted in pain and confusion as the door behind him slammed shut, locking into place. Scoffing at the shabby excuse for a trap, Electro's body surged with electricity, though his hopes were soon destroyed. The surrounding magnetic field disrupted Electro's control over his powers, causing the lightning to bounce back into his body, leaving the box completely unharmed. After a few more tries, Electro was enraged by his failure. Hey! Let me out! Peter! Peter! He screamed and banged metal. Appearing behind Tom and Andrew, Peter quickly vanished all of his snacks. Good job guys. I knew we could do it. He said as he clapped them on the shoulders. Turning to glare in his direction, both Tom and Andrew rolled their eyes in tandem. We. Lily Parker sat at the kitchen table, her small frame perched on a chair that seemed too big for her. A plate of pancakes was in front of her, half eaten, while her mother, MJ, sat across from her, sipping an iced coffee. Mom, can I have more juice? Lily asked, her brown eyes looking up at MJ. Of course, sweetie, MJ replied, getting up from her seat and walking towards the refrigerator. As MJ turned her back, Lily's attention was momentarily drawn to a bird perched on the windowsill. When she looked back, expecting her mother to be pouring juice into her cup, she found herself in an entirely different location, sitting outside on a park bench. Devoid of any signs of her mother's presence, momentary panic gripped her heart, but Lily's logical AI brain soon kicked in, calming her down immediately. Mom. Lily called out, but there was no response, only an eerie silence that hung in the morning air. Uncertain of what had just happened, Lily hopped off the bench, her bare feet landing on the cold concrete sidewalk. Lily looked around, her small figure standing alone in the middle of the quiet park. Her heart raced, and she shivered, a sense of unease settling over her. That's when she noticed movement out of the corner of her eye. Across the street, on a nearby building, she saw a figure dressed in a red and blue suit, masked and crouched low, peering out over the city. Though the suit was different from her father's, hope flickered within her. Could it be him? With a burst of courage, Lily sprinted across the street, her footsteps echoing through the empty morning air. As she approached, she called out, her voice filled with desperate anticipation, Dad! Dad! The figure turned, and watched in shock as a little girl leaped up more than 15 feet before crawling up the side of the building. Dad! Lily asked as she made it to top, eyeing the Spider-Man before her warily. It's you, right? Uh, the mysterious Spider-Man pointedly at himself. Are you talking to me? 
Instantly, Lily felt that there was something off with his voice and summoned her spider suit, which instantly covered her body. Take off your mask. She ordered, pointing her wrist in the man's direction. Whoa! The guys held his hands up and pulled off his mask. Don't shoot. I'm unarmed, okay? He said jokingly. Lily's heart sank as he removed his mask, revealing a face she did not recognize. It was an older man, his kind eyes filled with confusion and awe as he looked down at her. Insert picture of Toby Maguire Spider-Man here, I'm sorry, but I'm not your father, Toby said gently, his voice tinged with a familiar warmth. Lily's disappointment was palpable, but she couldn't help but be curious about the man in front of her. She looked up at him, her eyes showing a great amount of confusion. Do you know where we are? I was eating breakfast with my mom and just appeared in the park out of nowhere. Toby's eyes widener in recognition. That's what happened to me too. I was getting ready for work when. I just appeared here. I guess we're both not from around here, are we? But don't worry. We'll figure this out together. Okay. Lily nodded, not fully understanding the situation yet. Determined to help her, he offered. Hey, how about I take you back home? Do you know the address? Although he was almost positive that Lily wasn't from this universe, like him, Toby had to make sure of that before taking her along with him. After all, he didn't want to accidentally kidnap a lost child. Lily nodded, her trust in Toby growing. Okay, let's go, she said as she dived from the building and started swinging away. With a worried look on his face, Toby rushed off to follow her, ready to help the little girl should she make a mistake and fall. The wind rushed past them as they traveled effortlessly from one building to another. Toby marveled at the sights below, the bustling streets and towering skyscrapers. It was exhilarating, but also a stark reminder of how different this world was from his own. Meanwhile, Lily didn't seem to find anything wrong at all. This universe is very similar to her own, so the New York City around her was very familiar. After a few minutes of swinging, they arrived at a house. Lily landed gently on the front lawn, and Toby appeared beside her soon after, their eyes scanning the surroundings. This is it, Lily said, pointing at the house. But something's not right, Toby furrowed his brow, his gaze following Lily's finger. He looked at the house and noticed a for-sale sign planted on the front lawn. His heart sank, realizing what that meant. Toby looked down at her, a mix of concern and sympathy in his gaze. It looks like you're not from this world either? Lily's eyes widened in realization, her AI mind connecting to nearby Wi-Fi and cellular signals. In an instant, she scanned the internet, sorting through everything she needed to confirm her suspicion. We're in a parallel universe? Lily muttered, her voice quivering with uncertainty. Toby knelt down next to her, placing a comforting hand on her shoulder. I think so. But we'll find a way to help you get back to your parents, I promise. We're in this together. Ignoring Toby for the moment, Lily continued her foreign internet exploration. In mere moments she learned everything she needed to know. Thanos, the Snap, the Avengers, Wakanda, S.H.I.E.L.D., Hydra, her Uncle Tony's death, all of the major history of this world was laid out before her. Including the most recent events pertaining to Spider-Man's identity. He looks just like my dad. She thought. Though my dad wouldn't be dumb enough to reveal his identity. After parsing through everything, Lily finally arrived at the video of her father beating the shit out of the Green Goblin. And she knew it was her father this time since he wore the same old spider suit and everything. He even opened up a portal on video. My dad's here. Lily exclaimed cheerfully, surprising Toby. How do you know that? He asked in confusion. I'm an artificially intelligence. Lily explained the circumstances behind her birth as well as her abilities. Wow. Toby was both shocked and impressed. So your entire body is human besides your brain? And my bones. Those are metal but that's not really important. Lily shrugged. What is important is my dad is here. I saw a video of him fighting some gnome guy. We need to find him. He'll know how to get us home. Okay, do you know where he is? He asked. Uh, no. Lily admitted, her shoulders slumped. Okay, then I guess we have to find him the old-fashioned way. Toby gave her a confident smile, which seemed to be infectious as she couldn't help but smile in return. Almost an hour later, Toby and Lily swung through the city, their eyes scanning the streets below for any sign of Lily's father. The wind whipped through their hair as they leaped from building to building, their web-slinging skills guiding them effortlessly through the bustling metropolis. Lily turned to Toby, her eyes sparkling with anticipation. Do you think we'll find him soon? She asked, her voice filled with hope. Toby glanced back at her, a warm smile on his face. I hope so. We'll keep searching until we find him. With what little time they've spent together, Toby has started to realize that he's been missing out on something rather important. He never had any children. Lily's presence seemed to have awakened something in him. Ideas of starting a family began to swirl around in his head. Maybe his children would inherit his powers as well? Suddenly, Toby and Lily's spidey senses tingled, warning them that something was terribly wrong. Their ears perked up, the sound of chaos echoing in the distance. Sirens blared, and people screamed in terror. Following the noise, Toby and Lily arrived at a street corner where chaos reigned. Buildings were in ruins, cars overturned, and terrified civilians ran for cover. Standing amidst the destruction was a figure clad in a sleek black goo, 
its grotesque tendrils snaking out in every direction. Venom. Toby's eyes narrowed as he recognized the villain. Memories of his own encounter with the symbiote flooded back, reminding him of Eddie Brock, the man who jumped into a grenade and died alongside the symbiote of his universe. Stay behind me, Lily, Toby said firmly, shielding her with his body. That thing is dangerous? Lily nodded, fear and curiosity battling within her. She watched as Venom effortlessly dispatched anyone who crossed its path, devouring their bloody body parts with its ravenous appetite. What is that? Lily whispered, her voice filled with both fascination and horror. Before Toby could reply, Venom's head turned, its inky black eyes locking onto Toby's unmasked face. Peter. Is that you? It asked as it lunged towards them, its elongated jaws opening wide. Toby's instincts kicked into high gear as Venom lunged towards them, its monstrous form propelled by an otherworldly strength. With a surge of adrenaline, he sprang into action, his agility and experience propelling him forward. Duck, Lily. Toby shouted, pushing her down to the ground as Venom's claws slashed through the air where she had just been standing. Lily gasped, feeling the rush of wind above her as Toby's body twisted and spun, evading Venom's attacks with precision. Toby's fists flew, each strike aimed with expert precision. His blows landed with calculated force, but Venom proved to be a formidable opponent, its tendrils writhing and protecting its body. As Venom's tendrils extended towards Toby, Lily's determination surged. She couldn't let him face this threat alone. Rushing to the rescue, she fired multiple strands of webbing, aiming to ensnare Venom and restrain its movements. The symbiote hissed in fury as Lily's webbing coiled around it, restricting its ability to strike back. Toby took advantage of the distraction, launching himself into a series of acrobatic flips and kicks, targeting the exposed areas of the symbiote. Their coordinated efforts began to take a toll on Venom, forcing it to retreat momentarily. Toby seized the opportunity to check on Lily, his concern evident in his eyes. Lily, I told you to stay back. Are you alright? Lily nodded, her heart pounding in her chest. I'm fine. I couldn't just watch you fight alone. I want to help. Toby's gaze softened, though he was still apprehensive. You're very brave, Lily. But please, be careful. You're just a kid. As if to prove herself, Lily leaped into action again, her small frame agile and nimble. She unleashed a flurry of punches and kicks, her movements guided by a mix of instinct and the combat skills she had acquired through her artificial intelligence training. Venom retaliated with equal ferocity, its symbiotic form shifting and adapting to counter Lily's attacks. The battle raged on, the clash of fists and the crackle of webbing filling the air. And as Lily dodged a venomous strike from the symbiote, she noticed an opening and sent a powerful kick to its stomach, sending it skidding a few meters down the street. That hurt you little bitch. Venom spoke and for a brief moment, the darkness receded, revealing a pained face hidden within. Toby's eyes went wide as he saw who was under the black goo. Eddie Brock. Eddie's voice carried across the road, a hint of familiarity seeping through. Well, well, well. Peter Parker, we meet again. Even in another universe, I can't get away from your ugly face, Eddie. Peter whispered, his voice filled with a mix of astonishment and confusion. But, you die. Venom's dark form contorted, fully revealing Eddie's head. His eyes gleamed with a mix of malice and satisfaction. Have you been Pete? Any guilt left over from killing me? Or was I just another casualty in the grand life of Spider-Man? Peter stood in the dimly lit undercroft, the air light with the thrill of their most recent victory. The defeated villains were locked away in their cells, their presence a constant reminder of the battles that still lay ahead. He glanced around at his fellow Spider-Man, Tom and Andrew, who still seemed to be annoyed with him. Meh, they'll get over it. Peter shrugged uncaringly. Ned, MJ, and May stood nearby, their expressions a mix of relief and exhaustion. They have been doing nothing but scouring the internet all night, looking for any multiverse travelers. The capture of Electro had been a hard-fought victory, and they were all grateful for a moment of relaxation. The room buzzed with conversation, filled with tales of heroic feats and shared experiences. As the celebratory atmosphere continued around him, May approached, her face etched with concern. Wait, there's something you all need to see, she said, her voice urgent. Peter turned to face her, his eyes searching her face for answers. What is it, May? She quickly grabbed the remote and turned on the TV. A news report appeared, showing an angle of what appeared to a black, goo-like monster terrorizing the city, devouring innocent people. Venom? Peter was both confused and shocked. He's not supposed to be here. Scan the screen even further, Peter's eye widened as his heart pounding in his chest. There, amidst the chaos, fighting the notorious anti-hero slash villain, was his daughter, Lily. Is that? Peter whispered, his voice catching in his throat. My daughter. Your daughter? As Venom's taunting words hung in the air, a surge of determination filled Toby and Lily. They exchanged a knowing glance, a silent agreement passing between them. They had to protect each other, fight as a team, and defeat this monster before them together. With renewed focus, Toby launched himself at Venom, his movements fluid and precise. He weaved through the tendrils of the symbiote, delivering swift punches and kicks. Lily followed suit, her attacks calculated and strategic, utilizing her enhanced strength and agility. The battle unfolded with blinding speed. 
Toby swung gracefully through the air, dodging Venom's relentless assaults. Lily darted around, landing swift blows whenever she found an opening. Together, they formed an unstoppable force, each complementing the other's fighting style. As they fought, Toby couldn't help but marvel at Lily's tenacity and skill. For someone so young, she displayed an astonishing level of bravery and prowess. It reminded him of his own journey as Spider-Man, the countless battles he had fought to protect the innocent. Their combined efforts gradually wore down Venom, the symbiote struggling to keep up with their relentless assault. Toby seized an opportunity, launching a series of powerful strikes, exploiting the weaknesses he had learned from his previous encounters with the symbiote. Meanwhile, Lily took advantage of her smaller size, slipping through Venom's defenses and striking at its vulnerable spots. She aimed for the gaps between the tendrils, delivering precise blows that temporarily weakened the symbiote's hold on Eddie. The battle reached its climax as Toby and Lily executed a perfectly timed combination attack. Toby leaped into the air, spinning rapidly as he released a barrage of web projectiles. The webs encased Venom, ensnaring it in a cocoon-like prison. With Venom momentarily restrained, Lily felt an odd energy within her, her body glowing with a faint blue light, which was a surprise as that's never happened before. Putting her confusion to the side, for now, Lily focusing her newfound energy and unleashed a powerful blast from her small fist, aimed directly at Eddie's sludge-covered figure. The energy blast connected with explosive force, ripping through the webbing with ease. The impact shattered the nearby building, the debris raining down as Venom was blown off of Eddie's body and slithered into a nearby sewerage drain to escape capture. A slash N, I usually don't like letting defeated enemies run off, but I have an idea so just wait and see. As the dust settled, Eddie collapsed at the epicenter of the destruction. His eyes wide open in shock before swiftly fluttering shut, knocked out cold. Toby landed beside Lily after checking the drain, disappointed to find that Venom was already long gone. Good work, kid. I don't think that was a spider power, but it certainly came in handy, didn't it? Uh, yeah. Lily wasn't sure what it was either, but she knew someone who probably would. Suddenly, a familiar voice could be heard over Lily's left shoulder. Huh? Am I late? Lily's eyes widened as she turned find her father standing there, a golden portal at his back. Daddy, she cried out, rushing toward him, her face split into a happy and relieved smile. Peter caught Lily in his arms, holding her tightly. The relief in his eyes was palpable as he whispered, the daddies always seem to come out at times like this, huh? Lily nodded, tears of relief streaming down her face. I thought I was alone here. Peter walked up to Toby, who stared at Peter like a deer in headlights. Thanks for looking after my daughter. I owe you one. Toby nodded slowly, Peter's face bringing back memories of a rather unforgettable and traumatizing. It was my pleasure? He muttered in a daze. Every fiber of Toby's being was telling him to beat the shit out of the man in front of him, yet he held back, unsure of himself and unwilling to do such a thing in front of the guy's child. Peter nodded, noticing his counterpart's odd behavior. Is he the one? I mean, what are the odds that both Spider-Man that I've met are here? A slash N, 100%, peeking their heads out of the portal, Ned, MJ, May, Andrew, and Tom watched the heartwarming father and daughter reunion. Tom and MJ turned and stared at one another, picturing themselves with a daughter of their own. Seeing that the onlookers in the area were starting to pour into the street, Peter gestured to Eddie Brock's body. We should probably get going. Can you grab him for me? Without taking his eyes off of Peter, Toby grabbed his former co-worker and followed Peter and Lily through the portal. Is this a gateway? He asked as they stepped into the undercroft, the portal snapping shut behind them. And just when Toby thought he couldn't get any more surprises, Tom appeared before him, another suspect to the incident with his uncle. Maybe they just look like him? Peter gently set Lily down on the floor, listening to her grunt in discomfort, unhappy that they were separated. She can be too cute sometimes? As Peter turned to get Eddie into a cell, he noticed May and MJ approaching Lily with eager and curious looks on their faces. May's eyes sparkled with delight as she knelt down to Lily's level, her voice filled with warmth. Oh, look at you, sweetheart. Aren't you the cutest little spider girl I've ever seen? She may not have ever mentioned it, but May has always wanted a daughter, so knowing that her alternate self already had a cute little granddaughter made her very jealous. Eyeing Tom and MJ out of the corner of her eye, she hoped they would make her a little Lily as well. Maybe not so soon though. After all, they have college to worry about. Lily blinked in surprise, momentarily forgetting the parallel nature of this universe. She hesitated, trying to process the familiarity of May's face. Then it clicked in her mind, and she smiled back, but with a touch of confusion. You're not my grandma, are you? May's expression softened, and she exchanged a glance with Peter, her eyes conveying a mix of fondness and sadness. No, sweetheart, I'm not. But you can call me Aunt May if you'd like. Meanwhile, MJ couldn't contain her curiosity as she admired Lily's Spider-Girl suit. You look incredible. And those moves out there? Impressive. I wish I could do that. How old are you? You can in my universe. We go on patrol around the city together. Lily explained, feeling a surge of pride at MJ's praise. And I'm technically a year old, but this body is around 11 years old? She answered, confusing everyone. But before they could ask any questions, Lily glanced at Tom, 
then back at her father, and marveled at the uncanny resemblance between them. Dad, she called, pointing at Tom. He looks just like you, but short. Tom instantly deflated at her comment, which seemed to strike him like an arrow, perfectly hitting his weak spot. Peter chuckled as he tossed Eddie into a cell, ignoring the glares of the other resident inmates. That's because he is me, in a way. We're different versions of the same person. If I had to guess, I'd say that our universes are very close to each other. Toby followed after Peter, his eyes widening at the sight of Doc Ock and Green Goblin, who was still napping in his cell. Lily's eyes widened with wonder, her AI mind grappling with the concept of multiverse counterparts. Oh yeah. She exclaimed as if remembering something. Dad, do you know what this is? Concentrating on the same feeling she had during the fight with Venom, Lily's body began to glow in a blue energy. Peter looked at Lily, his head nodding up and down. Did you just unlock it? Do you remember what happened before? Anything unusual? Lily furrowed her brow, trying to recall the moments leading up to her newfound power. I? I think it happened when I was fighting Venom. It was like a surge of energy, like something awakening inside me, she explained, her voice filled with wonder. Peters nodded, happy for his daughter's progress. I know what it is, he said, his tone filled with excitement. Remember those metal bones of yours? They're not just for decoration, you know, May interjected, confusion evident on her face. Metal bones? What the hell does that mean? Peter turned to May, his gaze filled with understanding. Lily wasn't born the normal way. I made her through technology and magic. And her bones weren't an exception. They were forged in the heart of a star, he explained, his words bringing a hint of awe to the room. The dwarves of Nidaveller specially crafted each of them out of a mixture of URU and Vibranium. Tom eyes widened, a mix of surprise and admiration. Vibranium. He had no idea what URU was but Vibrabium was certainly impressive. Peter nodded, a proud smile on his face. Indeed. URU is the same metal that was used to make Thor's hammer, Mjolnir. It possesses incredible energy properties. Lily's bones are infused with that energy, allowing her to tap into its power. Lily looked down at her hands, her eyes shimmering with a mix of amazement. So, these powers, they come from my bones? Peter nodded, placing a hand on her shoulder. Basically, yeah. Remember when we watched Dragon Ball Z together? He asks, receiving a nod from her. Well, think of these powers like the energy manipulation from that show. Tom and MJ exchanged glances, their eyes reflecting a mixture of awe and concern. Did you specifically have the dwarves make her bones like that so your daughter could be a super scion? Tom asked pointedly. Peter looked away, unable to stare anyone in the eye. No. I would never do such a thing. While everyone was glaring at Peter with a healthy bit of skepticism, Lily stood to the side, cupping her hands together in a practiced motion. Hain. Hain. She recited as a small ball of blue energy appeared between her palms. Hey. Peter called out before she could go any further. No Kamehameha waves inside, he said, getting a nod of approval from the surrounding adults. If you want to practice, then go to the roof and shoot them up into the sky. Instantly, the surrounding adults looked at Peter as if her were crazy, losing faith in his parenting abilities. Okay. Lily nodded her little head and rushed off to the roof. Wait. Tom yelled as he chased after her. You need to watch out for planes and birds. After a day of searching for Venom and any other villains that may or may not be out there, everyone returned home for the night, tired from the constant manhunt they'd been on. May, being the lovable aunt she was, invited all of the Spider-Man and Lily to stay at her and Tom's apartment. It would be a tight fit, but she was dead set on housing them all for the remainder of their stay. Peter walked into the living room, his steps light as he just tucked Lily in bed. He found Tom, Toby, and Andrew sitting around the living room, chatting amongst themselves. Taking a seat, Peter let out a tired sigh. She really tired herself out, he said, his voice filled with amusement. Practice those energy blasts for a good few hours. Tom glanced at Peter, a smile playing at his lips. She's quite something, isn't she? It must be those Parker jeans, he said proudly, as if she were his daughter as well. Peter chuckled, a touch of pride in his voice. Yeah, she's amazing, isn't she? Toby, however, remained silent, his gaze fixed on the floor. The tension in the room grew, and Peter could sense Toby's unease. Taking a deep breath, he decided to address the elephant in the room. Toby, do you remember me? Peter asked, his voice gentle but carried the tiniest bit of amusement. Toby's head snapped up, surprise and confusion written across his face. He looked at Peter for a moment, his earlier doubts completely vanished. It's him. In a flash, Toby leaped out of his seat, his body tense and ready for a fight. His fists clenched at his sides as he launched himself at Peter, a punch aimed straight for his face. The blow connected, and Peter's head snapped to the side. I deserve that, Peter said, his voice calm as he touched his cheek, his eyes fixed on Toby. But you only get one. Toby, fueled by his anger and confusion, tried to go in for another attack, but this time, Peter wouldn't allow it. With quick reflexes, he caught Toby's fist mid-air, effortlessly halting his advance. A golden rope made of eldritch energy materialized, ensnaring Toby and pulling him back into the seat. Toby struggled against the restraints, his eyes filled with frustration. Let me go, damn it, he demanded, his voice laced with a mix of anger and confusion. 
Peter held Toby's gaze, his expression serious. It's just a little spell to keep you from doing anything rash. We need to talk. The tension in the room was palpable as Toby glared at Peter, his eyes narrowed. Andrew and Tom watched in silence, unsure of what was happening but ready to intervene if necessary. Peter leaned forward, his voice holding zero remorse. So, I take it you didn't believe my letter, da. Toby's eyes narrowed, disbelief flashing across his face. What? The part that said your Aunt May is hotter than mine or that you were sent by a genie to save my uncle. I forgot I wrote that. Peter smirked, holding back a fit of laughter. But both statements are true. He nodded matter-of-factly. Tom and Andrew stared at Peter in shock. What? Peter asked as he looked at Tom. Our maze are pretty hot. Especially compared to the granny in his world. Hey, Toby shouted angrily. My Aunt May is perfectly fine the way she is. He defended. Dude. Tom stared at Peter in shock. Not cool. I didn't need to hear that. She's like my mom. Peter scoffed. It's the truth. Deal with it. He shrugged uncaringly. My Aunt May is good too. Andrew muttered, feeling that his aunt was being left out of the argument. Who cares about this? Toby shouted as he continued to glare at Peter. You held a gun to the back of my uncle's head? He revealed, shocking Tom and Andrew. Peter's voice softened as he spoke, hoping to calm his counterpart down. I traveled to your universe to save your Uncle Ben. But I also had to teach you a lesson, the same lesson Uncle Ben's death would have taught you. It had to be done. I'm sorry for the way I did it, but I'm not sorry for the outcome. Toby's expression flickered between feelings of anger and acceptance. You, you were really pretending the whole time? Peter nods his head. Yeah, and as soon as you learned your lesson, I was taken out of your universe. Your mission was actually easy compared to his. He motioned to Andrew. What? Did you try and kill his family too? Toby asks, still annoyed by the whole situation. No, he. Andrew went on to explain what happened. As everyone seemed to calm down, Peter eventually released Toby and the four Spider-Man got to talking about the differences in their lives. So, do you have a girlfriend or what? Peter asked Toby, knowing that his love life was really weird in the movies. He already knew that Tom had MJ and Andrew had Gwen, so he was curious if his interference helped Toby with his love problems or not. Ah, uh, it's complicated. Toby answered awkwardly. Peter leaned back in his seat expectantly. Well, explain and maybe the Council of Spider-Men can give you some advice, he offered as the others nodded in agreement. You do know that I'm older than all of you by like 10 to 15 years, right? He stated, feeling odd about taking advice from those younger than him. Well, at least we aren't maidenless. Peter quips, deflating Toby's ego in an instant. Now explain, old man. You don't have to say anything if you don't want to, Andrew says understandingly. No, it's fine. Toby shakes his head. He might be right. Your opinions could be helpful. It all started with dash wait. Peter called out as he rushed to the kitchen and came back with arms full of snacks. You may begin, he says as he kicks back and munches on a bag of chips. Letting out an annoyed sigh, Toby began his tale of love and heartbreak. When I was a kid, I met this girl named Mary Jane. Wow, even in real life I'm not a fan of Toby's love interest. Peter thought to himself and based on everyone else's expressions, he wasn't the only one with that opinion. Basically, Toby loved this girl since she moved into the house next door from him. Even when she started dating his bully Flash Thompson, which was a bit messed up since Flash would physically bully Toby almost all the time, he still loved her. Thankfully, the two ended breaking up, but she then ended up dating Toby's rich friend, Harry Osborne. Of course, that name brought up some unresolved feelings in Andrew, but this story wasn't about him. While dating Harry she basically cheats on him when kissing Toby, who was disguised as Spider-Man at the time. Then later on, she gets mad at Toby for not showing up to the play she was staring in even though she told him she's getting married to someone else, knowing full well that she's the love of his life. And finally, when she finds out he's Spider-Man, out of complete nowhere, she wants nothing more than to spend the rest of her life with Toby, abandoning her fiancé at the wedding, who happened to be J. Jonah Jameson's son by the way, like what the actual hell. And when MJ and Toby are finally together, she kisses Harry behind his back, who later died while helping fight off some villains, which has now messed up their relationship even more. Wow, that was the most screwed up love story I've heard in a very long time, Peter commented as Tom and Andrew nod along with his words. I told you it was complicated, Toby reiterates with a depressed sigh. Tom was the first to speak up, his voice filled with sympathy. Man, that sounds really rough. It seems like she was never truly interested in you as a person. It's like she was always looking for someone with a higher status or some sort of benefit. You deserve better. Andrew nodded in agreement. Yeah, it sounds like she was just aiming higher and higher. Flash, captain of the football team. Harry, popular billionaire son. J. Jonah Jameson Jr., another billionaire son, who also happened to be a famous astronaut. Then you, a real-life superhero. It's like she's climbing the ladder, one guy, schlong, at a time. I think it's time to move on. A slash N, can you tell that I hate the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man's MJ? Because I really do. The writers really messed up her character, in my opinion. Peter chimed in, munching on his chips between words. 
Honestly, mate, I think you dodged a bullet there. She seems like she's got some serious issues. You should find a girl who doesn't know your Spider-Man and only tell her after your relationship is solid. After all, the hoes love the red and blue, don't they? He said with a smirk. Everyone rolled their eyes, faint smiles tugging at their lips. They knew he wasn't wrong, but they refused to acknowledge it. Toby sighed, running a hand through his hair. You guys are right. I've held onto these feelings for so long, hoping things would get better. But it's time to let go. I've spent too much time dwelling on MJ when there's a whole world of possibilities out there. Peter nodded his head. Yeah, that's the spirit. Maybe sleep around a bit too. There's nothing wrong with being a bit of a man whore while you're single. We do have the stamina. Please don't talk about that. Tom groans as he averts his eyes away from the group. Wait a minute. Peter realizes something. Please don't tell me you're still a virgin. Instantly, all eyes turn to Tom, who reddened and refused to look any of them in the eye. Oh my god. Peter muttered in shock. We need to fix this. The living room was filled with a mix of amusement and disbelief as the Spider-Men stared at Tom, their expressions a mixture of shock and amusement. Well, except Toby, who never had sex in high school or college, for that matter. Tom shifted uncomfortably in his seat, his face turning several shades of red. His only solace in the situation was Toby, though that was nothing to be proud of. Peter couldn't resist the opportunity to tease his fellow Spider-Man. You mean to tell me that you haven't had a chance to, you know, glaze the donut? He asked and received confused looks all around. Oh, come on. Bump uglies, horizontal tango, conquer the pink fortress, two-person push-ups, assault with a friendly weapon, a bit of the old in and out, bedroom rodeo, hot yoga, parallel parking, bow chicka wow wow dash Tom interrupter Peter before he could continue, his embarrassment turning into annoyance. Yes, I get it. I'm a late bloomer or whatever you want to call it. Can we please move on? Peter smirked, enjoying this very much. And although Toby and Andrew wouldn't admit it, they were getting a kick out of this whole situation as well. Peter sat back and kicked his feet up. We can't have this. Spider-Man, the heartthrob of the multiverse, has yet to embark on the journey of passion. He couldn't help but exaggerate his words for effect, much to Tom's dismay. Andrew leaned in, a twinkle of amusement in his eye. Don't worry, mate. We're here to guide you through this delicate and beautiful process. Consider us your wise mentors on the subject of knocking boots, Tom groaned. Please. No more innuendos. I can't take any more. Toby nodded in agreement, his eyes drifting off into the distance. I remember when Uncle Ben gave me the talk. I hated every second of it, but it did help. So maybe we should do the same. He offered, seemingly the only one of them that was willing to help out of the goodness of his heart. Tom's face contorted into a mix of horror and annoyance. You guys seriously enjoy tormenting me, don't you? Peter shrugged, a mischievous grin on his face. It's all in good fun. Consider this an initiation into the Brotherhood of Spider-Men. Plus, it's high time you had a proper understanding of these matters. With a resigned sigh, Tom leaned back in his seat, bracing himself for the inevitable onslaught of information. All right, Andrew began, adopting a mock serious tone. Let's start with the basics. You see, when a man and a woman, or any two consenting individuals, for that matter, really love each other. Peter chimed in, unable to resist the opportunity to add a playful jab. Or when they just want to have a good time, or in some cases, when they're bitten by a radioactive spider. Andrew, still grinning, continued the explanation. They engage in an act known as sexual intercourse, or simply put, shaboinking. It's a physical expression of love, desire, or just fun. Tom rubbed his temples, clearly exasperated. I'm well aware of what shaboinking is, guys. I'm not completely clueless. Peter raised an eyebrow. Oh, really? Then perhaps you'd like to enlighten us with your vast knowledge and experience. Tom sighed, realizing he couldn't escape. Fine, continue. Just get it over with. Peter pretended to clear his throat dramatically, assuming the role of a professor. Now, there are certain physical aspects to consider during the act. Shall we discuss the male and female anatomy in intricate detail? Tom's eyes widened, his face growing redder by the second. No. Please, spare me. I'll do anything. Toby chimed in, a serious look on his face. Oh, come on. You can't back out now. It's essential, after all. Reluctantly, Tom gestured for them to continue, albeit with a pained expression. Please kill me now. After over an hour of explanations, diagrams, and even videos, Tom knew far more than he needed to know about sexual intercourse, his eyes dim and lifeless as if he survived some sort of horrific event. Peter cleared his throat, holding a notepad in his hand. All right, it's time for a little quiz. We need to make sure you've been paying attention during our lessons. Are you ready? Tom sighed deeply, his shoulders slumping. As ready as I'll ever be, I guess. Peter grinned mischievously. Excellent. Let's begin. Question number one. What is the main purpose of using protection during sexual intercourse? Tom shifted uncomfortably in his seat. Um, to prevent unwanted pregnancies and protect against sexually transmitted infections. Correct, Peter acknowledged, jotting down a checkmark in his notebook. Moving on. Question 2. What are the effective forms of birth control, other than condoms? 
Tom hesitated for a moment, then reluctantly answered, the pill, abstinence, pulling out, through its not very effective, IUD. The more he listed, the brighter shade of red his face became. Peter nodded approvingly. That's right. No risk, no worries. Now let's take it up a notch, can you explain the concept of safe words? Tom's eyes widened, a mixture of embarrassment and panic washing over him. Ah, uh, well, it's a word or phrase that partners use during, intimate moments, to signal when they want to stop or when something is uncomfortable. Good, Peter said as he conjured a huge image of a coochie. Now, for the final question, can you point out the clitoris in this image? Tom took a deep breath, his cheeks still red. H here, he shakily points it out. Before anyone could respond, the sound of a door creaking open caught their attention. Aunt May stepped into the living room, clad in some rather revealing pajamas. Instantly, her eyes widening at what she found. What in the world are you boys doing? She asked, her eyes firmly placed on the image floating above Peter's outstretched hand. Tom hopped out of his seat and stammered, trying to find the right words. Aunt May, I, it's not what it looks like, I swear. We were just, uh. Aunt May shook her head, not fully comprehending the situation in her groggy state. She made her way to the kitchen, grabbing a bottle of water. I don't need to know the details. Just, keep it down. I'm too tired for, whatever this is. As the other Spider-Men chuckled awkwardly, Aunt May walked back past them, taking a sip from her water bottle. She gave them all a tired smile and headed back to her room, leaving the young Spider-Man to his awkward predicament. Once she was gone, Tom let out a breath he didn't realize he had been holding. He glanced at the other Spider-Men, who were trying their best not to burst into laughter. Peter stood up and reached his arm around Tom's shoulders. And that is why we have the hottest Aunt May in the multiverse? Tom groaned, burying his face in his hands. Can this night get any worse? Tom sighed, knowing that he would never live this down. But deep down, he couldn't help but appreciate the support and camaraderie he had found, even if it meant enduring some embarrassing moments along the way. As the sun began to set, Venom emerged from the sewers, his dark form pulsating with malevolence as he took in the surroundings. His eyes scanned the street, filled with disdain and hunger for his next meal. And that's when he spotted Flash Thompson, boasting about his fictional friendship with Spider-Man to a group of disinterested girls. Flash, wearing his typical self-assured smirk, leaned casually against the wall, regaling the girls with tales of his heroic escapades. Yeah, you know, Spidey and I are tight. We go way back. Saved the city together countless times. The girls exchanged skeptical glances and rolled their eyes, clearly unimpressed by Flash's attempts to impress them. They turned to leave, ignoring Flash's protests, as he desperately tried to salvage his ego. But the symbiote, hidden within the darkness, was captivated by Flash's words. Venom needed a new host, and someone who could bring him closer to Spider-Man was certainly appealing. So here, in front of him, was a golden opportunity. As the girls walked away, Flash's bravado deflated, his shoulders slumping in disappointment. That's when Venom made his move. In a swift and fluid motion, the symbiote extended its tendrils, wrapping around Flash's body and covering him in its inky darkness. Flash gasped in shock and fear, his eyes widening as the alien substance enveloped him. He tried to scream for help, but his voice was muffled, choked by the symbiote's grip. Venom tightened his hold, draining him of his strength and will, taking full control of his new host. The transformation was swift and brutal. The symbiote molded itself into a new form, melding with Flash's body and disappearing beneath his skin. Venom now wore Flash's body like a suit, his once cocky demeanor replaced with a sinister and predatory aura. Venom's eyes glowed with an otherworldly light, relishing in the surge of strength from his connection to a host, a vessel to fulfill his twisted desires. And with Flash's knowledge of Peter Parker, Venom saw an opportunity to finally confront his first host. Venom's voice, a chilling blend of Flash's and the symbiote's hissing tone, echoed through the deserted street. Spider-Man, your best friend Flash is here to play. And with that, Venom leaped into the air, his symbiotic tendrils propelling him forward, as he disappeared into the night, with a bewildered and terrified Flash Thompson, trapped within the confines of his own body. Playing on his phone whilst Toby and Andrew were sleeping on the couch, Peter noticed a figure slip out of Tom's bedroom window and begin climbing up to the rooftop. Curiosity peaked, he followed the mysterious figure and found Tom sitting on the edge of the roof, his gaze fixed on the sprawling city below. Peter took a seat beside him, the cool night air washing over them. Couldn't sleep? He asked, his voice soft. Tom shook his head, his eyes still focused on the distant lights. No, just, can't seem to calm my mind lately. Too many thoughts racing around. Peter nodded understandingly. I know the feeling. My mind is always buzzing with responsibilities and missions back home. It's hard to find the time to sleep sometimes. Tom turned to look at Peter, his eyes filled with a mixture of curiosity and admiration. You mentioned earlier that you're in the Avengers. How is that even possible? We're around the same age, and you're already allowed to join. They still won't accept me as an actual member. I'm too young, or so they say. Peter chuckled, a touch of self-deprecation in his voice. Well, they don't know my identity or age, and it's not as glamorous as it sounds. I spend most of my time doing the work that others don't want to do. 
Fury tends to do his job, which is great, but Tony and the rest of the council leave all their work for me. I mean, I still have a lot of fun, but there are times when it's overwhelming. I still feel that I've been lucky though. Suddenly, Tom's eyes go wide in shock. Mr. Stark is alive in your universe? He could still remember the day Tony died. It was the worst day of his life. Peter nodded, a sympathetic look in his eyes. Yeah, Thanos hasn't come yet in my world. Though I have met him a few times. What? Tom shouted, his shock only growing. W N H how? Peter smirked, finding the look in Tom's eyes amusing. Well, first Thanos sent Ronan the Destroyer to invade Earth, so we him and his army and stole their ships. I was able to speak to him through Ronan's flagship. And the last time I saw him, I tricked the big purple idiot into ingesting a pretty powerful poison. So, either he's dead, or one of his subordinates found a way to help him. Tom's awe-filled expression slowly transformed into one of vulnerability. I can't help but feel, inadequate compared to you. I mean, come on. Thanos? Really? Ever since you arrived, I've been struggling with this overwhelming sense of insecurity. You seem to have everything under control, while I've just been stumbling through life." Peter placed a hand on Tom's shoulder, offering a reassuring squeeze. I get it, believe me. But here's the thing. No matter how much you compare yourself to others, there will always be someone who seems better or more accomplished. But that doesn't mean you can't strive to better yourself. And if you want, I can help you with that. Tom looked at him, surprise evident in his eyes. You'd, help me? But why? Peter smiled warmly. Because we're in this together. We may be from different universes, but we're still Spider-Men. And part of being Spider-Man is helping others, lifting them up when they're down. So, if you want, I can train you while I'm here, and teach you some of my tricks. But I won't go easy on you. It'll be tough, but it'll make you better." Tom considered Peter's offer, his mind weighing the potential benefits against the challenges that lay ahead. After a moment, he nodded, determination shining in his eyes. Okay. Let's do it. I want to be better. Peter grinned, an air of excitement in his voice. That's the spirit. I'll work you to the bone and turn you into a respectable Spider-Man. You'll see, by the time I leave, there'll be a big difference." Tom leaned back, a newfound sense of hope replacing his earlier doubts. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm actually looking forward to the tough training. Let's do this. Peter clapped him on the back, his warm smile morphing into an evil smirk. Great. Because we're starting now, he revealed, enjoying the reluctant look on Tom's face. But, I haven't slept yet. Tom complains tiredly. Meh, you don't need sleep. Peter shrugged him off. Besides, you're excited for training, right? He says, a dangerous look in his eyes. Why yeah? Tom mutters, too afraid to refuse. Peter smirked. Good, now come here. He said, walking over to the center of the rooftop. They still had some hours before the sun would begin to rise, and even then Peter would still force Tom to train until breakfast. Standing on a secluded rooftop, Peter waved his hand, reinforcing the area with a simple spell. That should stop us from bother anyone or destroying the building. Tom rubbed his hands together, feeling a mix of excitement and trepidation coursing through his veins. He had agreed to Peter's offer, but he hadn't expected it to start so soon. Peter grinned mischievously. All right, Tom. First things first, we're going to work on your strength. Trust me, it's going to be tough, but it'll be worth it. Tom looked at him weirdly. Aren't I already strong enough? He asked. Hm. Peter answered without any delay. Come here and punch me as hard as you can. Ah, uh, are you sure? Tom asked, hesitant to hurt his new friend. Yeah, just do it. Peter said, motioning for him to come forward. Okay. Tom reluctantly walk up to him and winds his fist back before throwing it forward, aiming directly at Peter's face. Standing casually, as if a super-powered fist wasn't hurling at his face, Peter simply held his pointer finger up, stopping the attack on its tracks with ease. Hmm, that's not so bad. But it certainly wasn't impressive either. Huh? Tom grunted in complete and utter shock. Why you, how did you do that? He couldn't believe what just happened. Strength. Peter answered simply. Before Tom could fully compute what just happened, Peter held up his hand, snapping his fingers. Instantly, Tom felt a heavy pressure pressing down on him, as if gravity had multiplied a hundredfold. His knees buckled under the intense weight, and he collapsed face first onto the ground. Whoa! Tom exclaimed, struggling to push himself up. What the ugh? How did you do that? Peter chuckled, pulling out his phone and taking a seat back on the edge of the building. Consider this a light start. We'll begin with extreme weight training. The increased gravity will push your body to its limits, helping you build up strength faster. Tom groaned, his voice muffled as he lifted his head off the ground. Are you serious? Do you think I'm Goku? This is insane. Peter shrugged, his attention focused on his game. Welcome to my world. Now, while you're down there, I want you to do 1000 push-ups. It's all about building those muscles. Tom's eyes widened in disbelief. 1000? Are you out of your mind? Peter smirked, not even bothering to look up from his game. Nah, just trying to make you the best version of yourself. Well, the second best because, you know. He motions to himself. But second place is still good. Now get to it. Or else I'll double the gravity. 
he says dangerously. Tom grumbled under his breath, pushing himself up into a plank position. The weight of the increased gravity made it feel like every muscle in his body was on fire. He began the grueling task of performing push-up after push-up, his arms shaking with effort. As Tom struggled, Peter continued to play his game, occasionally glancing up to check on his progress. The minutes turned into hours as the sun began to rise, and the city below came alive with the hustle and bustle of daily life. Tom's arms quivered with fatigue, his breath coming in ragged gasps. He this. Tom managed to choke out between push-ups, this is, torture. Peter finally tore his eyes away from his phone and looked at Tom, a mischievous grin spreading across his face. Pain is temporary. But the results? They'll last forever. You want to become stronger, right? Tom nodded, determination flaring in his eyes. Yeah, I do. Then keep pushing, Peter urged. The pain will make you stronger. Embrace it. Besides, I'm sure MJ will like the results. I've caught my MJ groping my muscles while I sleep more times than I can count. She may not seem like it, but MJ is a little freak. Let me tell you Dash no. Tom shouted, straining against the gravity to cover his ears. I don't want to know what you do with your MJ. I'd rather die. Fine, suit yourself. Peter shrugged and returned to his game. But if I see you slacking off? He said, threateningly. Tom took a deep breath, mustering every ounce of willpower he had left. With a renewed sense of determination, he continued his push-ups, each repetition becoming a testament to his resilience. Time seemed to stretch on endlessly, but eventually, Tom completed his thousandth push-up, his muscles quivering with exhaustion. He collapsed onto the ground, gasping for breath, his chest heaving. Peter finally put his phone away and walked over, an impressed look on his face. Good job. You pushed through the pain and finished faster than I expected. Tom managed a weak smile, a mixture of fatigue and satisfaction evident on his face. Thanks, I never thought I could do it. No problem, Peter was happy for him, but this wasn't the end. But now that we're done with the warm-up, we can finally start your real training. He said, shocking his new student. W what? The poor guy uttered as Peter snapped his fingers again, increasing the gravity until Tom smacked into the floor once again. Ugh. Peter smirked sadistically, finding his job as a teacher rather enjoyable. Now, stand up and do 500 hundred jumping jacks and once you're done with that I want another thousand sit-ups. And once you're done with that? He listed off all sorts of exercises, watching the hope drain from his students' youthful eyes. I think I made a horrible mistake. Tom could barely catch his breath as he lay sprawled out in the center of the rooftop, drenched in sweat. Every muscle in his body ached, and he could feel the soreness settling in already. He gasped for air, his chest rising and falling rapidly. Suddenly, the door to the roof opened and Aunt May appeared, rushing over to her nephew's side as soon as she saw him, concern etched on her face. What happened? Are you okay? Tom managed a weak smile, his voice strained. I'm, fine, May. Just, training with Peter. May's eyes darted to Peter, her expression a mix of worry and accusation. What have you been doing to him? He looks exhausted. Peter stood up, stashing away his phone. He ran a hand through his hair and approached May with a reassuring smile. He wanted to get stronger, so I offered to help him. Sorry, but I don't tend to go easy on my students. May's gaze softened slightly, but worry still lingered in her eyes. But does the training have to be so intense? He looks like he ran a hundred marathons in a single day. Peter shook his head. You forget that we could easily run a hundred marathons. Our powers make it hard to gain strength through exercise. We can't just take a trip to the local gym four times a week. Tom needs extremely harsh training to see any real results. May's worry transformed into understanding, and she sighed, nodding reluctantly. I suppose you have a point. Just promise me you'll be careful with him. Peter nodded his head. I promise. I won't push him farther than he can handle. As if on cue, Lily, Peter's cute little AI daughter, rushed up to the rooftop, her face bright with excitement. Dad, breakfast is ready. We made pancakes. Peter's attention shifted to Lily, a warm smile forming on his face. Thanks, sweetie. We'll be right down. He then turned his attention back to Tom. Come on, buddy. You've earned a well-deserved breakfast. Breakfast. Tom's eyes widened at the mention of food, and he mustered the energy to sit up. I could eat a horse right now. Peter chuckled and reached out a hand to help Tom to his feet. Well, we'll have to settle for pancakes. But first, let me clean you up. With a quick flick of his fingers, Peter cast a spell, and instantly Tom's entire body, including his sweat-soaked clothes, was clean and dry. Smelling like fresh lavender, he looked down at himself in surprise before giving Peter a grateful nod. Together, they made their way back to the apartment, where Toby and Andrew were waiting at the dining table, a spread of delicious breakfast foods laid out before them. The aroma filled the air, making Tom's stomach growl in anticipation. Aunt May followed close behind, her gaze shifting to Tom. Dig in. You'll need the food to recover. Tom didn't need to be told twice, and rushed to his seat, filling his plate with anything that caught his eye. Shanks fo to foot, thanks for the food, he said as he stuffed an entire breakfast sausage into his mouth. Peter clapped Tom on the shoulder and took a seat beside Lily. Yup, eat and relax as much as you can, because after breakfast we'll return to your torture. Ahem. I mean, training. 
Ignoring the looks everyone gave him, Peter ate the food that Lily excitedly stacked on his plate. She seemed eager to show him the dishes she made with May's supervision. Of course, she didn't need any oversight, but her grandmother's counterpart was very nervous with her in the kitchen, especially when Lily started chopping up vegetables with a large chef's knife, and working over a fire-filled stove. With everyone seated, they began to enjoy the meal, savoring the taste of fluffy pancakes, crispy bacon, and freshly squeezed orange juice. Tom, in particular, attacked his plate with a voracious appetite, his hunger amplified by the intense training. As they ate, suddenly, an emergency news broadcast played on the TV in the background, catching their attention. The screen showed footage of a giant sand monster flipping cars in a chaotic parking lot, while frightened pedestrians scattered in every direction. The monster's booming voice echoed through the speakers. Spider-Man. Get over here now. I know this is your fault. I need to get back home. I have a daughter to take care of. He shouted his complaints. Toby's eyes flashed with recognition. That's Flint Marco, a crook who gained the ability to control and morph into sand after falling into a super collider. He should be from my universe. He explained. Peter's eyes narrowed as he stood up abruptly. Looks like we've got some trouble to deal with. And since it's just one guy, we'll handle it. Tom, this is also a part of your training, so no complaining. Tom groaned, half-heartedly stuffing another piece of pancake into his mouth. Seriously? Can't I at least finish breakfast first? Peter chuckled, grabbing Tom by the back of his shirt and dragging him away from the table. No time for that now. We'll eat later. Duty calls. Tom shot a longing look at the remaining food on his plate as Peter dragged him out of the door. Save me some bacon. He shouted as everyone, including May and Lily, stole strips of bacon from his plate, leaving not a single crumb behind. As they rushed out of the apartment, Toby watched them with a mix of concern and worry in his eyes. He wanted to be the one to stop Sandman since he knew the guy best, but he also didn't want to get in the way of Tom's training. As Peter and Tom arrived at the chaotic parking lot, they could see the police surrounding the area from a distance, their weapons at the ready. The monstrous Sandy figure roared in frustration, his massive arms thrashing around, toppling the surrounding cars. Peter patted Tom on the shoulder, giving him a reassuring look. All right, this is your chance to practice your negotiation and de-escalation skills. Try to calm him down and find a peaceful resolution. Remember, the pinnacle of Takno Jutsu is turning a lifelong enemy into a lifelong friend. It's time to awaken in your inner Naruto, Databeo. Seriously. Tom stares at Peter in disbelief. You know that's just an anime, right? Peter ignored his words and pushes him forward. Good luck. Tom took a deep breath, trying to steady his nerves. Negotiation wasn't exactly his strong suit, but he was determined to make Peter proud. He leaped forward, making his way past the police, who hesitated, their weapons lowered in respect to Spider-Man's presence. Peter found a flipped car nearby and perched himself on top of it, observing the unfolding situation with keen interest. He would let his new student handle this on his own, but he was ready to intervene if things took a turn for the worse. Thankfully, he knew that out all of the villains to appear here, Sandman was the least hostile. He had no ulterior motives or evil intentions, his only goal was to return back to his daughter as swiftly as possible. As Tom approached Sandman, the towering figure turned his attention towards the young Spider-Man. His voice boomed with anger and desperation. You! Spider-Man! You brought me to this world! I know it! Tom raised his hands in a calming gesture, trying to project a sense of peace. I understand your frustration, but we can't let you cause more harm to innocent people. Let's talk this out. There has to be a way to find a solution, Sandman's form shifted, his sandy body crackling with power. Talk? You think talking will solve anything? I need to find my daughter. She needs me. Tom took a step closer, maintaining a calm and empathetic demeanor. I get it. You're scared and worried about your daughter. But none of this will solve anything. Sandman growled, his sandy fists clenching. Yeah, but it'll certainly feel good, won't it? Tom shook his head, his voice filled with empathy. I understand how much you miss her, but hurting people won't solve anything. We're already working on a solution. Just calm down and come with me, okay? Before Sandman could respond, his frustration got the better of him. He swung a massive sandy hand at Tom, swatting him across the parking lot with incredible force. Tom crashed into several parked cars, his body tumbling and rolling. Peter craned his head and shot out a few webs, cushioning Tom's fall. Remember. Embrace your inner Uzumaki, Dardabeo, he shouted in mock encouragement. Tom groaned, rubbing his aching ribs. Why yeah, I get that. He winced, trying to push through the pain. I guess my Takno Jutsu needs some work. Peter nodded sagely, offering verbal support. Well, even Naruto needed some fighting scenes to get his point across. Now go, my young Genin. Show everyone why you'll become the Hokage one day. Tom rolled his eyes, a small smile creeping its way onto his face. Sure thing, Sensei. They turned their attention back to Sandman, who was now seething with anger. The police hesitated, unsure of how to proceed, as they watched Spider-Man get pimp slapped like that, wondering whether they should open fire or not. Tom nodded to himself, his determination reigniting. He stepped up, catching his breath and preparing for the next round. 
This time, he was ready to not only negotiate but also kick some sandy ass. Tom's muscles tightened as he got back on his feet, his eyes locked on Sandman. The towering figure loomed over him, his sandy form shifting and swirling in the air. Tom took a deep breath, his mind focused on finding a way to convince his opponent to surrender. Look, I know you're angry and scared, but let's just talk, okay? We can figure this out together, Tom called out, his voice steady but filled with empathy. Sandman growled, his sandy fists clenched. We can talk after I beat you into the ground. After all, I still owe you a few hits from last time. He says, thinking Tom was his Spider-Man. Tom's eyes flickered with determination. He knew he had to do something to gain the upper hand. With a swift motion, he shot a web towards a nearby lamppost and swung himself around, launching a kick at Sandman's midsection. Sandman's sandy form absorbed the impact, dispersing into grains of sand before reforming. He retaliated with a powerful punch, forcing Tom to dodge and weave to avoid the blow. The fight escalated quickly as blows were exchanged between the two of them. Tom focused on his agility, using his acrobatic skills to dodge and counter Sandman's attacks. He spun through the air, his web shooters releasing a barrage of webs to ensnare Sandman's limbs, temporarily restraining him. Taking advantage of the moment, Tom launched a series of quick punches and kicks, but Sandman quickly broke free, his sandy body shifting and reforming. Sandman's attacks intensified, his sandy fists becoming more ferocious and unpredictable. Tom struggled to keep up, his spider sense tingling with warning signals, guiding his reflexes. He managed to dodge most of the blows, but a few connected, sending him crashing into nearby cars and concrete pillars. Peter watched from a distance, munching in a bag of Doritos. He wanted to step in and assist, but he knew this was an important lesson for Tom. He had to learn to settle things Naruto style. It was a test of both his physical and mental skills. Tom, battered but not broken, slowly rose to his feet. He swallowed some blood that appeared in his mouth, his eyes locking with Sandman's. Please, just listen to me. There's a way we can find a solution that doesn't involve hurting anyone. Sandman sneered, not bothering to grace Tom's words with a response. He just wanted to capture him after a nice beating, and force Tom to send him home. Although he had no proof, he knew deep down that this was all Spider-Man's fault. Undeterred, Tom pressed on. He scanned his surroundings, searching for a strategy, a weakness he could exploit. Then it hit him. The nearby fire hydrant, still intact despite the chaos. With a flick of his wrist, he shot a web, wrapping it around the hydrant. As Sandman lunged at him, Tom dodged to the side, using his agility to circle around and yank the web, ripping the hydrant from the ground. Water sprayed into the air, cascading down on Sandman's sandy form. The moisture caused his body to clump together, hindering his movement. Tom seized the opportunity, launching a flurry of punches and kicks, his blows landing with much more impact than before. But Sandman still fought back, his strength and resilience making it difficult for Tom to gain the upper hand. The battle raged on, the two adversaries locked in a fierce struggle. As the fight wore on, Tom's fatigue began to take its toll. Signs of a night and morning full of intense training started to appear, his movement slowed, his strikes lacking their initial power. Sandman, fueled by his desperation to return to his daughter, grew stronger. He retaliated with renewed ferocity, his blows shaking the ground beneath them. Tom fought to stay on his feet, his mind racing for a solution. He needed to end this before he succumbed to exhaustion. He took a step back, using his web shooters to create a web trap on the ground, luring Sandman towards it. Sandman charged, his sandy form barreling towards Tom. With a well-timed move, Tom leaped over the web trap, causing Sandman to crash into it. The sticky webbing clung to his water-clumped body, immobilizing him momentarily. Tom seized the opportunity, landing a powerful blow to Sandman's midsection, followed by a roundhouse kick that sent the villain sprawling to the ground. Sandman groaned, his sandy body weakened and disoriented. Breathing heavily, Tom stood over Sandman, his voice laced with both exhaustion and determination. This didn't have to end in violence there's always another way. I can help you. You just have to let me. Sandman began to shrink back to normal size, his human features returning. Gasping for breath as water continued to rain down on him from the hydrant, he stared up at Tom with a mix of defeat and frustration. I just. I need to get back, to my daughter. Tom extended a hand toward Sandman, offering him assistance. We can help you. We'll find a way. But you have to trust us? Sandman hesitated for a moment before reluctantly taking Tom's hand. With a grunt, Tom helped him to his feet, the fight finally coming to a halt. As the dust settled, Tom turned towards Peter, a triumphant smile on his face. He had faced a formidable opponent and managed to hold his own. It was a small victory, but a victory nonetheless. Peter approached, an impressed look on his face. Good job. You held your ground and managed to peacefully subdue Sandman in the end. I give you a B dash da. Tom frowned at his grade. What? That was at least an A. And where the hell did the minus come from? He complained. Sandman stood beside them wondering why there were two Spider-Men in front of him. What kind of nightmare world did I wake up in? Due to the battle that just took place, the streets were scattered with debris and the remnants of Tom's clash with Sandman. 
Behind some of those debris, a shadowy figure stood in the distance, concealed within an inky blackness. The hidden figure watched with intense interest as Tom approached Sandman, extending a hand to help him up. As Sandman struggled to his feet, the figure's form shifted and contorted, transforming into the familiar shape of Flash Thompson. Venom, having taken over Flash's body, had been observing the fight from the shadows. Seeing an opportunity, Flash rushed past the police barricade, bypassing their attempts to stop him, and called out to Tom, feigning familiarity. Hey, buddy. You did great out there. Man, watching you fight that sand guys was crazy. I thought you were about to get squished like ten different times. Tom narrowed his eyes, his skepticism evident. Flash? What are you doing here? Flash put on a wide grin, trying to hide his ulterior motives. I saw you in action. Dude, you were amazing. I just couldn't look away. He complimented, his tone turning awkward and hesitant. Look, uh. I want to make it up to you for all those years I treated you like crap. I want to help. You know, I was such a big fan of Spider-Man and such a prick to Peter Parker. And I want to make up for that. Tom scoffed, crossing his arms. You think a few sappy words are going to make up for everything, Flash? I don't need your help. I've got it under control. The disguised symbiote's expression faltered for a moment, desperation flickering in his eyes. I know I messed up, but I've changed, I swear. I want to be there for you, to support you like Ned and MJ. Please, just give me a chance. He spoke on a sad, self-deprecating tone. Peter eyed Flash suspiciously. What's this little bastard up to? Tom hesitated, the sincerity in his former bully's voice tugging at his heartstrings. He remembered the years of torment and ridicule, but he also believed in redemption and second chances. Reluctantly, he sighed and nodded. Fine, but this doesn't mean we're friends, Flash. Just, try not to get in the way. Flash beamed with gratitude, his relief palpable. Deal. You won't regret this, I promise. As they prepared to leave, the disguised venom slithered beneath Flash's skin, concealed from view. The symbiote listened intently, waiting for the right moment to strike. It hungered for power and hoped to find his captured host, knowing that patience would be its greatest asset in achieving its sinister goals. While keeping a mistrusting eye on their newest group member, Peter waved his hand and opened a golden portal, shocking many of the onlookers, including Venom. All right, let's go see if Doctor Strange has found a way to fix all this. Although he was extremely suspicious of Flash, he decided to just wait and see what the little douchebag was up to. Of course, he'll have to put some safety measures in place. Maybe I should put a reverse protection spell on him? One by one, everyone stepped into the portal and appeared in the undercroft, unaware of the danger lurking beneath Flash's friendly facade. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.